Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And thank you for being here for our budget uh, committee meeting. I am Kathy Daigle Gamming, your deputy mayor, and sitting in to chair until the mayor arrives. So we'd like to start with a call to order and the land acknowledgement. Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and the traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. We'd ask for approval of the minutes of November 28th, 2023, please. Hello. Councillor uh, Cuddle moved, second by Councillor Hensby. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Approval of the order of business and the approval of additions or deletions. Are there any or, uh, additions or deletions, Mr. Clerk? There are no additions or deletions for this meeting from the clerk's office. So I call for a motion to approve, please. Councillor Kent, seconder, Councillor Lovelace. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Declaration for conflict of interest. Hearing none, we'll move on. And we have public participation next. We have one person signed up for public participation. Addie Burkham. Mr. Burkham. Ms. Burkham. Thank you and welcome. Please keep your comments respectful on topic and directed to the chair. The clerk will announce when you have 30 seconds remaining and when your time is complete. Thank you, Addie. Welcome to Budget. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Addie Burkham, and I'm presenting on behalf of my Climate Futures Lab Group, Rollout Rides. We are a small group of four, a section of the Youth Challenge International Halifax Cohort, Youth Challenge International's Halifax Cohort, working to collaborate in local teams to tackle climate issues and design community-based projects to make an impact within our cities. Our group is focusing on active transportation and micromobility options within the HRM. We want to help decarbonize transportation and increase access to affordable, affordable transportation options within the HRM. In order to find out more information, we have been doing research, including a survey about the issues residents face related to accessible low carbon transportation options, and that is what I will be discussing today. While I know that there have already been many studies done in the HRM on this topic, I wanted to again highlight some of the barriers that we found during our work, which are keeping residents in their cars, having to rely on their own vehicle, which is expensive, polluting, and leading to more and more traffic each year. Maybe not all of us have experienced the frustration, noise, and general craziness of driving during rush hour in this city, but if not, consider yourself lucky. Studies have shown again and again that investing in active transportation infrastructure and transit has many more benefits than just buses that arrive on time. Pedestrian safety, shorter commuting times, and quieter, healthier cities are just a few important examples. I am presenting today with the hope that the Council will understand that this is an important issue that affects all of us living in this city, not just those who like to bike. And a failure to invest in the proper infrastructure will only exacer exacerbate these problems I have highlighted. Though th through this work, I have found a number of people who rely on biking to get to and from work every day. As the cost of owning a car is too expensive and the buses can be unreliable, either too full or stuck in traffic. Or for those who work unusual shifts, relying on Halifax Transit isn't even an option. For example, I was talking with two of my coworkers, both of whom are bakers and begin their shift at four in the morning by not having to pay for gas and insurance. However, on their way back home, they feel unsafe and drivers can be impatient around cyclists. Both have been yelled at by drivers multiple times while riding home. This is a great ex example of why the city needs to invest in the proper, proper infrastructure to keep riders safe. 
the people who literally create the bread and pastries that we eat, who have no other option to get to work, face harassment and safety concerns on a daily basis due to the lack of proper safe infrastructure that the city could and should continue to invest in. As our population continues to expand, investing in safe cycling infrastructure is not just good for cyclists, but for all of us who live in Halifax, ensuring that residents have safe, reliable ways to get to where they need to go without fear and without having to rely on cars. Thank you. Thank you very much. So there are no speakers signed up yesterday in terms of uh, virtual participation, and that was the list that was presented. So I will ask three times if there was anyone from the gallery that would like to speak. For the second time, is there anyone in the gallery that would like to speak? For the third and final time, is there anyone from the gallery that would like to speak? Hearing none, we'll now move on to reports, the capital update and advance tenders. And we have opening remarks being made by our CAO, Kathy O'Toole, and a presentation then by Crystal Mallon. Chair and members of regional council, uh, chairs of, uh, chair of the budget committee and members of the budget committee rather, I'm pleased to introduce the capital update and advanced tenders report. This is another key milestone in our annual budget process and the report provides you with an update on the state of infrastructure currently owned by the municipality as well as the progress of existing capital work. By the end of this week, you will receive the draft capital budget book. The book will be with you um, for approximately the next month. This will allow you time to review and consider the information ahead of the multi-year capital plan presentation to the budget committee, which will occur in January. Today's report also includes the advanced tender list of project requests for the proposed 2024-25 capital budget which is put forward for Council's approval each December. And to be clear, today we're not here to debate or approve the full capital budget. Um, we're just here to deal with the advanced tenders piece, really, and give you a little bit of foundational information that will help you when we do get to the full capital budget debate. As we heard during the 24-25 budget direction report presented to the Budget Committee on November 28th, Economic challenges over the past few years have grown and continue to have a significant impact on both the municipal operating and capital expenditures and the delivery of our capital projects. Some of the most prevalent financial pressures impacting the capital budget include extreme weather events. So this past year resulted in significant unplanned repair or replacements. Inflation. It's starting to go down in some areas, but still remains high. We continue to experience significant increases in building costs as well as a constrained labor market. Population growth is our third uh, financial pressure. Po population growth is uh, an urgent issue for us at the moment as the municipality's population has reached a half million residents and will continue to grow at a greater rate than seen in recent decades. This growth brings tremendous opportunities for the region, but also brings an array of new challenges as new residents and uh, new homes require additional municipal services. These economic challenges have resulted in significant impacts to the assumptions in the 2024-25 capital plan. In the face of these pressures, the administration has undertaken several mitigating approaches to meet Council's most important priorities and to minimize risk to reduce the total capital budget within previous funding levels. As previously mentioned, following this presentation on December 15th, you'll receive the draft capital budget book. It contains details of every project proposed for the four-year capital plan. 
and uh, the recommendation for the capital budget will be presented to the budget committee on January 24th, 2024. In closing, I want to acknowledge that council is again faced with very difficult decisions for this upcoming fiscal year. I also recognize that creating a financially sustainable infrastructure investment program requires a commitment to focus on decision making, um, looking at service delivery standards that can be supported and by looking at what our taxpayers can also support while considering the impact that planned growth and demands for service are going to have on our municipality. So thank you, and I look forward to your feedback and continued support. With that, I'll turn things over to Crystal Nallen, who is the Director of Asset Management for Finance and Asset Management, and she'll present the capital update and advance tender report. Thank you. Thank you, Madam CAO. Um, as she said, Crystal Nallen, Director of Asset Management, and good morning to Budget Committee. So my focus uh, to, in today's presentation, as the CAO mentioned, is to primarily um, have you approve the routine list of capital projects uh, uh, and their approved amounts for the advanced tendering process. It's also to provide budget committee with a foundation of understanding on how the capital program is currently advancing and the process for which staff have been undergoing to update this year's capital plan. So in reference to attachment two of the report, this is a summary of where our current active projects are at. You would have also seen this information in the quarter two financial package that was presented previously at Audit and Finance Committee and forwarded on to Regional Council. Um, however, this is a nice concise picture and we've broken down the various 260 in-flight projects into their various project statuses. There's three kind of main phases which I've summarized here. So at the end of September, there was a cumulative $591 million previously approved to spend on projects that, <clears throat> excuse me, have not yet been activated um, through um, <clears throat> actual spending, excuse me. So the three main phases that these can summarize into right now are 35% of the projects are in early planning phases, 58% are in uh, current active uh, work in progress, and 7% in other phases as uh, defined there in the dark blue, such as on hold or deferred or what have you. So right now our project manager uh, contingent is estimating that of that 591 million, that 375 of that will continue to, to um, carry forward into the next fiscal year to be completed at that point. So generally, um, it should be uh, made aware to ca uh, budget committee, I guess, that all projects that are approved annually do not begin and end in that same uh, fiscal year, of course. What we see in ranges is that the majority of projects last anywhere from 18 months to a three-year period. And interestingly enough, of the 591 million outstanding at September 30th, if we look back four years, um, the outstanding amount at September 30th was $264 million. So that is a good comparison and just perspective on, on what has happened in the last four, four years uh, for, for growth. This graph here takes the same uh, information from attachment two and uh, the lighter blue bars highlight how the $591 million is allocated across the different asset categories, and the darker blue lines highlight that $375 million that's projected to carry over into next year. 
So what uh, the point of this graph is really to, to highlight that although there's 375 million that's highlighted uh, to carry forward into next year, the current 591 million that has not yet been spent doesn't mean that it's not in process being activated by staff. There's various activities that happen early on in capital projects that uh, are initiated before work might be uh, spent as far as dollars go. And what's interesting in some of the categories, uh, I'll highlight the vehicles, vessels, and equipment category at the far right of the graph. It gives the impression that there is not much going on in that category um, because there's not much of a change between the current uh, dollar amount and what's expected not to be spent this year but carried over into next year. However, the majority of that line item is currently out in, in a, a purchase order with, so if we think about our fire trucks, our buses, both of those items currently take two years or more to be ordered before they get delivered. Dollars do not get spent against budget until either work is, is physically completed in the field or delivery takes pla place on, on assets. So the majority of that budget under vehicles is actually been ordered. So the work has been done on the staff side. It's just that the budget will not look spent until next year when we take delivery of those assets. So moving on to what uh, staff have been doing with our, our large um, group of uh, excellent project managers with the, the municipality. So each year, um, just reviewing the high level overview of what our process each year, we, we typically start with what has been the capital plan that was approved last year. Um, Excuse me, although we only seek council's approval for the one year budget, council or staff do focus on preparing a 10 year capital plan. And it's a line of sight that's important on capital investments because of the complexity of those uh, projects and the high level of infrastructure. Um, the, every time we invest in a, new P, in a new asset, it could be a 50 year plus uh, tax commitment to the municipality. So those uh, decisions and plan uh, require sufficient uh, and adequate planning and thorough um, timing and scheduling and coordination both internally and with um, the, the community. So the beginning of la is always last year's plan. Um, and updating the, the assumptions that were made at that time. We also take a look at uh, our existing inventory, currently assessed at $4.3 billion, what have been recent condition inspections and results of that, and those um, um, get included and, and priorities get adjusted based on that. Staff also then looks at the decisions that council has made in the past year since the last capital plan uh, has taken place. Every time that council makes uh, or provides new direction on service delivery or uh, a new strategic plan or regional plan, for example, uh, comes forth, those have infrastructure implications. Of course, all of our municipal infrastructure exists to deliver services. So any decisions on those services or strategic plans uh, get uh, taken into consideration and need to be incorporated into the ca capital plan. So I, I briefly mentioned uh, the regional plan. As you all know, the, the regional plan is currently underway and being updated and staff is spending a significant amount of time uh, looking into the, the implications of what that will mean on our infrastructure um, and what it will mean for investments going forward into the future. 
as it has been the process since 2019, staff now also evaluates each of the projects being put forth in the, in the capital plan against key priorita prioritization criteria, which are listed on this slide to the bottom left. Um, and that's to help with um, providing a more objective um, compilation of information across all service areas and all asset groups for the difficult trade-off decisions that need to be made. Because of course, as you all know, there are a large, long, ongoing list of infrastructure requests, which are all uh, bear their own merit, but we have limited resources in which to, to utilize. So the prioritization criteria help us try to um, categorize which projects contain the most value for the dollars spent. So the other thing that, that needs to be considered, uh, as I mentioned with the long-term planning uh, line of sight with the capital is we don't, all only need to consider that upfront construction cost, which is only one small piece of that long-term commitment to the municipality. There also needs to be that consideration on what's the future operating cost of that asset and the future maintenance and reinvestment, re uh, replacement of the asset. So uh, your attachment three to the report includes the results uh, of these ratings against each project for the upcoming 2024-25 uh, draft projects list. Real quickly before I leave this slide, you'll see that there's a new um, criteria for our pri prioritization listed on the slide for social equity. Staff have been working on creating a new lens on each of our uh, projects and we're looking to have that in place uh, for next year's capital or yeah, capital budget um, list. So on this slide, it, it's a, got a lot of information on it. And where I'll start is on the top left, the graph. Council, oh, for some reason, the, the little circle has, has moved on the slide. Uh, it should be circling the, the 480,000 um, note that's on there for 2022, which was when uh, the municipality reached that certain population level in June of 2022. Uh, Budget Committee likely has seen this graph before uh, in a presentation surrounding the regional plan. And really what the graph reflects is that when the last update of the regional plan in 2014 had predicted that we would hit the population growth of 480,000 residents in 2031. And since 2016, we have been growing at an annual rate of twice what we had predicted. And that um, in 2021, or 2022, of course, it was four times uh, the previous annual increase. So what that means for, from a capital plan perspective is that our municipal infrastructure is experiencing the significant uh, pressure of meeting a service capacity that we weren't intending to experience for another eight years. Added to this, um, as uh, some other areas, uh, you know, across Canada or other municipalities and other areas, the cha extra challenges that we've had experiencing this level of growth at this time has been the additional challenges post-pandemic with the inflation, the market constraints, and labor shortages. So a handful of projects uh, I've pulled out and added to the right of this slide just to reflect how budgets have been impacted by these economic constraints over the last few years. In many cases, these projects have had to reduce scope to try to minimize the amount of budget increases. So we're actually trying to uh, mitigate the, these inflationary impacts and uh, so that we can further support council's go goal to try to keep the annual tax increases 
to less than annual inflation rates. For the ongoing uh, annual asset maintenance programs, this is usually meant that less inventory is being addressed each year for the preventative maintenance programs. It's a really uh, incredibly challenging uh, position to be in uh, as reducing the capital budgets leads to deferring uh, maintenance, both preventative and, um, and on-time maintenance uh, interventions that requ are required on our existing inventory, as I mentioned, the $4 billion, which impacts both service reliability um, and quality. Emergency repairs always cost more than existing on-time maintenance. And there's always, uh, deferred maintenance will always cost more in the future. And that's not from an economic point, but uh, it, on my team, we typically use the example of a leaky roof. If we address the issue at the time, it might mean uh, replacing a few uh, shingles, a handful of shingles. However, if we say, yeah, we're too busy, we'll deal with that later, it might get to the point where we then have to invest in replacing an entire roof. So that's the implication, one of the implications of deferring uh, work on the capital budget. As well, delays uh, right now on investing in new infrastructure being built will Im uh, impede and add more pressure to the growing service demands. On this slide in this graph, it's a little bit of that high level view on the impact of the growing capital program and the pressures being felt to support the municipal services. So on this chart, the blue trend line from year to year, uh, beginning back in 2014, which coincidentally is the year that Ray Ivany's report, Now or Never, was released on the need to boost the Nova Scotia economy, ranging through to our four-year plan at the far right. Uh, so the, the line represents each annual year's budget, or in the case of the four-year plan, what's drafted in, or in the, projected in the draft plan. And each of the bars represent what were the current actuals um, in past years. So the light blue lines were actual spending. 23-24 is the current fiscal year, of course, so that's our projected spending of the 375 million. And then, of course, you'll see in the four-year plan into the future where I've got it projected that we will uh, spend what we, we budget. So what's interesting is the very stable eight years, um, we were very close to the, the average of delivering the $159 million uh, annual budget. We're in that three-year transitional period uh, averaging around $320 million. And then the last three years of our future plan, the pressures that are being felt for growth and maintaining our current infrastructure, typically to a, a higher level of uh, scope and design when we recapitalize or replace assets, um, is leveling out at an average of $635 million. So a substantial increase uh, in demand and what I'll draw your attention to is the, the gap between the budget line and the expenditures line in 22-23 and 23-24. And that's just really a reflection in the last couple of years where staff has been ramping up to double the capital program capacity and feeling the, the constraints both internally and in industry with the, the market and labor shortages and what have you. And what we're putting forward in the 24-25 the budget, which you'll see when you receive the, the book in the next couple of days, is staff is really taken a step back and revamped the 24-25 plan to make sure that it's a realistic delivery capacity and that 
we uh, will aim to, to catch up and close that gap on where we've been in ramping up the capital program. So because the budget for the last two years has exceeded actual um, expenditures and the capacity that we've been able to, to manage, as I mentioned, what we're projecting right now is a carry forward amount of 375 million. With the, the current draft budget being put forth of 309 million, the active total work plan for projects to deliver next year in 24-25 right now is sitting at 684 million, which of course, when you look at years two, three, and four, it's around that $600 million a year level. So as we mentioned at the, the beginning of the presentation, um, today's focus isn't to get into the details of those projects. Certainly uh, in years past, we've heard Budget Committee make the comment that before re receiving the, the book with all of the project details, it would be uh, good to have kind of a basis on where are we at now, what did uh, staff consider when putting together uh, the, the plan that's being put forth to you. That's what, what our goal wa was today. And the re recommendation that we're leaving with you in the report is to have the advanced tenders um, approved. So on the advanced tenders, it is a routine administrative uh, request that we put forth each year. The purpose is, as you can see on the slide, part of it is for awareness and obviously your, your authority to begin that administrative process for procurement, tendering, what have you, so that work can begin, orders can be placed at the very beginning of the, the new fiscal year. It helps maximize uh, the weather construction season, provides insight to, to in, uh, industry early on on what our uh, work plan is intended to be. And of course, as we've seen uh, in previous slides, there's that long lead time in some areas that we now more than ever need to try to mitigate. So on the, the advanced tender list that you'll find in as attachment one to the report, there's 26 projects listed in total. Um, I believe 23 of those are annual ongoing projects uh, or programs that we have year over year that are uh, intended just to maintain our current annual inventory. The total that we're asking to uh, approve for that advanced tendering is $107 million, which is 35% of the draft 24-25 budget. And in the last five years, coincidentally, the, the uh, average total of the advanced tender list against the annual budget was also 35%. So we're we're not higher or lower than previous years. It's, it's very standard. And just um, for uh, a, a bit of an overview, this is uh, a bit of an overview of the compilation of those 26 projects that are on uh, the advanced tender list. On the discrete projects, they are there's no projects on there that will be new to, to budget committee. Um, they have been initiated in, in prior years. And as I said, annual programs, they're projects and programs that we have year over year on the capital plan to help maintain our existing inventory. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Crystal. Thanks. So I am waiting to see. The councillor like Councillor Smith, thank you very much. All right, since nobody was jumping in and I actually don't have the motion in front of me. <laughs> I didn't plan on putting it forward, thank you. All right, um, I move that the Budget Committee recommend Alpha Regional Council approve the schedule of 2024-25 advanced tender request as per attachment one of staff report dated November 29, 2023. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Seconded by Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Smith. 
No question. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I just rang in because I have a few questions. So, so one, I'll, I'll say the slide that showed um, how much costs have increased was very telling. And you know, I, I thank you for putting that in because that really paints a picture of some of the the risks that we're facing, but also the difficult decisions that we have to make as we move forward. So I'm going to ask. Usually, I, I kind of ask in a, a slew and then get answers, but just a few of my questions are are not related to each other. So I'm just going to ask one at a time and see how much time I, I got left. So the first one is related to um, just carry over. So I know that throughout many projects some stuff doesn't get complete and then that money carries over. Um, the money that's being carried over, that isn't molded into the advanced tender cost. That's money that's already approved, so that just sits in the business unit's budget and then it's just part of whatever the project cost is. That Through the chair to you, Councillor, that's correct. So advanced tenders are against new budget um, being approved for 24-25 and carry forwards are, are separate and do just, they were previously approved. Right. Okay, so, so just related to that, so thinking of the regional center AAA bikeways, I know that we had a significant amount of carry over for different reasons. So I'm just wondering, I'm not sure who's here that can speak on, on the AAA network program. Uh, maybe Brad is, <laughs> Brad's up. Uh, so what I'm wondering is, is how, and I know this is a hard question to ask, um, so I guess it's great that Brad's walking up because he likes the hard questions. Um, just how much do we think we could actually accomplish in the next coming year trying to get some of this work done uh, with the AAA uh, network? You're fast, that's good. Uh, yeah, it's, look, same plan as last year, all to finish by 28. You'll notice uh, that we, we were asked by council to reconfigure the project and come back with a date by which it would all be done. That remains the same. Uh, you may be looking at, uh, you'll see in the four year side by side comparison, you'll see a decrease in the amount of money required. Uh, that's tentative, we have to get back to council with the, uh, with the uh, bridge project, as you know, we did the value, we've done a value engineering on it. I don't want to steal any thunder, but we believe we've got an at grade solution, but that's still subject to council approval. That at grade solution allowed us to decrease the budget, so that's why you're seeing a decrease, so please don't worry about that. Uh, as well, we're increasing staff. Um, there'll be a dedicated project manager, uh, program manager to finish the AAA network. There'll be, we're proposing uh, as well, an extra AT planner as well as an AT supervisor. As you know, uh, a lot of things increased last year on AT, uh, not the least of which was the rural, rural recreation program. So we're beefing up the staff to respond to the demand as well. We received the ICIP money, which has allowed, which has really offset a lot of the inflation that we've experienced in the program. So long story short, uh, we're still planning to have it done uh, by 28, all financial plans have been set for that. We've also, like I say, been able to absorb the inflation in some of these programs due to uh, ICIP and, and balancing the portfolio. I think the final question is, are you asking if we need the advanced funding? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, because we do. <laughs> no, no, no. Just, okay. just making sure that that it is well. Well, I guess is it enough, as Councilor Mason said, but also just making sure that that we're getting as much done so we're not having this carry over all the time because we can't complete projects is really what's mine. Yeah, look, to be honest, like next year is not as aggressive as we would thought it would be because of the bridge project, right? Because, uh, and we've also moved the bridge project out of the 20, I'm getting ahead of the council report, but we've moved it out of the 24 program just to de-conflict it with finishing Cogswell and a few other things on the go. So we don't want to tackle that while we've got uh, everything tied up uh, finishing off Cogswell, so we're trying to balance that. So that's made next year's program look a little light funding wise, but like I say, 28's the goal, and if you, when you get your budget book, you'll see that the numbers accelerate uh, from here forward, okay. yeah. Thank you, I'll come Thank back. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Brad. And you'll come back. Yep, thank you. Councilor Smith, thank you. Next, we have Councilor Purdy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Brad, Brad, you might want to stay up here. <laughs> Just before you go back to the back row. Um, thanks for this. This is a lot of work and very complex and confusing. So I actually, I, I want to bring up a few things on this advanced tendered list, but I will just go one at a time, I guess. Uh, the first one would be the AAA Regional Center Bikeways. And is this funded through um, debt? How, how is this project funded? Through the chair to the councillor, it's partially debt uh, funded and it's partially funded through other orders of government. Okay, so does this have a direct impact on our tax rate, this project? The portion that is debt funded will be, uh, it won't impact the tax rate until the work's complete and we draw down the debenture and need to start to repay it. What happens when we debt fund a project is we don't have to repay, start re repaying the debt until the project work is complete. So okay. when the project work is complete and we have to start repaying it, that's when it hits the tax rate. So that's projected to be 2028? Did I, is that that's correct? Is that how I'm Sorry, when it hits the tax rate? Is that what you're saying? When, when the project's completed. Oh yeah, completed 20. 20 so yeah. that would be a run. Okay, well, okay. Um, so, I, so question two just about, I, I am, Coming back to that uh, specific questions about that, but the, so we have we have three different attachments here. We're only voting on the first one. Um, however, just a question about that triple A network. We have it's on another attachment here, and it says um, there's a six million eight hundred thousand dollar. It's it's on. I think this is attachment two. And uh, second page, I believe, down near the bottom, it has we have outstanding commitments at September 2023 of 1.2 million and change. Um, and then we at the last column, third last pre-existing work to progress into 23-24. There's a 5.5 and change million dollar. So, how does what what is the relationship with this and what we see on the advanced tender list. So this is still outstanding, needs to be done, and yet we are asking for more money for more projects to continue, even though this is outstanding. Through, through the chair to, to the councillor, we're not, the advanced tender isn't necessarily asking for more money. It's money that had, has been in the plan uh, to, to progress in 24, 25. The authority that we're asking for is just to to agree that yes, we still continue to plan on doing this work in 24, 25, with, with that being in the budget. But it's okay to start working on the administrative side of, of the procurement process. And yes, it, from what you see in attachment two, that's giving a summary of where current projects are at. Um, Five million of previous budget will continue into next year, uh, and this is yeah the the advance tender is asking for uh, approval against next year's money. Okay, okay, that's good. And then on attachment three, there's a fifty million dollar price tag. There is is that for the AAA network? Is that the whole project summed? Uh, between now and 2028 when the project is supposed to be completed, that is how much we're going to be spending on the triple A bike network in our city? Uh, through the, the chair to you, Councillor, yes, that's the, the total of the four-year capital plan starting next year. Okay, and so we will, this will come back to impact our tax rate in 2028 when inflation continues to rise and other things continue to rise. How, how uh, do we have data on the percentage of HRM residents who use the AAA bike network? Yes. And do we, yeah, okay, so I was looking on open data. I didn't, see, I see pedestrians uh, versus, and also data on collisions. Do we have data on vehicle 
and uh, cyclist collisions. I couldn't find it, but I'm not very good at computer technology stuff looking around. We do, but I'd have to get it back to council. Um, I don't have it handy with me. Okay. Councilor Purdue, your time is up. Would you I'll like come to come back. back? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Councilor Mancini. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the work. And uh, uh, like you, Councilor Smith, I think uh, uh, your slide presentation, the current environment was very, very telling uh, of where our, our, our current situation. You know, a couple things you, you said in your presentation, and uh, uh, I'd heard it before, but it really, the, if the flag went up for me, you know, every project is just not the upfront cost, right? It's the, it's the resources and the operation afterwards. And the other comment you made, and I really liked your analogy, deferred maintenance always costs more in the future. I mean, your, your analogy of the a couple of shingles missing, you leave it alone, and now we're replacing the whole roof. I think that's very, very important uh, comment. I think I want to address uh, Councillor uh, uh, Purdy's um, I, her love for the AAA network, I can tell where that's going. Uh, and she, she's, not, she's not listening now, but I wonder if you could um, explain to us about the other, I'll wait till she's listening because I want her to hear this, uh, sorry. The AAA uh, network, could you explain what percentage of that is other order of government funding? Through the chair to to the councillor, um, I don't have the the total program of the four years in front of me, but the, the way the program had been um, for under investing in can, Canadian infrastructure program is set up is typically the municipal portion is 27 percent. So the municipal portion uh, is 27 percent. So the majority of that funding is uh, other orders of government, particularly the federal government. So I think there's a lot of projects that we would love to entertain if the majority, 87% or plus, would be taken on. And so let's be clear on that, right? That, that, that's the majority of that funding. Yes, we're all the same taxpayer, but it's not an impact on the tax rate, just to be very clear. My question that I have, and just to clarify, this is the, I understand the advance tender. You need the lead time to get the projects going. We've learned from past years when we don't get the lead time, we're carrying over a lot of projects, so I support that. But that doesn't mean we still can't adjust this list, right? We can increase funding, we can decrease funding, we could even cancel projects. The, what we're talking about today is just giving you that lead time. Is that correct? To the councillor, yes, that's correct. Good. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Um, councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Thank you so much for this presentation, Crystal. I, I know it's an awful lot of work uh, to pull this together. Obviously, we're um, struggling as a, as a municipality because we are not sized to do what it is that we need to do. Uh, the population growth um, is knocking us out of the park. And it's great to have growth, uh, but we don't have the capacity, and that's quite clear. Um, obviously, we need to move projects forward, so I, I support um, uh, what we're doing. I think it's interesting to look at the 35%, you know, as kind of a, a valid number to be able to, to push those forward. Obviously, we have no idea if we're going to meet the 50% um, that we would like to, or even the 60%, because it's all based on capacity within the Nova Scotian market. Um, you know, we've heard from the Construction Industry Association, they're short 3,000 workers. Uh, we don't know if that 3,000 is going to continue to grow. So, obviously, this is, uh, this feels to me like it's a, a little bit of a pie in the sky, it's blue sky thinking. We hope that we can get all these things done because as you say, if the longer that we defer, the higher it's going to cost. And when senior orders of government come to us and say, here's some money, uh, here's have some more of your money, <laughs> by the way. Um, it's a good idea to take it uh, so that we can we can do, the, you know, work on those projects. Obviously, we don't have the influence to say, uh, rather than putting that money into bike lanes, can you put it into egress, which residents in my district are 
begging for is egress, and we need that capital money in order to build those roads. That being said, I understand that is the project, um, but I am uh, very concerned that if we start, um, you know, down the road of diminishing those service standards that our residents expect and deserve, uh, then, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have quite a fight on our hands because people expect to see their road upgraded, recapitalized. It's extremely expensive, but if we don't do that, the cost uh, to their own vehicles, um, the cost to uh, potential issues on, on their own property, for example, uh, has, a, has a great impact to our community. So we need to make sure that we're putting adequate funding into those um, projects that matter. So when you mentioned um, the framework, the capital planning framework and the various criteria, I think it's really important for us as councillors to go back to that framework to look at that criteria, to get a better sense of why is it that we're putting uh, these funds into these projects in these communities at this time. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's madness um, in this method, right? This is extremely important work that we're doing. But one of the questions that I keep getting is what is Halifax funding specifically. And so when I look at the way that the information is presented uh, to council and to the public, um, sometimes the naming convention is a little bit unclear as far as why is it being, why is this project being named in this way? Um, and also in, uh, in attachment two, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the ex estimated project completion date. Sometimes there's just month and a year. There's no real uh, detail on some of these items. Um, so I think as we as we move forward and we get that budget book, we'll have a better understanding on each of those projects. And I'm I'm hoping that we'll have a better sense of where the Halifax funding is going. I mean, it is a new pro it is a new project, a newly funded project, and so it's important for us to have that understanding. But also, when we look at the capacity to deliver. Um, and, and prioritizing that capacity, that's gonna be a really difficult job for our staff to actually figure out because not only are we doing that internally, but we need to do that work with our contractors to find out if they can actually deliver on this. They might be hopeful to deliver the project, but then something happens like a massive flood and a massive wildfire that impacts everyone um, and all industries to be able to actually do the work that they're doing. So from a, from a risk mitigation um, process, I'm just wondering how our staff actually, um, you know, being able to, I think that's the first bullet actually, Crystal, that you have here, yes, is, is that risk. And I'm, I'm just curious, you know, that risk has to kind of um, fluctuate uh, depending on so many different circumstances. I'm wondering if you can just explain to us how it is that you're able to prioritize or reduce that risk or what what options do we have um, to ensure that there isn't going to be a dramatic impact to service for, for our residents and businesses? Through the chair to the councillor, thank you for the question. Really great question. And um, I, I think as you said earlier with method and madness, there's a little bit of science and a little bit of art to, to it all. So I mean, the, the criteria helps us uh, for prioritization, the risk in particular. There are so many factors to uh, incorporate, uh, so many partners and stakeholders and perspectives to incorporate. And what the prioritization criteria really help do is, as I mentioned, a more objective approach to try to condense all of the information that collectively we, we have to a bit of a more um, concise view and then to have conversations and, and um, decisions around those trade-offs uh, as a whole with that condensed information that then you see in, in attachment three. It, it's not an exact science mm -hmm. and certainly nobody can see into the future and, and right. make projections uh, on what exactly is going to happen, but we use uh, the experience and the skills uh, of our, our staff that we have and various uh, industry experts and make our, our best assumptions with the wisdom that, that there is. Thank you, Crystal and Madam uh, Deputy Thank Mayor. I would say that our relationships with our contractors and our stakeholders are extremely important in making that determination. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Crystal. Um, Councillor Rothead. Thank you, Deputy, and thank you, Crystal, and uh, 
and team for the presentation. Uh, I have a bunch of questions here. Um, and, and Tony dealt with one, the, the AAA, uh, bike, the AAA uh, bike situation. We all take a beating on every Monday uh, when we're on uh, Todd Vino show because apparently all our problems, all our traffic dilemmas, you know, including the magazine Hill this morning, the four car pileup that caused everybody two hours to get to work was actually the fault of bike lanes. But, uh, but anyway, so the 83% the figure that I quote people on the radio that the feds are helping to pay for this is still accurate. Um, and uh, I guess that I, I just hope that we're showing, you know, the, the example that I use is, you know, if I want to buy a new car and it's $30,000, I can write down in my budget $30,000 or I can say, but it's really only fifteen because I've got a $15,000 trade-in. So when we're putting in these numbers, these totals, I, I'd like to have a little bit more breakdown of what we have uh, funding from, from other levels of government and how much we're going to have to find. And talking about the bike lane, so I'm glad that um, uh, Brad came down, is I'd also like to hear the latest on the flyover because I think council made it quite clear that we supported some sort of way to improve uh, things on the McDonald. but when the price of that almost tripled, I believe we, we sent staff back and there's new regime at uh, the Bridge Commission and whatnot to look at some other options, so I wouldn't mind an update on that. I may have heard this wrong, Crystal, but you mentioned something about the 300 million and then we're carried over 300 million, so that would put us up to 600. Have we done a reasonableness check on that to see if we can put $600 million worth of work out in a year? Uh, through the chair to the councillors. Great question. And that's a bit of the perspective that I mentioned at the yeah. end when we looked at, um, like initially last year's capital plan, the 24-25 budget was in the, the plan at, I believe it was like $460 million. Mm -hmm. And staff have taken, uh, in updating this year's uh, capital plan, uh, staff have taken a look at what work is active and okay. how much can they they add on right. next year, which is why they've now brought it down to $309 million. Okay, all right, that's clear. Thank you. I wasn't quite paying attention at that point. Uh, the Cogswell project, the big jump in project in, in cost there, which is not surprising because of uh, uh, construction costs, I'd like an answer at the end. Are we still on, bar on target to break even with that project by land sale? Because we haven't budgeted, I don't think. We budgeted to take out of debt the upfront, but then to recover 100% by selling land, is that still the case? If uh, maybe Peter Duncan could come down here, the West Bedford uh, project, widening of roads and whatnot. I'd like a little more explanation of that and also the fact that we have a really big problem up there, and I know Councillor Lovelace agrees with me, is that we haven't built the sidewalk yet. We, we put in, the, the province has put in two schools, which by the way, one of them is already over capacity by 400 students. Yeah. The, the elementary school, uh, so they're talking about the need of another school, but we have kids walking on the road because they, uh, there's no sidewalk yet. We did get the roundabouts and crosswalks done on time and I thank the developer and staff for that. I want to know if we moving forward somehow a part of this West Bedford money, uh, the ability to get a sidewalk done there, cost shared with the, uh, with the developer. So I'll stop there with that, but I'm just sort of doing the, the reasonableness check here on, uh, on a couple of these projects and also I really would like an update on Cogswell, uh, the bike lanes and of course West Bedford, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll start with AAA just to clarify, and it's unfortunate you don't have your budget book, so uh, that would help right yeah, now. Um, essentially, you're correct, it's 17 cent dollars to a maximum amount that we will have burned through that amount by the end of 25, 26. So in other words, from 27, 28, sorry, from 26, 27, 27, 28, 28, 29, we will be on full debt funding, right? So we will have moved through all of the uh, funding that was offered from other levels of government. Now, it wasn't originally con constructed that way. The estimates were that it would cover um, 17 cent dollars for the full project, but as with almost all of the projects we have, they've doubled in cost over time. Um, and so that's, that's what you're experiencing here. So, you know, to give you a sense, uh, 
Okay, so the last three years of the project are fully on debt as it says, uh, as it's yeah, planned we'll right now, and that, that will show in your books. Um, but the good news is, uh, for those that want to see the project completed, the money is assigned. Uh, and then in the... Uh, Flyover. Flyover. Yeah, I just said that earlier. I, I'll try to use the same. So the flyover, um, essentially, yeah, tripled, maybe even more. Uh, we did the value engineering. We now believe there is a, an at-grade solution. That's what that means. So no flyover solution. Okay. Uh, and so we will be coming back to council in the new year okay. to have you look at that design and hopefully sign off on it. So and uh, but what I will say is we've already kind of counted on it in the way we're aligning our budget dollars against the AAA network. <laughs> in other words, we've we've backed that out for now. That's not to say it can't come back in the program. Okay. Later, uh, and then you asked about Cogswell. Yeah, I'm a little concerned about how that's being translated. So that's not a that's not a. a, a a budget overrun. That 61 million is just happens to be the estimate of the project back in the day. Okay. You're still at the 122 million that you approved the project for when we did the tender. So the tender came in around 92 million plus contingencies, administration costs and everything else. So the project is still tracking at 122 million. Uh, as we have reported and you'll see in your packages today, that number continues to be under strain, we have risks yep. within the project. The biggest one is contaminated soil. We're yep. working on solutions for that. We've had a lot of change orders. We've also had a lot of uh, improvement work that needed to be done by Halifax Water and others while we were in the ground and had the streets open. So that's all affecting the project costs. But for now, uh, we're holding at the 122, 122 million. As far as the real estate uh, estimates, uh, certainly the ones that they've been running from time to time indicate that the uh, the majority of that money can be recovered. Of course, the land use that's assigned yes. by council, which is also before you today, yes. uh, it just goes a long way to determining it's that a timely recovery. Question. Okay, and uh, so I think I'll, I'll leave it right. there. Uh, uh, just West Bedford, quickly, uh, uh, if you wouldn't mind, Peter. Counsel cause... Councilor Rote, you are out of time, but we will allow Mr. Just, Duncan yeah, to just, answer your question. I can come back to those details, but I, I am really worried about the sidewalk. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Madam uh, Chair. So the the uh, sidewalk uh, along the Larry Larry uh, Utah Boulevard, it's in the cap capital book under Bedford West Road oversizing. It's the last project of the infrastructure master you know uh, uh, you know uh, master plan there. Um, the absolute earliest we could build that. We've got some functional design work underway now. We uh, we expect to complete that in 2024-25. The absolute earliest that we could uh, build the sidewalk would be 2526, mm. and if we were to advance it, I'd have to get back to uh, council on All what right. else we would we would have to push out. All right, I'll uh, I'll come back on that because I've got some real safety concerns. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Rote. Um, our CFO Jerry Blackbird would like to speak. Uh, Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, Jerry Black with CFO. Just to, just a couple points of clarification there. So, uh, as was mentioned earlier, today isn't about you know capital budget debate. Uh, all the details that you said you'd like to see, Councillor, uh, funding source, uh, project breakdown, etc. That will all be in your capital books that you'll receive later this week. So, as we said, purpose get those books to Council. Give you plenty of time uh, with the book to study up you know, ask questions, et cetera. And the only other thing is just, just on the Cogswell project and just to uh, compliment Brad's um, uh, answer there. Uh, Cogswell, you'll see, is, is a debt-funded project, but if you recall, council designated that as a strategic initiative, right? So the debt is, will be funded out of the strategic re uh, initiative's reserve. Uh, we have, I believe, right now, as of the last land projections, $85 million, right, to go towards the debt repayment on Cogswell, right? So just straight up math, and I know we got to get direction from council on the land, but $122 million, as Brad said, we got, uh, you know, projected land sales of $85 million. That 
leaves a debenture, you know, a repayment that will have to go to the tax rate about 37 million uh, in terms of debt servicing costs. So just want, just wanted to, to put that out there. But that's the most recent uh, land uh, projection sales. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, yeah, thank you for for the uh, the report here. Um, you know, I think when we look at that changing trend graph, um, it's quite shocking, right? When you when you see the the, sh the steep increase in in budget required to meet our projects, but what's not being captured, um, as we've just been discussing, is um, revenue. And cost recovery through things like like the Cogswell interchange redevelopment and the sale of land. So, and not just that, but then the continued revenue that is good, that Cogswell will generate. So, while there might be the 37 million dollars, we're also going to be having um, a new tax base, which will be generating revenue for the city in, in future years. So, I mean, I, I realize how complex this is and how hard it is to kind of capture all that information in a single graph. But I do think it would be useful for the public, in particular, for us to see, well, you know, how much of this do we intend to, to recover, whether it's with the AAA network, whether it's with Cogswell or other places, because other, otherwise this is quite shocking just to look at on its own, um, without kind of also looking at our revenue and how is our revenue playing out against our, our budgets and our expenditures. Um, you know, a, another part for that would be looking at revenue projections given all the new development that's about to come online, particularly the all the multi-unit residential development that we see going up that isn't occupied yet, that we're not co fully collecting taxes on yet. Um, there's that growth component, and I know that, you know, we have this notion that growth pays for growth. We know that it doesn't quite line up as nicely as that, but I do think that just looking at the expenditures without the revenue, again, causes a bit of sticker shock, not just for council, but for the public in general to say, how are we going to, how are we in, in 27, 28 going to pay for the $635 million? Well, we, we should be having increase in our tax revenue too. So at some, at some point, I know that we'll have to marry those together to see you know, um, where are we at and how do we make the most fis fiscally responsible decisions? Um, the, yeah, so I, I, yeah, so Tim covered off most of my questions around Cogswell, but I'm wondering if you can just speak a little bit to the revenue aspect of things, whether it's through tax or through funding programs at the other levels of government and where we kind of capture that in, in consideration of budget approvals. Uh, thank you, through the chair to the, the councillor. Appreciate the question. Um, I'll probably leave uh, the, those type of tax policy <clears throat> revenue projection uh, conversations for some of my other colleagues in, in the finance team. Uh, certainly, we would be doing that with uh, when we do uh, come back with uh, the budget direction update with the the um, the tax uh, the property assessments and the the role in January and the projection of those impacts going forward and as I mentioned earlier um, it, it's not just the upfront capital investment that you would see on, on this chart with the the um, the bars and the trends it's it uh, that does add any assets which are labeled as a new asset, a growth asset, in, come with the, the price tag for increasing that the annual operating budget and then uh, adds back to the annual um, base capital program for reinvestment, maintenance, recapitalization, what have you. All right, um, thank you. And um, you know, just also to Tim's point as well about sidewalks, it's not just Bedford that's missing sidewalks, there's sidewalks missing throughout the municipality. And, you know, when I think about the cost that we, we do put towards the AAA network, um, you know, are there funds that we can tap into, like the, the, you know, the Canadian, you know, infrastructure fund, 
that we can apply to sidewalks, because sidewalks are also critical for supporting active transit, particularly within communities where you have hundreds, hundreds of people using daily using those sidewalks to get around their neighborhoods, their communities, to get their kids to and from schools. Um, you know, they're, they're a critical piece, and I'm just wondering, um, and, and you might not have that answer, uh, how we might be able Council. to fund those to expedite uh, the construction of them. Council Cuddle, you are out of time, and uh, I'm sure that that will be a great conversation when the business unit comes forward about sidewalks. And our CFO has a comment. Uh, thank you very much. So, so it, again, I think we're getting into a little bit of a capital budget debate uh, here. But to your point, Councillor, on on revenue projections. So, when you do review the project, I think one of the things that uh, we do capture in the project sheets is uh, operational cost of capital. That, and a lot of times, is the is the increment incremental tax revenue that we need to raise through the tax rate to be able to fund and operate the asset. So that a lot of, uh, most times that's in, um, in the capital book, dependent on the asset. With respect to like Cogswell, I totally get your point on revenues, but it's difficult at this time when something is not built or we don't know what's going to be built there. And I know the whole piece around the land use and all that stuff is to be to be decided right because one thing we learned about uh, when we did the convention center is when you're doing projections uh, on things that are not built there's a there's quite a bit of a gap there so uh, we don't typically do tax in incremental financing uh, for projects but uh, as as the project comes along and is is uh, the land use is there and we know ex you know the types of buildings that are going there we can probably do uh, do some revenue adjustments on that in terms of looking at the incremental revenue that'll be raised uh, for the Cogswell district thank you thank you Jerry councillor Blackburn Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Mayor, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Crystal, for this. Really appreciate this uh, this update. And um, this uh, question actually might end up being for uh, for Brad. So my apologies ahead of time. Uh, you mentioned it briefly um, early on in your remarks, but uh, didn't really hear much too much more about. The, uh, the relationship between the amount of carryover projects we have and our wildfire flood response. Um, you know, how, how much of that carryover and how far behind did we get uh, because we had to divert uh, resources uh, to uh, that response? Um, and which kind of leads to the question, where are we now with uh, the, uh, the open tickets? Last I heard there was still a thousand open tickets for repairs. And how does that ultimately impact our capital budget? Thank you. <laughs> and yes, please feel free to phone a friend. Sorry, I'm going to speak off the top of my head. I'm trying to remember the numbers as it is. As it is. So between the wildfires and the floods, uh, 2,000 work orders. We're 70% of the way through, okay? Uh, all the way through the, uh, sorry, did I say fires and floods? Yeah, I said fires and floods. I should have said floods and hurricane. So uh, 2,000 work orders between the floods and the hurricane. Uh, we're all the way through pretty much all the hurricane work is done. Um, we're 70% uh, the way through the flood work. Um, and is it, so what we're, we're at now, there's a lot of shouldering work to do. We're doing as much as we can through the fall, through the winter, right? Um, some will carry forward. In areas, you'll see in areas where we're having, where we feel the road is dangerous, uh, you'll see uh, barricades deployed so that we can make sure that the uh, snow clearing equipment remains safe on the road. So that's, that's, that has happened. So we have a fair bit carrying forward. The good news is it's mostly shouldering work, so it's not hitting the capital plan per se. Okay. That said, 
just by the reach of our capital plan and how much we do in each of your districts, some of that work is being swept up into future capital projects. Uh, the rest of it will be carried out by our operations team for the most part. So we will catch up. Did it put us behind? You betcha. Yeah. <laughs> Did it, uh, however, uh, what's interesting is we roll up the data and see how far we got with our tendering. We hit 80% tendered, which is our goal each year. So the team did a remarkable job. Um, what you're seeing though, and why you're seeing a larger amount of carry forward, we got the tenders out, but they were later than usual. So you're not seeing the level of construction or bills paid that you would typically okay. see in a year. So that's where we're a bit behind. That's sort of the, the bad news in it. The good news in it is that work is important to, to, build, to, to road builders and others to have to know what they're already facing going in in the next season so it's yeah. not necessarily a bad thing okay. and of course they're getting a good sign of what's to come in the budget so um, yeah simple answer to your question yes we fell behind um, but not terribly so all right perfect thank you very much thank you madam chair thank you Councillor Blackburn and Brad next up Councillor Hensby thank you uh, madam deputy mayor um, I don't think Ray Ivney in his now or never report ever anticipated a global pandemic and the economics that caused the, uh, the artificial um, injection of funds from the governments to keep the economy going, led to an inflation, led to things such as supply chain issues and labor shortages. And uh, I don't think that anybody anticipated those uh, ramifications, but now that we are living and dealing with them, I'm hoping that the, the bank rates have peaked to its highest point at 5% and hopefully in the years ahead we'll see a, a lowering of the bank rate which will have a less less um, impact on our debt financing in the future projects. Uh, I can't wait to see the, the, the detailed book because that, they always say the devil's in the details but um, looking at the report we had before us, I was kind of curious about the color code and the priority of the various risks and stuff and I see some projects in there not color coded at all. One of them was the uh, subdivision egress roads. We have $4 million, but there's no associated color code with it. So I'm kind of worried about that because we, I thought one of the lessons learned from the wildfires is that we need these subdivision egress roads to have secondary access. So I know it's still a working project in regards to identifying opportun opportunity sites to do these things. Uh, and I'm hoping that will come forward soon enough. Your analogy about, um, loose shingles versus a roof repair. Well, that's what's happened in the Washington Fire Hall. You know, it just, it took so long to, to get some repairs done. It's to the point now the shingles are blowing off and leaks are going into the hall, damaging the ceiling and the floor. So hopefully that will be corrected in the new year. I believe the fire station is being, uh, a tender will be going out shortly for a metal roof, which is greatly appreciated by the community. But in regards to the projects I'm, I'm looking at here, you know, my annual request is the Ross Road realignment to the number seven Main Street corridor. Uh, there's a gateway to Eastern Shore. These are critical infrastructure that needs to, to be uh, accelerated. It's been very frustrating that, that the pace has been taking. I uh, even took to the point of making a land swap proposal to the provincial government in regards to perhaps we could expedite this by uh, advancing two or three projects at once. But we'll see how those, uh, that, that proposal goes. We may save in the acquisition cost, but hopefully that'll accelerate our construction uh, timeline. Um, in regards to the bikeway and the uh, flyover pa pass, uh, we had a brief uh, uh, information about that at the Bridge Commission. We have not seen any detailed plans yet. I'm looking forward to seeing that. I'll still be an advocate of using the Barrington Street ramp as the bicycle ramp for, from, from the bridge down to the Barrington Street grade. So that's the simplest solution that's already sitting there. Um, in regards to the East Shore Lifestyle Center, um, I've seen nothing in the, in the details in regards except for the design is anticipated, the design work anticipated the upcoming year 24, construction for the 25 to 27 timeline. So hopefully that's still online, but I'm kind of curious about the inflation factor of the figures that you have in the budget books. We only had some committed funding from the federal and provincial government, so I don't know if that's going to be reevaluated by the seniors government to perhaps elevate their contributions. Uh, so we don't know where that stands. And the last comment about the Cogswell interchange, uh, I think that we need to finish that project. Uh, you know, we're in for, an in for an ounce or in for a pound. Uh, I think we need to finish the project. Um, you know, the land sales versus development cost. Uh, I, didn't, I did not anticipate to be break even. The value is going to be is once the buildings are built, 
there's the tax base would be increased. It would be too valuable. The only thing I'm worried about is how long are those lots are going to be allowed to stay fallow? You know, if we're going to sell a property, is there going to be a timeline or an expectation uh, for them to develop those sites quickly? Because I don't want to see them sitting there uh, underutilized. So those are my questions here. But like I said, I'm waiting for the, the budget book for the devil, the details. I'll have many more questions at that time. But I'd like to know about the Ross Road and the Main Street Corridor. Uh, you know, I, I've been annually asking that question for a number of years, still waiting and waiting and waiting, and the residents are getting frustrated. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, actually, yeah, Brad's coming forward to address that. Thanks. Planning engineer, engineer. It's the dynamic doer. Dreamer, dreamer, doer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll, uh, I'm gonna tackle Ross Road just because it's uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, and it does, it does come up in the traffic safety stuff. Uh, you know, so it's a concern to us. Uh, it's interesting, we did the ratings. Council's been very uh, forward with us about, you know, road safety at intersections. So it's interesting, we ran the numbers. Uh, I'll just, uh, spoiler alert, uh, Ross Road is not in the top 10 um, uh, most frequent collision intersections in HRM. It's not even in the top 25. However, it's still a difficult intersection. The challenge with that is we don't have the land. So, um, once we have the land, we'll assess whether we move up that construction and potentially de-link it from the Main Street corridor. So we're actively looking at that once we have the land. Now we did break policy this year and typically if we don't have the land, we won't even put it in the capital budget. However, it is sitting in 27, 28. Um, we know there is active negotiations on the land. So we're, you know, we're, we're we're trying to show that it's allocated and it's planned and it is showing as a discrete project separate from the Main Street Corridor, which therefore I'll turn over to my good friend Peter, who's, uh, who's responsible for setting that up. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Anguish, and through you, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, yeah, just really, really quickly on the Main Street Corridor. So uh, we're working on the functional design now. We've got some work underway, and you'll see when the when the budget budget book comes back, we've got the rest of the work program for 2024, 2025, and that's on the functional on the functional design component that'll be coming back to uh, council, and then we can begin to program some of the uh, capital capital work after that. Uh, it is also somewhat related to the future service community study that's underway now for the uh, uh, Kuma lands. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Henzo. Your time is up. And now we have um, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Madam Chair, Deputy Mayor. It's a good look seeing you up there. Very pleased. Uh, I think we've learned something today, which is we need to go back to getting the capital book at the same time as the advanced tenders, because everybody has a lot of detailed questions. I don't, because I'm looking at it going, oh, I, I've seen these for 10 years, and, and, and I'm pretty satisfied with what's there. My main question is, is this enough? And I guess given that we have so much carryover, pushing to have even more advanced tenders as in the past, three and four years ago, we were trying to get more advanced tenders out because we kept having stuff finally going out in May, June, July, and it was too late. We weren't getting it done in the year. But we have so much in the market right now or, uh, or about to go into the market, perhaps that's okay. And I do find it interesting that we are uh, basically, you know, when I look at the advanced tenders and when I look at the capital budget when it comes, I'm looking to make sure that all of our goals and this regional plan and all of our functional plans and local plans on down are being met, and they are. And I think we're probably gonna spend a lot of time arguing against those strategic goals in budget because now we have to pay for them. And that's too bad. I think that's a big waste of time. Personally, I think that, you know, we've spent an awful lot of time setting goals in regional plan around mode split and how we want to develop the uh, region and all that stuff. And, and these things are going to cost money, and we know that. And, and, and I think that people are going to bring forward strong arguments to make changes to the budget, and we're going to spend a lot of time on them, and then they're going to fail like 15 to 2, and I think that's too bad. I don't think that's a good use of our, our, of our time, but I understand that. To the question of... Uh, are we going too far where we have such a large amount of money that we're asking for uh, the market to build for us? I would say like we're in a place where the market's in dis 
equili uh, equilibrium right now, where the demand so far exceeds labor that we just can't get it built. But the only way you get to market equilibrium, where the supply rises to meet the demand, or the other way to get a market equilibrium would be to cut our requests and just not build the stuff we need for our fast growing city, right? But, but I don't think we can do that. It, uh, you know, la labor and supply is gonna lag three to five years behind demand. That's, that's just what's gonna happen. We're seeing that, we're hearing that loud and clear from the construction industry, especially the people building apartments uh, and houses that you know, the labor's gonna come, but we have to, we can't take, I don't think we can take our pedal off, our, our, our foot off the pedal, off the gas. We need to continue to push this out into the market as a strong signal to all the suppliers and all the companies that are gonna build for us that the money will continue to be there year to year so that they can hire people and buy equipment and staff up and get to a point in time, not today, won't be this year, I don't wanna mislead anybody, but we'll get there eventually, I believe. Uh, you know, and, and I don't see how we have any option because if we cut projects to try and right size it, we're then saying that in our, you know, one year and five year and 10 year and 20 year capital plans, we're never gonna build enough stuff for the growth that we're experiencing. So we have to try and get more faster recognizing labor is gonna lag. And I think that's okay. So uh, yeah, I guess I'll just, my question for you, uh, other than I think you're doing a great job in a very difficult circumstance uh, is an important comment to make is, you know, is there any hesitation from staff about pushing more stuff out to advance tender sooner? Because the call for the last three to five years has been, we need to get to the market sooner, especially because the later we get to the market, the higher the price seems to be. And is there any, you know, when you're balancing these things, was there any thought about trying to push even more out of the market faster? Uh, thank you for the question through the chair to the, the councillor. Um, I don't believe so. I think. For, from based on the comment that you made about with the the amount uh, existing with, with carryover, throughout the entire year, staff is ongoing with design, procurement, what have you. Um, so it, it's a matter of just the cycles throughout the 12 month uh, time of year and. Uh, with the amount of carryover, as I mentioned, the you know, there, there's a portion of that that will be um, already in procurement cycle. Uh, so the, the amount that's currently on the list at 35% uh, of the total budget, staff, that's staff's assessment of what's re required and sufficient. All right, well, I, I support, since that's what we're here to talk about, the advanced tender list, and I think we should vote to pass it. Thank so you. We're here to talk about? Apparently. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. It was very detailed, and when we get the budget book, we'll have a way to get deeper in. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Councillor Blackburn's question about floods and hurricanes. Um, and they were approximately 75% complete. But part of the question was how has fires impacted? I'm just wondering if you can give me a rough idea of, please, thank you. I'll, I'll ask uh, perhaps my, my colleagues to, to come forth who were impacted by the fires to speak to that. We talked about the floods and hurricanes and the impact they had, uh, and they were 75% complete. I'm just wondering how the fires have impacted and what their status might be now. My. Through Madam Chair to the Councillor, there was less impact to municipally owned infrastructure from the wildfire than there was from the floods and hurricanes. Indeed, I think the most impact was perhaps to Halifax water infrastructure in terms of uh, cross culverts and driveway culverts. I'm not sure if Brad has any uh, details on any municipal work orders, but it wasn't substantial compared to the floods and the hurricane. Okay. 
what the CAO said. <laughs> there was really no, uh, of the work that we had from the fires in terms of uh, public works, certainly, um, and working alongside Halifax Water, it's uh, culvert repairs, and um, then of course the building of the access roads, uh, the two that were done during the state of the emergency, and they're, they're done. I'm just wondering, in case of fire, and just, like we had overtime, we had extended hours. I'm just wondering, I suppose I should wait for the budget, but the amount of time that was spent on the fires themselves, like I said, the overtime, the extra um, employees that had to come out, the volunteers. I'm just wondering if we have a sense of what that might have cost Chair, to the councillor, that's um, more of an operating budget question, but we okay. do have a report that went to audit and finance, I think, two meetings ago that is on the audit and finance committee website that shows our estimated costs for all of the uh, recent disasters that we'll be submitting claims for. Um, just to partially answer your, the component of your question that does relate to advanced tender requests in the capital budget. Um, the wildfire did have an impact on fire equipment replacement and the need for increased um, equipment replacement budgets. So when you look at attachment one, for example, you will see of the 26 projects there, um, there are some fire fleet, fire fleet expansion and fire, fire fleet replacement. Yes. I suspect a significant po component of what's being driven through fire fleet replace, replacement, some of it would relate to wildfire impacts. Okay. All right, I see that here. I was just looking at the number. So that will, that's the impact that it has for the replacement of vehicles. Uh, improvements and fire station replacements. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Madam CAO and Mr. English. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. Um, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, all right, just to get back to advanced tenders. <laughs> um, looking at the municipal fleet tenders, if this was approved, I'm wondering, and maybe this could be brought forward uh, during the budget discussions, but I'm just wondering what percentage of those vehicles that will be in those tenders are either hybrid or electric? John McPherson has come up to answer. Thank you. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, through you to the Councillor. Um, I don't have that level of detail offhand. That'll come with the detailed budget okay. book. But um, as a, a general concept, uh, for Lake, Lake Fleet, we're, we're trying to buy hybrid or electric okay, vehicles so it's, it's, it's in as, the tenders, as much least. as we can uh, okay. accommodate in the market. Okay, I just want to make sure that is at least within the tenders that were trying to purchase those. Okay, yes. good. Um, thank you, thank you very much. And just the, the last question I have is around uh, Needham Center. I ask this every year, but I'm gonna focus on my more detailed questions when we get to budget, but just around the advanced tender piece. I don't see anything in here in terms of progressing the facility forward. I know because we have design pieces that are, are in advanced tenders and um, just wondering what are we waiting for? Because we did public consultation and I see that's in some of the advanced centers as well for some of the facilities. So I'm just wondering where Needham sits in starting to get to a place where we could tender moving the, it forward. Uh, for Needham, we have funding commencing in 26, 27 and that's a result of prioritizing against the various uh, um, rec projects that we have on the go. And what's, what is the 2627? 
uh, that would be commencing design work. Okay, design work. In, in the, are we done public consultation? Um, I have to rely on my counterparts in Parks and Rec on that one. Welcome, Maggie McDonald. Through you, Chair, to the Councillor, Maggie McDonald, Executive Director for Parks and Recreation. Uh, as you know, Councillor, we did some consultation that was in order to inform an application to, um, I believe it was the Green and Inclusive Building uh, Fund for the federal government. Uh, so that piece of the consultation is, is completed. Uh, there may be sort of some more public consultation or check-in as we advance, as we get closer to the project. Right. But that would be, a, this, that sort of gives us the general parameters that we Okay, so so I'll ask this again in in the broader budget. So, because I'm just wondering when we'll get to a place where we can see the public consultation piece in our advanced tendering um, package for future years, and maybe it's 25, maybe 26, but I'm just wondering when we could see that because I know that that's part of moving it forward is you, you tender it out and so just uh, I'll save that but as a you know as a I guess a pre you should know that I'll, I'll be asking that as we, get, as we get to budget so again thank you very much thanks thank you Councillor Smith thank you Maggie Councillor Purdy thank thank you, thank you John Chair. sorry thank you Madam Chair um, okay so th this advanced tender list is is a hundred and sixty four million dollar list that we're working through and looking at. My question this time is about the, the fleet expansion and replacement projects, fire, municipal, and uh, police. And um, the proposed capital expenditures for all three of those uh, units is $31,877,000. Um, I, I wanna just, I mean, I don't think anyone needs reminding, but we're kind of in an affordability crisis. I'm thinking of a 93-year-old resident right now. Uh, he said, I want you to think of me every time you go in there to talk about the budget. Um, and on behalf of all of the residents that reach out to me, we were told that bold steps need to be taken, that very difficult decisions need to be had. I, I personally feel we have way too many strategic priorities. We have so many strategic initiatives and like, I, I mean, it, it, like money doesn't fall from trees. So if we need to make decisions, uh, this is, I guess, the place to do it. I, I, I wanna propose, uh, move an amendment that we, that we half the amount that is being, um, uh, being proposed here for the uh, expansion and replacement of our municipal fleets. Uh, to slow the process down so that the the impact on the, ta the tax rate each year is not as high. And so I guess I'm wondering, um, do we do we talk about that first? Can I move the that amendment first? I need a seconder to half the uh, the amount. Thank you, David. So, Councillor Purdy. So would, that would be. Would you have that motion to the clerk, so that no. we could have it up and see it, or? You have to provide a motion. So I, I move that the advanced, well, that the proposed capital budget for fire, municipal, and police fleet expansion and replacement is half of what the report requests for the 2024-25 proposed capital budget. And that motion was seconded by Councillor Hensby? Mm -hmm. Yep. So we're just gonna wait to see if the clerk can have that motion up on the screen for everyone to see. So, councillors, we'll have the discussion, and if you would like to plug it on the list. 
Can I? Okay. Are we are we okay? One second. Okay. So, Councillor Purdy, if you would like to speak to it, if you'd like to yeah, continue. I would actually. So, I um, got an email from another resident. Just um, sorry. Sh Council sorry. Council What's that? Can we just minute. confirm that this is your amendment? Be reduced. It's on the screen. There's a, there's a lot of budget line areas that you're looking to be reduced. Make sure that we got them all it's by 50%. For, for this year, for the 20. For 25 capital budget. Okay, for for the 2024 slash 25 budget year. Capital budget, yeah. Fiscal year, sorry. Okay. <laughs> to replace them at half the to replace them at a slower a slower uh, process, so it doesn't have as much of an impact on our. Like the CIO. Tax. Right. That's No, not really. So, Councillor yeah. Spurdy, if you, Purdy, if you okay, would like to I? speak to the amendment, and then we will have the CAO speak, and then we will go through our list. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. So, I'm just thinking if this were a like a budget for a business or for a family, you, you can't have, have it all when, when you feel you need or want it all. There, there has to be concessions made. So, uh, I mean, if, if we're not able to have the freedom to, to put forward some options for, to, to look at, I just, I don't know what this, this process is for. Um, but if, if we can slow down the process, if we can do half this year and look at doing the rest of it next year and, and um, May, maybe that would be a little more palpable for the the tax rate at the end of this uh, budget season. The other thing is, what are we paying for with this money? Um, Hundred and seventeen thousand dollars per truck for an HRM uh, vehicle, electric vehicle. Um, Ninety thousand dollar base model unit uh, unit for police cars. And I mean, I. I love our police. I, I'm very, very much supportive of our police. But E Mac 500 horsepower Mustangs, like we have, we've purchased uh, eight or nine of them. Are those the caliber of the the vehicles that are being bought, or are we trying to look at reasonable purchases that are good quality, get the job done, but not necessarily? like the high end of the scale. So like, cause people are concerned that their tax money is being used in a appropriate manner. So I guess just some of these, some of these concerns and, and issues, I just wondering if they could be addressed here today. And um, yeah, are, can we half this proposed budget? Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Our CAO, Kathy O'Toole. Through your worship to, the, excuse me, through Madam Chair to the Councillor, um, it would be easier to have the capital budget than it would be to have the have the advanced tenders. The issue with respect to the advanced tenders, well, there's there's a couple of issues. One is a lot of the bigger items on this list are actually discrete projects. For example, the best Wedford. West Bedford Fire Station, or the Beachville Lakeside Timberley Rec Center recap, or you know the Scotia Bank Center um, ice surface replacement. We can't build half a fire station. We can't replace half an ice surface. So we can't just look at this list and say, take 50% of each of these projects. No, but these are vehicles. It would have so to be. So instead of buying 20, buy 10. It would have to be a total rework. So uh, perhaps I'm not clear on the motion, but I thought you were asking to reduce the total advanced. No, just, just the for the, the fleet replacement and expansion. The, so there's, there's six categories there. Yes, we could reduce, if we wanted to reduce fleet uh, replacement budget, we could, but it may be unwise to do it without knowing what the impact on the operating cost of the vehicles Absolutely. would be. Yeah. 
or also the risk profile. Next, Councillor Purdy, you're out of time. Yep. <clears throat> so next on our list is Councillor Oathead. Um, thank you, Chair. And, and listen, I hope we're not all going to line up here and, and jump on Trish. I mean, okay, so nobody's saying we don't need police cars. Nobody's saying we don't need fire trucks. Um, I think what Trish is asking is maybe a little premature, but I think, and, and Kathy, I'm going to ask this to you. I think what, and I shouldn't put words in your mouth, Councillor, but I think what I've heard from people and I think what she has heard from people is they just want us to know that we as a council and you as a CAO and a CFO, whatnot, before you get to us with this, you have looked at this and you have said, we know council and the public don't want 9.7. So we look at this and we say, okay, well, that's why we prioritize this, or that's why we did this, move this one out, or that's why it's 20 vehicles where it could actually been more. The electric ones are more expensive, but this is what the savings. I think what people are looking for is this, that we're doing this due diligence to say, with everything that crossed our desks, the same as at home, we can't redo the roof the same time as we redo the basement, buy the car, and, and have the trip to Florida. Are we doing that same sort of analysis when it comes to capital and operating, knowing that there is very little appetite around the council and in the public for a, a big 9.7% tax increase? I don't think setting an arbitrary 50% on vehicles is, is probably makes sense, but I think the spirit of this is, is are we looking at this capital projects like we will look at operating and saying there is a little something we could do here to cut this back? Through, your, through the chair to council, um, staff are always looking at value for money. However, you know, council did approve strategic priorities on November 28th. So council, you know, we're working to put forward capital budgets and budgets that will deliver your strategic priorities. Uh, that doesn't really answer the fact that did somebody look at the vehicles to see if we could buy a few fewer. We do present the information on asset class and, uh. and look at the requirements to service. In terms of vehicles, I know that some of our um, maintenance and, and asset class data indicates we're falling behind. That would be with respect right. to well, emergency fleet fire for yeah. fire and police. I can't speak to the general fleet condition, but I suspect sure. John McPherson can. Right. No, that's, that's what I needed to hear. Thank you. So let's not all jump on Trish. Let's just move forward. Thank you, Councillor uh, Mancini. Councillor Mancini. Me? No, I, I wasn't doing that. Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Outhead, you're a, you're a gentleman and a, and a, and a kind man. Uh, you know, you're right. Which, which Councillor Purdy is... Uh, uh, suggesting today is premature. This is not the time to have this conversation. I think it's a valuable conversation at the right time. Today we're talking about simply advanced tenders so we can get things going. And as I asked earlier from staff is that can things be adjusted at a later date? This is not approving anything. This is just to get the tender going. We have to be careful. It can be very dangerous doing motions on the fly without understanding the ramifications of a decision we make. If we were to approve this today, have we had any conversation with fire and police and what ramifications this would have? That same person, Councillor Purdy, you're worried about that emailed you that's uh, worried about keeping staying in their house is also going to be worried about getting response time from fire departments and from police departments. This is very dangerous to have this conversation today. So, you know, I will not be supporting this. Let's have this conversation when we get the budget book. You know, Councillor Mason and I talked about, you know, we really should have this advanced tender and the, and the books at the same time so we can understand where we're going to, but it is what it is. Uh, so uh, this is a very dangerous thing. So, you know, Councillor Purdy, did you have any conversation with the police chief or the, or the fire chief about what your intention here today? I suspect not, and that's really, really dangerous until we're ready to have this conversation. So I will not be supporting this motion on the floor, and I ask all of you not to support this motion on the floor. Uh, thank you very much to Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Councillor Cleary. 
Thank you, Your Deputy Your Worshipfulness, uh, or in this case, the role of Vice Chair. Um, so, I would have no problem if you ask for a staff report on the implications of what, you know, cutting in half. But so here's the, so if you just think logically through this, um, if you have older vehicles, particularly vehicles, because if you're building a building, it's not there, you don't have to worry about it, although you do have to, if it's replacing something. But if you have older vehicles, uh, particularly very large vehicles, and I know this from buses, I don't know uh, particularly fire trucks, but I'm assuming it would be the same, uh, your maintenance costs, your operating costs, go up dramatically. And I know this from the, the report, the KPIs we get uh, at Transportation Standing Committee, you can see a direct correlation between the age of a vehicle and the maintenance costs of that vehicle. And at some point, it actually becomes cheaper to buy a new vehicle than it does keep maintaining an older vehicle. Uh, and that's true for a family budget. You know, uh, Councillor already talked about you don't fix your roof and you don't buy a new car. Well, if your roof is leaking and you don't fix it, then the framing is gone and your furniture is gone and your house is moldy and you got to buy a new house anyway. So it's, it's kind of one of these really dumb things to say, well, let's not replace vehicles, especially it would be totally on brand for you if you said, let's triple the cancel a, uh, triple a bike, bike ways, let's cancel those. Uh, but to say, especially as a, from a conservative person to say, gosh, police and fire and, and driving big trucks around to fix potholes, we don't need those. I mean, that's like a core municipal duty. I mean. If you wanted to get rid of some recreational programming or some climate change stuff, I'd be like, yep, that's Trish. But you don't want to replace new fire trucks for the 93-year-old guy who calls and my house is on fire? You know what? Sorry, sir. Can't respond just yet. The pumper's broken. We'll, when, the, when the other one comes back from the other call, we'll send that one out to your house. Anyway, I, like I said, I can't support this the way it is. I probably wouldn't support it even if you asked for a staff report because it is premature. But at least if you asked for a staff report, it would show some logic to say, hey, staff, what would be the implication if we didn't replace all those fire trucks? Or hey, what would be the implication if we didn't buy new vehicles for, for HRP? Anyway, I'm looking at the list. I got loads of time. I'm not going to go the whole way. I'm halfway. Uh, it's 1154. I didn't think this would be an eventful morning. I've, I'm, I, I can't predict council anymore. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. That's a good thing. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I can't support this in the, in the, at all. Um, as Councillor Cleary said, this is core municipal infrastructure and assets that we need. As the chair of the police board, I think it's premature. I think it's un irresponsible to not have some insight from our policing services on such a big um, consideration. Um, and it, in, and fire, I know fire is here as well. And I think that 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 it's it's cherry picking this situation. Um, I think it is premature as well. I I struggle with the notion that this is where we are today um, without the information that would be that kind of impact um, on this kind of consideration. There are, there are, there's a lot of work that we have yet to go through. This is, as Councillor Mancini had said, this is um, advanced tenders. Uh, it's tendering. It's, it's saying to the, to the suppliers, send us in a quote, essentially, and this is what we're doing, and we need to get ahead of that. Um, and I also, I can't, I can't imagine a year of budget after going through the kind of fire and experience that we have had this year. We have had and seen the privilege and the blessing to watch fires happen in other cities, to watch fires happen in other forests, in other provinces, some in Nova Scotia. But this year, we looked at two significant forest fires that were extraordinarily catastrophic. And this is not the year to shortchange our firefighting capacity. I don't believe for a second that this is that we have funded them well in the past to the degree perhaps that we should have. Policing, we have de denied funding 
and look at it. We, there's a headquarters that we aren't even at the point where we can bring it back to the table. The fleet needs help. It needs to be addressed. There is not one resident out there, I believe, that if they had an emergency, they would not want the police or the fire there, at their door, in their community, in this municipality, in this city. So I can't support this the way it is, the way it's being approached and the way it is right now. I'd have to be talked into it and I have to see the data. But this, this particular um, motion to me is, is and Councillor Oathead, to say, tell us what not to do. I, I appreciate you being respectful of our council members, but we're here in th year three, and we all get to say what we have on our mind. And I think we've come a long way from being picking on somebody in our council. So we, we've had, we have debate, and we should be allowed to have that debate. If we want to challenge another councillor, we do that. But respectfully, I get that. So I think Councillor Purdy's heart is in the right place. I think that, that I understand where she's trying to be mindful of the public perspective on is this the time that the council should be tightening its belts, its fiscal belt. Yes, we've said that. And we have asked council, we have asked the CFO and the staff from the last meeting we had to go back and tighten. And will we probably ask them for more? Yes. I don't think this is the right way to go about it. I won't be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent. It is 11.58. The wish of Council, it would be nice to be able to finish through budget today. Shall we keep going? The budget. There are four on the list for the amendment, and then there is one on the main motion. Consensus to keep going? Show of hands? Good. Thank you very much, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you much, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I second the motion because I believe it's valid to have a bit of debate, but perhaps we, we could defer this motion until we get the budget book. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing the, the, the fleet list of inventory because in the past we used to see that, how, how many vehicles we had, the age of the vehicles, uh, and the usual policy in regards to how old well the vehicle must be before we replace it, not just the maintenance cost, but the age of the vehicle, because I believe the insurance companies are now dictating uh, that you have to replace the vehicle no matter what condition it is. Uh, like a fire truck may be only allowed to be no more than 20 years old, regardless of how many little miles there may be on it. So I just want to make sure that uh, the fleet uh, inventory information is available to us. Perhaps we can have that during the budget debate and, like I said, defer this motion until that time. I would ask uh, John Traves to speak to a deferral. Uh, Madam Chair, so this is an amendment. So, you know, once the main motion is passed, that's the end of it. So you can still come back and take a look, but we're dealing with the advanced tenders at this point. So it's not possible to defer this without, without throwing the whole matter off. So we're looking for a decision today on it. In regards to that, then, under the, the vehicle category, do we know which of the vehicles are, are so-called important, like the, the fire trucks and the bus fleet are probably the most important ones, and police cars? Uh, I'm not sure about the regular fleet in regards to our roads and our supervision vehicles and all that other stuff, so I'm just kind of curious if there's a priority list of, of the vehicles on the acquisition for early tendering. I believe Mr. McPherson might answer that. Uh, Madam Chair, through you to the Councillor. I don't have the exact list of vehicles for the advanced tendering here, but uh, we can certainly provide that information. Thank you. May I ask a question of clarification? Uh, Councillor Hensby, are you, I just want to say, Councillor Hensby, are you finished? Yes. Thank you. The, the motion, the amendment, the amendment is for the fleet. Okay. For the advanced tenders. <clears throat> Councillor Lovelace. We'll correct the motion. 
Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So yes, the motion is here uh, on your screens and we are debating the motion that was put on the floor by Councillor Smith regarding the advanced tenders list. So that's what we're talking about right now. Um, and we're talking about the amendment that Councillor Purdy, Purdy put forward uh, to reduce the spending on fleet. Uh, so fire, police, and so on. So that is the motion, the amended motion, um, the amendment for the motion that's on the screen here. And uh, the clerk is just, yes, thank you, adjusting that to capital advanced budget. So here's the thing. I absolutely can't support this. I feel that this is uh, arbitrary. I feel that this is the wrong place and the wrong time to put this forward. Uh, I think having um, a, a discussion, uh, we will be discussing, um, you know, all kinds of items over the next few months. Uh, but this um, is not the right time to put this forward. Uh, regarding fire replacement, fire truck replacement, Oh my goodness, we're in the midst of building a new fire station. Folks, like we need to be able to serve this growing population. We're at 500,000 people already. And just to be really clear, we already know that Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency and Emergency Management Services has been underfunded for many years in this municipality. We've talked about this here at Council. We've had the reports. We know that we need to be putting money and funding into Halifax Fire. So I can't support this. Um, and I, I'm not going to go on. I do sincerely appreciate the conversation that we're having. Thank you, Councillor Purdy, for putting this on here. Uh, but again, it's just not the right time or the right place uh, to be moving this kind of a, what, what, I, what I would just categorize as, a, as an arbitrary motion. Because on November 28th, we already put forward our strategic priorities. We directed staff and said, here's our priorities. And so we can't now at that point, uh, a few weeks later say, oh, wait a minute, we're gonna change our strategic priorities. No. We have set them, we need to move forward on that. We're gonna make some very difficult decisions as to what will be prioritized, what will not be moving forward, and what operation spending uh, potentially will be cut. So, so I think moving forward, uh, I, 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 I can't support this, I'm gonna vote against it, and i um, ready to vote on the main motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and you know, I think this is our usual budget committee reminder of um, if cuts were easy, we would do them. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the reason our budget has well, had a starting point of 9% is because there isn't a lot of fat and all there is is painful choices. Um, just the, I just had a question and, you know, uh, in terms of format, um, if, because I think, I, I agree, I think this is premature. I mean, I think this is a discussion that should occur um, if we want to go down this route. When the fleet budget comes forward and we look at that business unit in more detail rather than a one-off now. And so the question I have just for the CEO is, um, if council wanted to look at something like this, whether it's fleet or whether it's anything, um, if we then make a change in February or January and something was on the advanced capital list, do we get, we, we don't get to a point where um, it's, sorry council, it's too late for you to change that. It's more about, um, well, you've wasted our tendering efforts. Am I correct in understanding that? I'm going to look to the CFO on that, but I believe the answer would be correct because it, even if we start the uh, advanced tendering process, by the time we come back to talk to you about capital, I don't think we would have awarded anything. It's when we get into the point in time that we've made contractual commitments that we are truly locked in and cannot make changes. And Jerry, would you like to comment on timing? <clears throat> Thank you, uh, CAO. Uh, that's that's correct, right? As Crystal said, this is to uh, give us authority to get the administration in place and get ready to go out to tender so we can take advantage of when we have authority to spend. 
and that's a measured risk because, I mean, typically the stuff in our advanced tender is things that we've seen or they're ongoing programs. Um, so that mitigates our risk if council decides to do something else. That's correct. If you look at the advanced tender list, it's pretty much uh, dominated by state of good repair projects and fleet recapitalization would be state of good repair. Okay, uh, so with that in mind, I would encourage Councillor Purdy, if you want to look at this, to have some conversations with staff and bring it back when that business unit's here, and I think that's what we should do with everything on this list at this time, um, because I think that would lead to a better, kind of more informed discussion than uh, at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I will say kudos for, you know, if you, a position of, I don't want the tax increase, but I don't want to make a cuts is not a position, so I appreciate that that's what you were trying to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Austin. To close on the amendment, Councillor Purdy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for this uh, rousing uh, conversation. And, okay, yeah, yeah, we're three years into this. I still don't have a good grasp on what is and how to, to do this whole thing well. And you know what, Tim, thank you. You are a gentleman, I, I do appreciate you. Okay, so my, my uh, point wasn't to cut the, <laughs> the budget for um, municipal fleet expansion and uh, re renewal forever, it's, it's to cut it in half this year and then finish it next year so that the impact on the tax rate won't be so huge. Um, point taken though, I, um, I didn't ask about the impact to fire or police and that is not my intention. So I, I think what I want to do then is taking the advice of my colleagues, uh, withdraw this and do uh, my, my, um, my homework uh, with the Counselor. staff. Can I withdraw? If, if there's a, if the, the seconder, seconder is, agrees, and Councilor then bring Hansby. it back in the appropriate. However, it just while well, I still have a few more uh, seconds here, um, I was understanding this is the time to deal with the advanced tender list and the, uh, the advanced um, tender requests for budget impact. Like this is the one and only time that we have to deal with this. So uh, I was just not understanding that this could be brought forward at the later budget process time. I thought it would be too late at that point. Thank you, Councillor uh, Purdy. So you're withdrawing the amendment and yeah. Councillor Hensby, I'll, I'll you agree? I'll come back with it later. Pardon? CAO would like to clarify. Oh, CAO, sorry. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. I just wanted to provide somatic comfort too that all of our procurement documents that, you know, go out associated with next year's budget through the advanced tendering process do have language in them indicating that it's subject to approval of the budget. Okay. Okay, there's still time. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks everyone and sorry about that. Councillor Hensby, did I hear you say that you were in agreement? Yeah. Thank you very much. So we are now back. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. We're now back on the main motion and I believe next on the list is Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to be really quick on this. Um, you know, in, in uh, that, that was a good conversation, Councillor Purdy. So thinking about that $30 million for fleet, I was then looking at kind of the 12% the overall uh, expenditures on um, roads and bridges and road safety and so on. And, you know, in looking at the categorization of the bridges, other related road works, you know, the street recap, road safety improvements, the state of good repair and so on and so forth. There's a lot of different categories specific to roads. Um, and so, you know, those that $12.5 million, I think, while it's broken out in those categories, um, I'm also curious to know, uh, you know, how much of that expenditure specifically is for the former provincial roads, um, because we do know that we've, we're, we're spending quite a bit of time and, and money on upgrading a provin a former provincial property. But in addition to that, Crystal, I'm, or, or someone, maybe the Kathy, 
when we do joint projects uh, that are cost shared with Halifax Water, how do we indicate that in the capital budget book? Because I think it's important for us to understand um, that you know this is an, this is a project that we're cost sharing. Um, it's not something we're doing alone. These are generally projects that have a very big price tag. I think it would be helpful if, if we understand uh, those cost shared projects. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question, Councillor. So when you receive the, the capital budget, uh, draft capital budget book this week, what it will include is a detailed project sheet for every project that's going forward that has a budget uh, proposed for the next four years. In each in the details of each of those project sheets will have a description of what the deliverable is for that project, the previous and future year's budgets along with the, the four year if there's budgets on either side of those four years. It will also give the breakdown on the various funding sources for each of those annual budgets. And then uh, as CFO mentioned earlier, there will also be a um, a, an estimate on what the proposed uh, changes to the future operating budgets will be based on the, that capital project. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a question about the AAA Regional Centre bikeway, and I know we are running way over time here. Um, so from what I've heard today, this is not the time um, to, to deal with um, what I wanted to today, so that I'll come back for that. But question on the $50 million um, uh, here, that's, that's on for the AAA network there. I think this is uh, attachment three. So we heard that this is funded by other levels of government, but the last three years of this project is going to be footed solely by HRM, so our taxpayers. Um, is that 50 million HRM? And then, so this, this is actually really almost like $200 million project then. So the 50 million is what HRM is responsible for. 50 million isn't the, the whole project and then we're only responsible for a portion of that. That 50 million is the HRM um, contribution to this $200 million project. Is that correct? Am I reading that right? The, um, uh, to the councillor's uh, question. First of all, the $50 million was, if you'll notice in the first column, that's what was proposed for the four-year plan last year. It's updated to, to $41 million um, this year in this year's plan. However, because we've already spent that nine million. No, no, it's just uh, staff's uh, updated assumptions for that four-year period. They're now saying forty-one million instead of fifty-one from last year. Okay. Overall, for that project, when you get the budget book, you will see over all of the years what the total budget. Uh, intended to spend on that initiative will be. You'll see those details there. Perfect, okay, that's great, thank you. Seeing no further names on the list, we call for the question on the main motion. Madam Clerk, we vote. Thank you, councillors. That motion passes. We will now ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved, councillor Rothit, and we'll come back at regional council after lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Kathy RCAO. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Brad. And, pardon? Oh, and John. Almost missed you, John. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Boyd. Folks, we'll, uh, we'll just take a moment of uh, silent reflection as we enter our last council meeting of the year. Thank you. Thank you, boys. All right, folks. I want to begin acknowledging we're in the Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and the unceded land of the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, we have the peace and friendship treaties, which we honor in this territory. Also 400 years of uh, African Nova Scotian contribution to our community and our society, which we also honor. Um, so I'll call the meeting to order. And uh, can we put the camera on the baby? So we can, <laughs> Councillor Smith, press Councillor Smith's button there, would you? So folks can uh, have a little Christmas. Say hello. Yeah. Look, look up hey, there. <laughs> Say hi, folks. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Smith. Community announcements and acknowledgements. None. No, 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 no. Councillor, <laughs> Councillor, yes, Councillor Kent. I just, want, I just want to announce that I'm having a grandson in April. I just found out that it's a grandson. So, thank you. Is that a community announcement? Councillor Blackburn, yes. congratulations. My community. My community. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, yes, if we can uh, put the, uh, there we go. I'd like to introduce you to Lisa, not the big one, the little one. Uh, this is Lisa at Bide a While Animal Shelter. I want to send a big shout out to them. They had their open house this past weekend, but uh, they contacted uh, a number of us last week with uh, a really cool initiative. They had uh, a litter of kittens that came in that was a bit larger than, uh, than normal, and so they decided to uh, name the kittens after uh, some of the counselors. And so they invited us out to, uh, to meet our namesakes and, uh, and uh, have some pictures taken and I didn't realize it until today but today is kitty council so uh, by the while is asking folks to go on to their uh, Facebook page and uh, vote for the uh, kitty counselor of their choice uh, and just putting in a good word for uh, kitten Lisa I wish I wish I could have taken that one home but uh, I've got uh, two dogs that wouldn't have been very impressed but uh, anyway just want to say a, a shout out to uh, them and also just a heads up that we've got the uh, holiday market coming up on on Saturday, December the 18th at uh, Halisi Cafe on uh, Sackville Drive in Middle Sackville, 10 until 3. And it's uh, free entry, but uh, all sorts of great uh, handcrafted items from the local community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hensby. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, on Monday evening, uh, December 18th at uh, seven o'clock at the Eastern Shore Community Center at the rink at the Bingo Hall. There'll be a public information meeting for case 2023-01496, which is our Harbor, Harbor Garden Village proposal. It's also tied in with the new Birches facility. This is a public information meeting, so I hope encourage the people in the Muscadabra Harbor area to come out to that meeting. And also yesterday, Mr. Mayor, I want to thank the federal and provincial governments for their contribution of $2 million for the realignment of the 207 highway from McDonald House down to Lawrencetown Beach. 
a proposal I submitted to the government about four years ago in regards to trying to fix some of the issues we've had with the, of the uh, wash out of the road plus the parking on the side of the road and, and access <laughs> for the beach and stuff. So hopefully in the next uh, two years, the uh, next year will be the design work in the year 2025 for construction, but hopefully that that project will see uh, a great benefit for the Lawrencetown Beach community area. Thank you. Thank you, that's great. Anybody else, announcements? Approval of the minutes of November the 28th, Committee of the Whole and Regional Council. Moved by Councillor Hensley, seconded by Councillor Cuddle. All in favor? Aye. That is done. Approval of the order of business, uh, Madam Clerk. Yes, Mr. Mayor, we have four additions. 18.1, uh, Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee, Extended Producer Responsibility Municipal Resignation, or, sorry, registration. Uh, <laughs> registration. 18.2, uh, Councillor Cuddle, Options to Increase Funding for Rural Transit Grants. 18.3, Councillor Cuddle, Heritage D, Registration of Bid 41518333, Surplus Lands, York Redoubt. And 18.4, Ratification from Budget Committee, Capital Update and Advance Tenders. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On the order of business, I think there's a request to do in camera after the break. Right, we have, um, folks who are in camera uh, who have to be uh, somewhere else tonight, so we're <laughs> going to do in camera at as we come back at 3:15. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to bring forward uh, information item number five, memorandum from the Chief Administrative Officer on legislative update from the 2023 fall sitting, please. Bring that forward for the next meeting. Councillor uh, Hensby. Uh, Councillor Lovelace, beat me to the punch. No. <laughs> uh, I want to add, this is where I add this item, uh, Madam Clerk. I have an item which would then be 18.5, which is to waive administrative order one requiring a staff report, and two, in place of the New Year's Day levy, direct the CAO to make a donation to the North End Community Centre in the amount of $8,500 with funds from <coughs> cost centre E300. Um, what do I need to do to get that on the agenda? So, you just need to second that or just second it by Councillor Smith uh, to add to the agenda. Everybody okay to put it in the agenda? That'll be put on the agenda as 18 point Five. Uh, okay, so with those changes, does somebody want to move the order of business as amended? Thank you. Um, order uh, seconded. Councillor Stoddard, all in favor? That's our new order of business with now five added items. Consent agenda, colleagues. Councillor Hensby? No. I request item 15.1.5 be removed from consent, please. The surplus uh, properties. 15.1.5 is removed from consent. Councillor Mancini? I have uh, 15.4.2 to be removed from the consent agenda. Councillor Mancini removes 15.4.2 from consent. Anybody else? Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I request that item 15.4.1 be removed from consent, please. 15.4.1, uh, active school travel plan will be removed from consent. No other removal from consent. Does somebody want to move the consent agenda as amended? Move seconded by Councillor Blackburn. All in favor? Oh, no, we got to vote for this. Consent agenda is approved, so that means we pass 15.1.1, which is the Halifax Public Libraries 
collection, 15.2.1, which is uh, the noise bylaw N200. 15.3.1, coming out of executive, which is the appointment of uh, returning officer. That's passed on consent. 15.4.3, student transit pass program. And 15.5.2, which is coming from Heritage Advisory, which is alteration to a registered property, 53 Queen Street. Those are deemed passed on consent. Business arising from the minutes. Calls for declaration of conflict. There are no motions of reconsideration or rescission. There's no deferred business or tabled matters. We have no public hearing today. Correspondence, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, we have correspondence that's been received for items 14.1, 15.15, 1517, and 15.51, which has been all circulated to members of council. Additional spellings? Yeah? No petitions? Information item brought forward, Councillor Smith, 14.1, from November 28th, Halifax Regional Municipality, Living Wage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So happy that we got this report, um, and, and I see we have have staff coming up. So happy that we got the support. The, court, the report was pretty straightforward in terms of what it would take for us to get to a place um, where we could offer a living wage, mostly uh, focusing on the MDS, multi-district facilities. So today I don't have a motion to, to bring forward. Um, because I feel like there's still a few a few pieces of this that need to kind of be discussed with, with staff. And, and luckily I had an opportunity to meet with most of the GMs and our MDFs uh, to talk about this report. And I've spoke to also a few members of uh, some of the MDF staff members who some who want us to to uh, impose a living wage on the facilities and some who are not sure if it's the best way forward. And most of the ones who are against it are, are worried that they wouldn't get a pay bump uh, if we were to uh, put a living wage on other workers. So, so really some of the questions that I have today uh, are just related to, you know, if we were to move this forward, some of the other financial uh, I guess problems that we could run into, and one uh, one facility in particular said that um, if they looked at bringing all of their full time members up to a living wage, it would be six hundred thousand dollars, and you, you know that's a lot of money for our MDFs, uh, and to include all of their employees within this living wage would be two point one million dollars, and that would include bumping up some of the some of the wages for for folks who uh, are, are senior staff. So this report doesn't talk about the issues of folks who might have senior positions in, in how we would deal, and I say we the royal we, how we would deal with the potential want of pay bumps happening. So I'm just wondering if that's something that's been thought about uh, if we were to implement this, the other financial impacts that might come into play. Because uh, again, what, what was mentioned by the GMs that most likely that would come as part of their, their end of year um, um, deficit where they would ask us to, to, to fund whatever they need to, to break even. So I'm just wondering if that part of that discussion was discussed when the report was being written. I see Brick. Wilson is with us. <laughs> he said hi. <laughs> uh, yes, Britt Wilson, Executive Director of Human Resources. Um, thanks for the question through you, through the Chair to the Councillor. Um, we did consider uh, the potential implications. Um, I think what you're referring to is the fact that by making the living wage a new floor for salaries or, or wages that, that um, 
other employees would see that relativity to the floor, right? Yes. Be it minimum wage versus living wage, uh, and and look for um, maintaining that differential. Uh, we considered it, but it's an almost impossible variable to determine. Uh, right. it, it will be on an uh, as needed basis, as you mentioned, with uh, many of these. Uh, some of these positions are uh, within a collective agreement, and therefore that would require a full spate of negotiations to understand those relativities. Uh, and in other places, it would just be, um, I think you would probably find a, a market driver in that space versus mm -hmm. if you make the floor a the living wage, then other positions that may have established a market rate relative to that or right. relative to the minimum wage then people might ask for more in that space, but it's almost impossible to to navigate. So we did not account for that in the base calculation. Yeah. How much time do I got left, Mr. Mayor? Real quick, I, my computers. So really quickly with my, my 40 seconds. So uh, the other thought is, um, so if we were to foot this bill quotation and, and, and pay the, the money needed to get folks up to that living wage piece, the other uh, issue is that HRM still doesn't have the oversight in terms of what's happening with, with the employees uh, at the facilities because most of them are arm's length because of boards and, and whatnot. So as we negotiate moving forward the, uh, the MDF agreements with facilities, is this something that we could take to them as a, um, a benefit of potentially kind of like the forum where we work with the forum and all their employees if most I think all of them are now HR employees under the MDF model. Like, is that something that we could possibly bring to the table saying, if you come under this management structure that we have similar to the form, we could potentially look at including you in, in the living wage piece? Like, has, has that been part of the discussion at all? Uh, through the chair to the councillor, we did not consider the mechanisms by which this would occur because the specifics of the ask was around the budget implications. Right. So yes. uh, certainly, yes, there would need to be uh, some mechanics built around how to, um, I'm going to say, enforce this upon third parties that we are connected to but not necessarily have full mm -hmm. um, ownership of. Yeah, so, so again, I don't have any motion really. I, I wanted to bring it forward because I know there's some questions and I had some great discussions with folks. I think a little, there's more that needs to be worked out here and, and uh, again, happy for the report and, and thanks for the work on, on bringing this forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you, uh, Britt, for that discussion. We'll move to reports coming from the CAO. 15.1.1 is passed on consent. We'll move to 15.1.2. Proposed amendments respecting grants for professional arts organizations. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. Long agenda, lots of stuff. Uh, I move that Halifax Regional Council adopt amendments to Administrative Order 2014-007-ADM respecting grants to professional arts organizations as set out in Attachment 2 of the staff report dated September 25th, 2023. Thank you. Second, Councillor Cuddle. Councillor Mason. Uh, so I'm a former executive director of one of the arts administrations that used to get uh, funding from more from Milser for than from uh, the professional arts organization grant. Didn't exist when and, until uh, after the 2012 election. And, uh, you know, you feel like you are on a bit of a treadmill, right? You're constantly reapplying for the small amount of money that you then get and you're immediately into the next uh, fiscal year. Uh, but from this seat as a councillor at HRM, it also means that poor PJ Temple and her team are constantly re-adjudicating the same small thing over and over and again, even though we now have a track record between all these different community grants programs of some people getting, uh, you know, and deserving money for decades. So I think this is a really good uh, move to provide efficiency to both sides of that equation, and I support it strongly. I ask for council support. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And I, I do see PJ here in the, in the gallery. So, I, oh, but we have, I'm sorry, don't know your name, but yes, okay, good. Someone to answer questions, excellent. Um, my, my question here is that when we look at doing it in three-year chunks, what happens to onboarding new applicants? 
does all the funding then for three years kind of get tied up and you, people will only be open to apply for funding every three years? Will, will we be staggering the intakes? Um, the main concern is, is how do we support new and emerging groups um, with, you know, kind of with that model? And, um, and what happens if during those three years an organization ceases to exist? What happens to that funding? Does it get put back in the pot? Does the application process get open? So, yeah, I, gu I guess my main concern here is that, you know, it's great for established um, organizations, but really it's how do you support new and emerging ones in this model? Thank you. Kelly McIver, good afternoon. Thank you. Kelly McIver, Manager of Culture and Community with Parks and Recreation. Uh, thank you for the question and through you, Mayor, to the Councillor. So we have considered um, how would we receive new applications for groups that are qualified and eligible under the administrative order. So groups who are currently in the program, the intent is to provide sustainable and consistent level of funding over a three year period. The uh, funding envelope is roughly 70% goes towards the operating and 30 goes towards the project stream. So we do have capacity to, um, and new groups who are eligible, so they've been, they meet the definition of a professional arts organization and they've been registered in good standing for three years. They are welcome to apply on an annual basis. So the program is open for projects every year, um, usually the end of January until the end of March. Um, so those groups could could come in and then be considered through the peer jury review process. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, in chatting with, um, you know, arts organizations, there was a, a collective sigh of relief <laughs> that, um, that we're moving to three years. It is an awful lot of work to continuously churn out year after year, sometimes pretty much the same kind of documentation um, and also the reporting that's required. And one of the things that I, I just am looking for clarification on is when, um, when they're providing that overview, so they're pro providing that report uh, 90 day, within 90 days uh, after the end of our fiscal year, HRM's fiscal, so, okay. So the end of March and then 90 days they have. And then, when it, and then when it comes down to the project completion, we're looking also at that 90 days. And so my question to you is, are those, um, are those organizations uh, giving you feedback about whether or not that's enough time because sometimes it takes quite a bit of time just to get all your invoices to get your board together to have the meeting to approve the reporting and and all of that kind of um, you know logistical work that goes into it so I'm just wondering whether or not that 90 days is adequate thank you mayor to the councillor so the administrative order it's for the organization's year end or um, within 90 days of the municipality's mm -hmm. year end. And so, and with projects, it's 90 days post event. Event, yeah. Um, and so it is staggered and it's consistent with most of the other reporting requirements mm -hmm. for our, our other grants. So we do reach out, we um, are in good communication with the clients in the professional arts organization and um, that's something that we could, um, w when we're, we're doing our next round, is to get specific feedback on that as well. I think, it w yes, I'd appreciate that, just to make sure that we're giving them enough time to get through this um, work, obviously, because they have a lot of grants that they have to report on. Um, so thank you for that, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Ready for the question? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. 1513 is amendments respecting revenue collections policy. 
Councillor, Deputy, Mayor, David Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, I can do this. <clears throat> a motion that the Halifax Regional Council adopt the amendments to Administrative Order 18, the Revenue Collections Policy Administrative Order as set out in Attachment B of the Staff Report dated October 26, 2023. Second. Second by Councillor Blackburn, thank you. Councillor Daigle Gammon, anything on it? Um, thank you, the report was fairly clear. It's been quite some time since the, this policy was updated and so, based on the jurisdictional scan that was done, uh, the recommendation in the report seems acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Ready for the question, colleagues? That's carried, thank you. Uh, item 15.1.4 is the signing of the Montreal Pledge, Cities United in Action for Biodiversity. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 suspend the rules of procedure under Schedule 5, the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee Terms of Reference of Administrative Order 1, the procedures of the Council Administrative Order, and 2, direct the Mayor to write a letter of support to the City of Montreal for Halifax Regional Municipality to become a signatory of the Montreal Pledge. Second by Councillor Mancini. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you so much. I, I don't have a whole lot on this other than um, we're joining uh, major cities from across the world, over uh, 61, I believe, over 60 cities, um, to commit to some tangible action uh, to preserve um, ecosystems, but more importantly, uh, the threat to biodiversity here in HRM. So I think this is a good step forward. I think that we're going to have some more work to ensure that we're implementing um, some of these, um, th these commitments and ensure that we're um, you know, looking through the lens of biodiversity uh, uh, with all that we do, especially in planning and development. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Morris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I think this is a great initiative. Uh, I'm hoping that we can um, take some real concrete and tangible actions. And one concern I have about it, I, I fully support it, but um, I just wonder who is going to lead it because we have had problems in the past with the Green Network Plan not really having a clear um, leader assigned to it or having a clear budget or mandate. Um, so I am concerned that we are signing something and I just want to make sure it's as meaningful as it could be. And also in, in outline that we received, there was no mention of how we might introduce um, biodiversity elements into our park strategy or into the urban forest master plan as two examples. So um, I'm hopeful as we move forward that we're able to make it, um, just make sure that we do have these actual tans tangible actions. Thank you. Okay, is there somebody that I recognize that face? Shannon Meadema, welcome. Good afternoon, Shannon Miedema, Director of Environment and Climate Change, and I'm sorry, Councillor Morris, we were just walking up the stairs, so I might have missed if you had more than two questions. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the first one about who will lead it. So this pledge, um, you'll see in the report, I think, uh, was pretty easy for us to commit to because of what we're already committed to across a number of strategic plans, Halifax, as well as the Green Network Plan, the Urban Forest Master Plan, and then what Parks is doing with the naturalization strategy. Um, so I don't think that it's like a similar situation where we need you know, a coordinator or a lead because the work's actually already covered um, and this is just kind of pledging our intention to keep it going. Okay, that's good, that's helpful. So is there a lead department then or are, are, are you gonna be involved from your team? Yeah, through you, Mayor, to the councillor, I would say um, we're going to be responsible for doing the reporting because, you know, okay. there were two options. One was to use their proposed reporting platform, but we'd like to keep it tucked into how we already do reporting across all of our plans and the Halifax plan um, in the annual progress report and the soon-to-be virtual platform. So, yeah, we will be the ones responsible for keeping tabs on how we're doing with the pledge commitments. Very good. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Councillor Hensby. 
<laughs> Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to know in regards to our other issue we have from time to time, evasive species. You know, we're talking about biodiversity is one thing, but what about the problem we're having now with evasive species coming in, into play? How are we going to try and deal with those under this, under this pledge? Through you, Mayor, to the Councillor, uh, I'd say we already have a plan for invasive species as a city, um, which is part of our integrated pest management plan. And um, that's kind of like an umbrella framework for how we deal with um, nuisance, you know, pests. Um, and then as things come that haven't been here before or become more of a problem, we do detailed um, risk management plans for those specific species like we've done with in forestry um, with the invasive beetles and things like that. So um, I know a number of plans are done now and then there's some more in the works for like the most problematic invasive species that we have right now. And will this also include any programs for reforestation of our, our burnt out areas from the recent wildfires? I'm kind of curious, we've been talking about uh, having a, a professor from Dalhousie who was on the news last night talking about having a fire, a fire plan in regards to di biodiversity of the, of the forest and stuff and how likelihood there certain types of trees and stuff would catch on fire more quickly than others would, would, would do. So I'm kind of curious if, if we are going to look at forest reforestation in, some, in certain areas what kind of biodiversity plan will be a part of that? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I don't have an answer for that right now. I know there are a lot of people talking about um, regrowth after fire, and it's a very different context here than, for example, out west. Like, we have a really different ecosystem with Acadian forests and tree species. So I think that's a bit of an early conversation, and I'm not sure what role the city would play over time with that, but we'll keep tabs on it. Thank you. Thank you. Just offer a tip of the cap to my friend, Mayor Plant of Montreal, who inspired this at last year's Biodiversity COP in Montreal, and uh, it's getting some international traction. Ready for the question, colleagues? That's carried. Thank you. 1515 is off consent. It's dec dec declaration of surplus real property. Councillor Hensby, I think. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I move that uh, Halifax Regional Council 1 declare this, the properties that categorize listed attachments B, D, E, F, and G of the staff report dated October 30, 2023, surplus to municipal requirements pursuant to Administrative Order 50. Uh, respect to the disposal of sur surplus real property. And two, recategorize the properties of attachment C to the, to the staff report dated October 30, 2023. Previously declared surplus by regional council from the ordinary to affordable housing. And three, recategorize the categories in attachment H of the staff report dated October 30th, 2023. Previously declared surplus by regional council uh, from ordinary to intergovernmental transfer. Second, Councillor Lovelace, Councillor Henby. Well, Mr. Mayor, when I saw this report, I thought it was great, but there's a couple in there that I want to bring a, a highlight and attention to. Um, for instance, there's one there on Chamberlain Drive, uh, to talk about under the, under the affordable housing category and attachment C. Um, I thought we had under our charter that the abutting property owners have first right of offer in regards to any surplus properties that we have. And I think that uh, this kind of circumvents that, that requirement of the charter. I spoke to one of the neighbors who abuts this property and is expressed an interest in, in acquiring the property. I just want to know when it might be declared surplus. But according to this report, uh, another neighbor down the road is making an inquiry of buying the, buying the so-called old road right of way and using it as a building lot. Therefore, the, the abutting neighbors have no opportunity to buy the property themselves. Uh, to split it between the two property owners or one property owner buying it all to, a, to, a, to enlarge his own property. So, I want to know is how is this going to override the requirements of our charter where the abutting property owners are supposed to have right first of offer? Let's find out. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mike Cooper, team lead with Corporate Real Estate. Through you to the councillor, I'm, I'm not aware of any um, obligations in the charter to sell um, remnants to, uh, to the abutting property owners. It's, it's a best practice we, we undertake and, um, and uh, we will in, in this case, I believe. Well, if I had the time to look up the charter, I know it's there. And I believe the abutting property owners do have that right first and foremost. And 
perhaps the solicitor can find it more quickly, but uh, I know it's there because I have had this discussion in the past with other surplus properties uh, in, in my particular district. And I'd also like to bring attention to the Mooseland uh, Fire Hall uh, up in uh, Mooseland. I'm glad to see this finally being brought forward. The community group is eager to uh, assume the property and move on with the, with the property. So I'm glad to see that was finally moving forward. But with the surplus property, with the abutting property owners, I think they should have first offer. And, uh, and then if, if they don't accept the offer, then it can go to the person who made the inquiry. Mr. Treves, any... Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to Council, so you'll see in page two of the report, um, section 64 talks about sales to abutting owner is not a requirement, but it is an option for Council to consider. Well, Mr. Mayor, I think out of courtesy, we should exercise our authority under the Charter to advise, to advise the abutting property owners first and foremost that they wish to buy the property. If they refuse it, then let it go to uh, whoever makes the inquiry for the property. Mr. Mayor, if, if council wishes to pursue that, I would suggest that they um, remove this property from the sale and seek a further staff report with respect to the interest of the adjoining property owner or what other interests might be out there. It's the first I've heard of it. I'll duly request that that one on Chamberlain Drive be removed from the list at the present time. So that's an amendment. We need a seconder for that. Councillor Outhead. Any discussion on that specifically? Councillor Cleary on that. Uh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's a pretty dangerous road to start going down. That's like, you know, what, when we have a, a rec center, for example that uh, is at the end of its useful life and we're building a new one, then we're obligated to ask the neighbor, hey, do you wanna buy this piece of property which could be worth millions of dollars? Um, anyway, the solicitor's already pointed out that it's not a requirement and when we set up the whole category of affordable housing, it was to look at opportunities so that we could um, frankly, help with the housing crisis that we're in. And um, unless an abutting property owner is willing to build an affordable house next door, uh, that is counter to the whole point of setting up this new category in AO50 so that we could use this. So I'm, I'm not gonna vote for taking it off the list because staff have already gone through based on our direction. We told staff, go find properties that we could put forward as a, for affordable housing. And here they've done, they've come back and said, here's some properties, and now we're gonna start taking them off and go, nah, 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 we don't, we don't want that. Anyway, I can't support that, and I can't even imagine you would wanna go down that road. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, John. So, so section 64 does indicate that this is really with respect to lands that are insufficient in size or dimensions to be capable of any reasonable use. And so I guess that may be a question for staff as to whether or not this specific property uh, would meet that uh, criteria. I don't know the size or the dimensions of it, um, but that's when that section is applicable. Go ahead. To clarify, the, um, the cut sheet shows the uh, area for disposal at 21,000 uh, square feet. Uh, I'm not aware of the zoning requirements for uh, to develop a, a, um, a buildable lot. You know, I'm thinking about septic uh, requirements and those kinds of things. So um, it, it may not fit the size requirements. Okay, Councillor, on this issue, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wonder if someone could clarify for me if Councillor Hensby's motion passes, w what happens next? What's the next steps? And, and uh, is there an opportunity for it to return to the list and to be made available to affordable housing? What's that? I'll come back to you, uh, Councillor Hensby. Uh, Mike, do you have anything on that? If this motion, if this is taken off and asked for further information, it could still come back to council and be designated for affordable housing, or there could be other options, I suppose. Eh? Yeah, with with the category affordable for affordable housing, it really limits um, the marketability of the property and and its use. I, I could say that it originated uh, as at a category that was not affordable housing when we initially reviewed it, um, but it was identified as something that had potential. 
So I'm trying to understand, Mr. Mayor, what the next steps are. It comes off the list and then uh, what, what occurs and what comes back to us. So, John, it would be a staff report that would come Supplemental back to consider it. To consider it on its own with, with more information dug out with respect to the interest of the adjacent property owner and its use or alternative as, as affordable housing, that sort of thing. And then council at that point in time can decide whether or not to proceed with that or put it back on the list for affordable housing. Is that correct? correct? All right. Thank you for that clarification. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I just have a question in relation to the question around first refusal to the property, abutting property owners. Um, item number, uh, the Bell Vista Drive surplus, it's a small sliver between two properties. And on this particular, in the report, it shows proponent. Does that mean there's already someone interested and it's one of the abutting landowners? And did, was there a fair, in relation to the, the property own, the, the abutting op, uh, properties get right of first refusal, how do you, has that already happened here or was this a case of just somebody stepped up? Through, excuse me, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Um, when it's practical, the offers are made or interests are taken and offers are made to the adjoining property owners okay. where there's no other viable use for the property. Okay. As the solicitor said, if it's uh, a remnant, a small parcel, where it makes sense for the abutter to uh, have an interest in proceeding with the transaction, that's what we'll focus our efforts on. And is that uh, what this proponent piece, why there's a proponent flat, uh, tag on this one? I, I, I believe so. I, yeah. I don't have it right in front of me here, yeah. but if that's what's tagged in the cut sheet, then that's, a, that's what I believe the, uh, the process is moving forward on that one. Yeah, and then um, a, a Tikian Drive, and you, I don't know if you don't have it there, it's not helpful to look at it, I guess. Uh, it's, I don't, is this the same scenario where it has a very limited use because I don't know what the um, parcel sizes are there. It looks to me to be the same and the question would be, has that offer already gone out to them? And what happens if nobody wants it? It continues to be in our surplus and we take care of it. Mr. Mayor, through you, uh, to your second question, that's right. Um, often the public will express an interest in a property uh, we'll progress it through this process, declare it surplus, uh, negotiations will, will fail, um, and it'll, it'll stay on, on a list that we maintain. Interests may uh, appear over time, um, other interests, um, but uh, we, yeah, we do have a, an ongoing list of properties that we're, we're unab unable to di divest. Uh, in regards to this one, I am familiar with this property. It was uh, uh, set up as a, um, um, a right-of-way for uh, stormwater when yeah. the subdivision was created. So in this instance, we, we received interest from one property owner. It's, it's not large enough to have anything on it on its own and, and most um, will most likely offer it, split it in the middle and offer it to both the property owners. If one's more interested than the other, then... I see. Uh, so you, were, you, you, you would manage that whole um, opportunity for residents. That's good to hear. And is the surplus... So was it never used as a right-of-way? Uh, I believe there's a stormwater pipe uh, that runs underground. Um, and, and that would continue, continue to stay intact for that? Of property. course. Yeah. We'll, we'll set up an easement with Halifax Water uh, before we divest anything here. Okay, thank you very much. And the other one is Laurel. It's obvious what's happening there. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. John? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just to counsel, just to clarify, there's no right of first refusal for an adjo adjoining property owner. What, what generally happens under sales to abutting owners is that sale is initiated by the abutting property owner who is looking to add to their property in, in a lot of these instances. And so that's why that, that provision provides you as counsel the flexibility to consider a directed sale to an abutting property owner. In a larger you know, sale such as this, there could be different individuals who are looking to acquire lands. And again, so it's just those remnants. Thank you, Councillor Cuttle. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was just wondering about the stormwater infrastructure there or having a piece of land that has a, a function. Why would we declare that surplus if it's still serving a, a function for us? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Cuttle. Um, the, the infrastructure is, is subgrade, so the, the surface serves no municipal purpose. Uh, while when we review such requests, we'll send them through all the business units, uh, for example, Parks and Rec, 
didn't identify any programmed or strategic need for the property. Public works, same same idea. So although the infrastructure is subgrade, it'll be protected through an easement, uh, and the property owners have the opportunity to uh, to purchase the property and, and use it as as their own uh, as their own property. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Well, Mr. Mayor, I just want to have an opportunity. You know that the abutting property owners should be first notified that it's surplus to give them an opportunity to offer to buy it. And if they turn it down, then let it go to the proponent who's asking. It's as simple as that. So it shouldn't take too long. I can walk down the street and talk to the neighbors tonight if you want me to. No. I know you could. <laughs> I know you could. Ready for the question on the <laughs> amendment? Is everybody clear on the amendment? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I think in your in your emails, you will have uh, in your correspondence, you will have seen lots of um, emails from residents in Upper Tantal, and so this won't come as a surprise for you. I'm asking uh, to remove 21 Fox Hollow Drive, which is the Fox Hollow Drive Park, uh, from this list. Um, it is uh, a well-used uh, piece of property that abuts um, the St. Margaret's Bay Rails to Trails, which is uh, a trail that connects to the Rum Runners, it connects to BLT. Um, it is uh, a well-used trail. This is a park that um, was deeded to uh, the former county um, and has been uh, municipal and public land uh, for, well, since the subdivision uh, was created. And, uh, you know, the community is, um, you know, disappointed uh, that the municipality would suggest that there's uh, a place for, um, you know, affordable housing on this, on this parkland uh, when it's outside the urban service boundary. It's not anywhere near uh, public transit. Um, this certainly would have to put in a septic system, well system, and so on and so forth. Um, and then that would remove the public's ability to access the trail through this park. Um, so I, I, I'm just asking to, uh, to have this removed. And I, you know, I understand uh, the importance and residents understand the importance of uh, finding land for affordable housing. But quite frankly, affordable housing and transit are hand in hand. It's extremely difficult to have affordable housing in a rural area without access to piped sewer, piped water, or transit. There's no amenities uh, there for folks to easily get to. Um, so I, I just, I feel like this is, um, I, I wanna thank staff for putting this forward, but I, this is not the right, uh, this is not a good, this is not a good fit for affordable housing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, really glad to see uh, Theakston on the list there. Um, I think that is an ideal parcel for affordable housing. And um, I'm just wondering about the process. So th I have another question about another piece of property on Herring Cove Road. Councillor, this is on the amendment right now? Even I just asked to remove 21. Oh, no, I'm on the main motion. Yeah. No, I don't so, want to speak I have a to second the for Councillor Lovelace's motion. I will second we'll come back to you, Councillor Cuddle, for sure. Uh, but on I the main, on the amendment, <laughs> anybody on the amendment, Councillor Clary. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm looking at uh, a recent visual of 21 Fox Hollow, and this parkland is densely forested. And if you look at Google Maps from July 2023 you'll see the mailbox and you'll see the thickly forested area. Uh, I think a squirrel would have a hard time accessing the trail uh, from there, let alone a person. So I'm not sure how many people are actually using this as parkland. Um, and s it's an acre, or roughly, it's 41,000 square feet. Um, I read some of the emails. 
and God, I love me a good NIMBY, but um, affordable housing belongs everywhere in every district of HRM. And you could easily stick a duplex on here. You could easily stick a side-by-side -side and have a cooperative run this. I have, actually, Councillor Smith and I have a cooperative that spans both of our districts. We've got units and houses and townhouses up on Cowie Hill, and they've got units uh, in the North End. There are lots of great ways to do affordable housing in lots of different areas. On septic, on uh, well water, connected to piped infrastructure. I think this is ridiculous that we, we would even consider removing this from the list given that it's not parkland in any traditional sense. I'm just checking here. I'm not even sure if it's zone parkland. Um, yeah, there is. Zone P. Um, and so I just don't see why you would not want affordable housing at 21 Fox Hollow. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Anybody else on the amendment? Ready for Councillor Mancini to speak on the amendment? <laughs> it's like, okay. Hey. Uh, some of the question, uh, I'm trying to understand, and, and um, Councillor Lovelace, I apologize, I, I missed the, the first part of what you were saying, why you were pulling it off the, uh, the list. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind come back and repeat that again so I could understand that. Uh, but are you looking to pull it off the list and that's it? Or are you looking for a staff report? Or what's the next steps here? Similar questions before. So if you just could clarify all that, please, I, I'd appreciate it. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just to be clear, this is parkland. This is called Fox Hollow Drive Park. It's been parkland since the subdivision was created in the old, you know, Halifax County days. So it has been uh, parkland for since the community was created, since subdivision was created. Uh, this parkland uh, does have access and the community does use um, the trail. Uh, to uh, to my point about having uh, parkland, there's various different kinds of parkland in this municipality. There's open space. There's parkland with playgrounds. There's uh, wilderness parkland, right? There's lots of different categories of parkland. Um, this is not a playground parkland. This is park land. Uh, so with with a trail um, to the St. Margaret's Bay Rails to Trail that the community has been using for 30 years. Now, what's to, to the point about the zoning, so pretty much every single park in District 13 and in most of the rural areas are zoned with the abutting properties. And there is a staff report that's coming that I asked for a year ago, maybe, uh, to actually give us an overview of how we shift parkland zoning from an R1, an R2, a MU, a MR, what have you, to actual dedicated parkland zoning. So staff will come forward with that review. Um, because when subdivisions were created in the old Halifax County, um, there wasn't a zoning for parkland. It just assumed uh, the zoning of whatever was on that same street. In regards to um, affordable housing, I agree, affordable housing should be everywhere. The issue, of course, here is that there's no amenities. There's no transportation. There's no uh, resources to actually support affordable housing. So when we sell a piece of property that's parkland under the premise that it's going to be affordable housing, that's a really difficult reality, considering the majority of those houses in that area are, what, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000. Everyone has to have a car. They need a car to get anywhere. So I think, you know, the, the, the concept of affordable housing really fits well with areas that have transit, that have um, piped water, that have sewer lines, that have amenities, that are within an urban service boundary. Uh, it's extremely difficult to have affordable housing in a rural area where there's no amenities, no ability for people to actually, um, you know, access anything um, within a 20-minute drive if you don't have a car, you don't have the money to have a car. So anyway, I, 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 I hope that that has clarified for you, Councillor Mancini. I do hope that I have your support for this. You have seen uh, quite clearly from the residents that this is parkland that has been in the community for a very long time and they would like to keep that 
as parkland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a little tricky. Um, I mean, I, uh, when it comes to affordable housing, I think we there's there's, I mean, it's, it's not a one size fits all. Certainly, you know, being having access to services, having access to transit, is uh, pretty important. But you know, there's 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 also different kind of levels of affordability. I mean, if we follow that, the only place we're going to do affordable housing is the core, then we're basically saying we're not doing any affordable housing in the rural areas. And I don't know that that's the conclusion. I mean, there's folks that, um, you know, they, they struggle to pay rent, but they do own a car. And there's a lot of them that are currently living in the, in the campground in Councillor Mancini's district. So, you know, I, I don't know, I have having a tough time just like ruling this out completely. I have a question for staff. If we declare this surplus, I mean, that's not the end of the game. Um, like if there is, like when I look at the map here of the subdivision, the, the, it looks like there's trail access where the road literally goes over the trail. Um, three, about 300 meters approximately away. Um, if, there, if, if we declare this surplus, would we potentially sever off a connection, like if there was a tr want for a trail connection to go down there? to that, like what does that look like? Mr. Mayor, through you, the councillors, as part of the surplus review, Parks and Recs identified that the entirety of this parcel was no longer required for parkland purposes. In fact, just around the corner, there's a, another park with, a, um, I think, a, a more appropriate access to the, uh, to the trail system. Okay. Um, I'll think on it some more. I mean, my, in my inkling is this feels like, uh, a subdivision parkland dedication of the sort that, you know, here's the chunk of land you're getting, uh, municipality, from a time when we didn't really do the sort of planning in the suburban area, uh, in the suburban rural areas around parkland dedication that we should have been doing. Um, so I'm, I, I tend to lean towards uh, this being affordable housing, um, but I'll listen to the area councillor if there's anything I'm missing. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, Councillor Cuddle, I don't think you've spoken on the amendment. No, I was speaking to something else earlier, but yes, on the amendment now. Um, yeah, so I, I, um, I tend to agree with my other councillor colleagues that this actually is not a bad place to have some affordable housing. Um, you know, not only are you on the trail, you're also a stone's throw away from the Canadian Tire, the Tim Hortons, the Superstore, Home Hardware. You're actually very close to, to the kind of service centre of that area. And one of the things that, you know, we often hear complaints about um, are that, you know, stores and restaurants and businesses, you know, can't find workers, that there's no affordable housing near businesses. And that affordable, and I also do believe, like some of my other council colleagues have mentioned, that affordable housing belongs in all neighborhoods um, across the district. So while it's not an urban setting, um, it's not really a rural setting either. It's more of a suburban setting. And, um, and there is, you wouldn't need a car to get to any of your, you know, daily services that you need for groceries or for hardware. Um, and there's also employment nearby. So I, um, I appreciate that residents, you know, would like to see it remain a park, um, but we also do need affordable housing and we need it everywhere. So unfortunately, I, I can't support this amendment. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just looking again, I mean, three houses away, there is another trail that goes to the rails to trails. And if you just go down to the, the road a little bit, um, the rails to the St. Margaret's Bay Trail crosses Fox Hollow just by a little pond there about eight, nine houses away. Um, so there's lots of access to the trail. Uh, and again, you know, looking at both the uh, satellite imagery and the Google Earth from Fox Hollow. I mean, it, it would be hard for, you know, a squirrel or a deer to get through this, let alone a person. Um, and the argument that, you know, if you have a car, you're not poor. 
so I've got Bears Westwood uh, in my district. And those parking lots are full and people park on the road. Uh, you know, they have cars, they have to get to places with their kids and do all the things that everyone else does. Same with Uniac Square, same everywhere. So, I, I mean, I really feel like, you know, we're just building arguments uh, to support something that is unsupportable. I believe this is a great location for affordable housing and affordable housing deserves to be in every district. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I too agree that affordable housing should be in every district and throughout the entire municipality. Unfortunately, that's not the reality. Uh, you know, what we do have though is a proposal coming forward for affordable housing in a really good location. And I look forward to hearing your support for that when it comes forward. Um, you know, I think that the, the argument about, you know, access to the trail, uh, I think that's, that's really a misnomer because the reality is what we're doing here, and we had this same conversation when we sold parkland uh, for school building, is that we continue to go down this road of taking away parkland and open space in our neighborhoods. Why are we doing this? The community initially was created with this parkland, and now we're beginning to strip away, more open space, more space for biodiversity. We just passed the pledge, the Montreal Pledge for Biodiversity, and yet we're here saying, oh yeah, but we don't need this parkland because those folks have parkland down the street. Well, the fact is, the community has spoken to us and said, wait a minute, we value this parkland in our community. We would like to keep that, and I want to be really clear, that is not nimbyism, that's valuing naturalization and open space and parkland in our communities. We value parkland in this municipality. We have a green network plan. We have an integrated mobility plan. We are focused on biodiversity. We are focused on climate change. We are focused on building a sustainable and beautiful community. So I ask you, please, to support this amendment to remove 21 Fox Hollow, the Fox Hollow Drive Park, from this list of surplus land. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ready for the question on the amendment, folks? Question. Yes, voting. A tie. A tie vote, the motion fails, I'm afraid. Okay, colleagues, we're back on the main motion then amended once, right? So what's our list on the main motion? <laughs> colleagues, we, uh, we address our comments through the chair when we're given time to speak. On the main motion, uh, Councillor Morse. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and thank you for the report. I'm really happy to see the surplus land on just off Main Avenue in Fairview. I think it's an excellent location uh, for some affordable housing, but I'm just wondering if you could explain what the process is. Are, is HRM going to be doing a reach out to nonprofit groups to invite them to come up with projects? Is it up to the councillors to make it known that these properties are surplus? H how will we encourage the development of affordable housing projects through nonprofits using this surplus land. Thank you. Who wants that one? Hello. Hello, Kate Green, Director of Regional and Community Planning. Yes, the intent is to reach out to not-for-profits and indicate that the land is surplus for the purposes of affordable housing and see if there are any viable projects that come forward. So our planners will be doing that outreach then after the vote? That's my understanding. We'll coordinate with real estate. I'm not familiar with all the mechanics of AO50, so I just we need to make sure we're following proper process, uh, but that is our intent. Okay, that's excellent. And, and based on your knowledge of um, the community groups out there, who do you think, like, which types of groups would be most likely to 
be involved in this type of development? We would be focused on not-for-profits and uh, we are trying to align our affordable housing work with our grant program to keep it focused on people who are providing deeply affordable housing, but we do have the ability to vary that slightly depending on the project, so. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think this is my first time on the main motion, um, just for the clock, but um, yeah, so uh, I was saying that I, I was really happy to see uh, Theakston on the list there. Um, I do note that an easement has been retained down the side of the property to access the parkland, maybe something that could be considered in Fox Hollow too. Um, anyway, that looks great and I look forward to seeing that move forward as an affordable housing um, project. My question is about um, the, no, I think it's lot six on Herring Cove Road, um, where there's two proponents for a property. Um, I th believe that both proponents um, are abutting landowners. And one proponent is looking at perhaps having just a portion um, an 80 foot by 100 foot portion of the larger lot. And my, I'm curious about how that moves, how that process moves forward, where you declare, a piece, uh, declare the piece surplus and have two proponents. How does that get negotiated? How, what's the next step there? And that would be for lot 6543 Herring Cove Road. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the question, Councillor. Um, and you must forgive me, I'm filling in for, uh, for Mike Weil, who's more familiar with these matters than I. He wasn't able to be here today. Um, yeah, typically with the process of a, of a sale, we'll, we'll reach out for, uh, to the abutters, as we discussed earlier, and um, determine uh, their interest in the property. Um, in this case, it's categorized as ordinary. Um, so we'd start with uh, valuation, uh, determine what the pricing is and uh, whether they're interested in proceeding with the transaction based on, on that. Uh, oftentimes, as I mentioned earlier, um, people aren't interested in moving forward with, uh, with projects based on the, uh, the pricing model that we put before them. Uh, so it's, it, it's a step-by-step -step sort of process and um, certainly when there's more interest in a property, it sometimes makes uh, things more complicated and sometimes it makes it more simple as well. So I should contact Michael Weil perhaps to find out. Um, I know, I just know that there's a request from, from proponent one for just a portion of that lot. So I'm just, okay, I'll, I'll contact Michael and. That's a good idea. A good idea, okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morse. Oh, sorry, I spoke, uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I uh, just want to say uh, kudos to staff for the work they did uh, putting this together. Uh, I've only, I wish there were more, but I've only got one in my district, uh, right on Bears Road there, and uh, it's a small little lot, but I think you could get maybe a couple units on there, maybe even a triplex, who knows, and the more affordable housing we can do, the better, so I'm happy to see this and move it forward. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lovelace is on the main motion, I think, yeah, yeah. Councillor Lovelace, Councillor Hensby, you've spoken on the main motion? On the main. Oh, you have spoken on the main, or you, this, this is your first time in the main? First time, no, oh. I've spoken on amendments. Yeah. I've spoken on the main, but I had amendments. Okay, well, I'll go to Councillor Lovelace first, she was ahead, and then I'll come back to you on the second. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have another uh, item to, uh, I just wanted to raise in attachment E. It's the portion of Hamas Plains Road, uh, the right of way that's being declared uh, surplus. Um, and just to have questions, I hope that you'll uh, be able to answer. I mean, obviously when uh, we're looking at um, a section of a roadway and road so shoulder and, um, you know, active, uh, uh, 
bike lane uh, that's now being declared surplus. The section in front of that church on Hammonds Plains Road near the intersection of Lucasville is used for parking quite often. And so um, I, I'm just, I need some clarification on what's gonna happen now that we declare this surplus. Um, we're losing width of our road and, um, you know, a portion of that road shoulder and bike lane. And so I'm wondering what, what do we do now that we don't have that area for uh, the public to access and, and to use? Are we, um, you know, going through a process to actually widen that road now on the other side since we've lost this road shoulder? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. Um, I believe the origin of this request was uh, was from the church. They're yeah. undertaking a uh, process to uh, have the site declared a heritage property. Uh, given portions of the building uh, were located on another property, i.e. the right of way, uh, they weren't able to progress with that, uh, with that process without having their structure on their property. Uh, in addition, um, it's been identified that there, there are burial sites within the, the right-of-way that we're uh, proposing to surplus here. So uh, that's, that's the reasoning behind the, uh, the rectangle that is now right-of-way being uh, declared surplus. Right, no, I do understand uh, the reasoning why it's being declared surplus. My question is what happens now? Do we, you know, we, we are actively losing access to that right of way, which means that um, we won't, ha we'll have parking in front of the church. We won't have access um, to that active transit lane anymore. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, that's, that's correct. Once this is declared surplus and uh, declassified as right of way, it, it'll be private property. Okay, so I guess at that point then um, staff will need to come forward with some kind of a engineering solution for traffic. Uh, if if we lose, like we're losing a bike lane here. This is, we're losing a road shoulder, we're losing pedestrian access. There's a, I, I just think that we need to have a plan in place for how traffic is gonna be moving in this area. You know, there's 20,000 vehicles going through there every day. So. Um, what, I'm just wondering, Madam CAO, is there another step forward? Like what happens next with this roadway? I do not see uh, Peter Duncan in the audience, unfortunately, um, through to the councillor. But I know that there is, um, through some of the growth related planning we're doing, you know, once the regional plan update is done, one of the next pieces that comes after that is an expedited look at infrastructure and what infrastructure is required. Certainly the transportation network, um, that would be one of the key areas we would be looking at. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hensley. Well, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to say that uh, I'll try, I'm going through my archive of emails, but uh, I recall advising the municipality, I have over a dozen parkland properties I'll never see developed as parkland purposes or playgrounds. I suggest in the past that these could be utilized for housing opportunities. I'll, I'll, I'll resubmit my end list again because there's a considerable amount of parkland properties I have throughout my district, especially in the Porters Lake, Lawrencetown area that uh, was given to us in the old subdivision plan um, uh, requirements of the county days. I'd, I'd rather see a consolidation of parklands where I can't have a consolidated community greens or community parks uh, instead of having these individual lots I have scattered everywhere. So um, I'll, I'll, re, I'll re, uh, revisit my email and forward it on to staff for future consideration for uh, Administrative Order 50. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, ready for the question on the motion as amended one time? Thank you, Mike. Motion carries. Thank you and appreciate the work. Uh, 1516 is the uh, proposed administrative order respecting the registry of volunteer emergency service providers. Councillor Mancini. Uh, I can put this on the floor, Mr. Mayor, that the Halifax Regional Council, one, adopt administrative order 2023-003-ADM respecting the municipal registry of volunteer emergency service providers included as set out in attachment one in the staff report dated October 5th, 2023. 
and two, subject to adopt, adoption of Administrative Order 2023-003-ADM, approve the acceptance of six nonprofit organizations as registrants listed in Appendix A of the Administrative Order. Second, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Councillor Nancy. Thank you, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, you know, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, this is about the registry uh, to mandate liability insurance, expand the type of assistance HRM can provide, uh, enhance the authority exceeds uh, the, the typical grant program and so on. Uh, I think it's, an, uh, it's, not, it's a modest uh, cost to HRM in 2024 in support of the six ground search and rescues and the radio clubs. I just want to take this moment to acknowledge that you know, when you look at search and rescue, particularly Halifax search and Re rescue, uh, they broke records the number of times that they were out uh, activated uh, last year. Now they look at those numbers right now, year to date, they're at the same pace, which in, they anticipate next year they'll be even breaking yet r records again. So uh, this is a good thing. I think that they look forward to it. When we come to budget, uh, there'll be lots of discussion on how we support these folks and there's other ways that we need to take a look at very closely. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'm glad to see that the four ground search rescues as well as the two amateur radio groups are listed as the uh, emergency, volunteer emergency services providers. I'd just like to know when can we anticipate our joint emergency management teams be added to this, added to this list? P.J. Temple. Thank you, Mayor Savage. Uh, PJ Temple Grants and Contributions, Finance and Asset Management. Uh, Erica Fleck can't be here today, so I'm a poor substitute. Um, in terms of joint emergency measure committees, um, we prioritize this group, particularly in relation to the proposed and report yet to come about replacing a cash grant program with a, a service agreement model. Um, we don't, to my knowledge, provide cash grants to joint emergency measure committees. Um, the other advantage of this registry is that uh, now the four GSAR teams all own property. So if council were to pass this under the Assessment Act, those four property owners would become tax exempt. So. In some ways, it's expediting that form of operating assistance through tax relief that you have already done um, through our conventional tax relief program. Um, and that should happen quite quickly. Uh, we have been in touch with PVSC, so this shouldn't be long and drawn out. Um, so I, I think my recommend, uh, my suggestion for Council's consideration is let's proceed with the, the four groups that we have uh, with established properties. We are proposing, in effect, that we would elevate the, the recognition for those amateur radio clubs. They're becoming increasingly crucial. Um, and then if there's any further consideration for GEM committees, I think we need a staff to look at that in more detail. What's the nature of their needs? Uh, to my knowledge, they don't own property. There's no tax relief implications in that. They don't receive um, core operating grants. The only assistance that I'm aware of um, has been the loan of uh, communications equipment. I think when they're called into action, they get um, those radio things they get. So uh, I, I don't think their exclusion from the registry at this point uh, does any harm. It doesn't detract from any support they currently receive. Thank you. As I know the, the Joint Emergency Management Team that I'm involved with, um, you're right, they don't own property. Uh, they don't even have a bank account because they're not, they don't fundraise. But the question is, they do have expenses. The question is, how can they be covered? A lot of the times, it was covered through the fire department, uh, through emergency measures uh, division. But I was kind of curious that if, as the GEM teams evolve even further, I think there might have to be an inclusion in the future. But I concur with you that uh, at the present time, there's not, there's not a place for them, but I think there will be in the future. Um, if I could comment as a follow-up. Uh, the current registry legislation requires that they be a registered nonprofit or charitable yeah, organization. Yeah. Um, so again, I think under community safety, is that change uh, going to occur? What's the timing of that change? And through that process, you can look at the, uh, the implications, registration, financial or otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. 
Ready for the question? Question. question. That's carried. It has been a busy year for our volunteers in this area. I know we all appreciate that big time. 1517 Cogswell District Land Use Policies, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to one, initiate a process to amend the Regional Center Secondary Municipal Planning Strategy and Regional Center Land Use Bylaw to develop land use policies and regulations for the Cogswell District lands and surrounding lands consistent with the review items outlined in the discussion section of the staff report dated November 27th, 2023. Two, develop, wait for it, two, develop a strategy to support long-term affordable housing in the Cogswell District lands, consistent with the review items outlined in the discussion section of the staff report dated November 22nd, 2023, and three, follow the public participation program as set out in the community engagement section of the staff report dated November 22nd, 2023. I so move. Seconded by Councillor uh, Lovelace and Stoddard. Let's call it a tie. Councillor Mason, and us? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, staff, for great to see this finally here. I uh, have a couple of questions and comments I'm going to go through. Uh, as far as, you know, one of the things that I find interesting about this whole thing is people thought we were crazy about putting 2,500 people in Cogswell when this started five or six or seven years ago, and now that seems absurdly low. And it's low enough that if you do an analysis of the six, six and a half uh, uh, acres of land that are gonna be created for development, you could do that easily in seven stories. So we're talking about towers up to the rampart height and we're talking about a relatively low population. That's in the previous reports. I didn't really see if we have a population target for when we go out to do the land use planning now or whether that's something that's under debate because right now I see 384 roughly people per acre uh, is not a lot in the high-rise context, I don't think. The affordable housing thing is really important to me and, I, and uh, uh, moving along. And I think that uh, there's an opportunity to marry up the uh, district affordable housing plan with the already in flight discussion around Metro Turning Point 2.0 and all that land along there. And there's been some great developments potentially with the mission and the church that would uh, potentially open up a whole lot of land there. I want to talk about something that I didn't see in the report and I read through it a couple times trying to find it is, uh, are we plan, what's the real estate plan? Because the real estate plan seems to be to sell them block for block or half a block per block. And there's been a lot of discussion in the, in the you know, planning world, the Twitterati of planning around whether that's the right thing to do, especially that when, when we can, we're talking about a couple of really large lots there and selling them, uh, as each block rather than breaking them up into four or six or eight or 12, probably not 12, they're not really that big, means that we're not looking at uh, diversity of ownership of architectural design and the potential for one of those lots on a block to be used for affordable housing or for some kind of social good without potentially, you know, it's a lot to say to a not-for-profit group, hey, you know what, you should take on and in all of lot D and use that as a thing versus you know, a eighth or a tenth or a twelfth. So, so where are we at with that? Because it seems to me that the land use planning is gonna have a lot to do with what we're willing to do and what the direction is. I think we should do smaller lots on lot D, C, and E, on block D, C, and E, I think we should do smaller lots. I know we're impaired to do that on this one that's so, that Crombie's getting, uh, and uh, I know that it probably wouldn't work on the one that uh, is attached to the uh, Squish Square lot or the one we're gonna have next to the transit lot. But, but I think there's an opportunity there to do something significantly different than just a very homogenous looking tower and podium. Uh, I also uh, am interested in clarity about what this means for lot J and lot F. Lot F and J were both rezoned in the center plan in the regional center land use bylaw, their uh, HR six stories is 
what is the boundary of this is a good question. Are those lots going to get rezoned? They were just zoned two years ago. Are other adjacent lots potentially in play like the rest of the other side of probably going to not be named Poplar Street, which is where the Brunswick Street Mission and the A&W car and the uh, Metro Turning Point and Lot J are? Are we talking about potentially, you know, and, and uh, I also had an inquiry from the people who are working in that project. Uh, it's adjacent to, would it be considered with that, this isn't directly related to land use bylaw, but you're here, Donna, so I'm going to ask. They wanted to know if they could get into district energy uh, there. So, so the questions are, what's our target population? What's our plan for uh, development and selling this? Are we open to on some of the lots where it's possible, some of the blocks having more lots so that we get that diversity of ownership? Uh, and have we done an analysis on how approaching it differently like that could impact hitting our target population? So those are my questions for staff. Okay, who's coming forward? But this is great, just to really point out, like, this is amazing, this is finally here, and I'm glad it's here. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Ross Grant with Planning and Development, Strategic Projects. Uh, and you got, to, uh, you got those 36 questions? Yeah. <laughs> it's four. Uh, I'll speak to a few of those and then I'll hand it over to my colleague Donna here to answer a few of these as well. So on the population target, uh, the infrastructure in the district is capable of handling up to 3,400 residential units. So as we go through the planning process, one of the things that staff will look at is the, the building form, like how large the buildings can be, uh, the uh, gross floor area targets that might be applicable, and we're going to obviously take into account the, the public feedback and consultation that we get over the, the form of buildings. So that would, that would sort of play into that. So there's no target, so to speak, but we do know what the, what the ceiling is, and then we'll have to go to the public and see what, what the public is thinking. Um, just on a couple of the questions there around the different uh, parcels that may be included. So um, staff are indicating through the report that we're going to take a look at the surrounding lands um, sort of adjacent to the Cogswell district. So that could include uh, the parcels F and J that you mentioned as well as other parts of the north end or uh, the downtown sort of directly adjacent and, and just see if there's different land use bylaw and, and planning matters that could be considered as we go through this, um, particularly with relation to how those lands and, and buildings and development that may take place over time sort of um, you know, gel with what's going on in the Cogswell district, so to speak. So we'll take a, a broad look for sure. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is Donna Davis and I'm a project manager with the Cogswell district. I also realize it's been a long time since I've been here. <laughs> I guess I've had my head in the sand or the dirt. Uh, so I'm gonna to speak to, uh, through you to uh, Councillor Mason. I'll speak to the real estate plan. So the real estate plan is being developed, but it can't be developed in isolation of the land use and MPS amendment process. Uh, so real estate's going to be working on that. Uh, and in many cases, we'll be taking their lead from what comes out of the public engagement and ultimately what council decides relative to what those land use and zoning provisions are going to be. So everything's on the table. Lot sizes are on the table. Um, and really the real estate plan will transpire once we know what the zoning is and once the other provisions uh, are put in place um, based through that process. Um, so I can reassure you of that. Uh, the other question that I'll respond to is district energy and I just wanna make sure I'm I got the information. So is this property owners on what probably won't be known as Poplar Street who are inquiring about district yeah, energy? Correct. Yeah, so um, right now I don't think that we, I can't speak to that. I'll have to check to see whether or not we're planning to put a lead down Poplar Street or not, but I will double check and, and make sure that I reach out to those property owners as well as Halifax Water. It's really okay. Halifax Water who's taking the lead on talking to the property owners, but um, I'll, because it's been raised with you, I'll make sure that I follow I'll up. I'll be happy to connect you with them. Thank sure. you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Mayor. Good. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and good to see you here, Donna. Um, it is exciting, it has, this has been a long time in coming, and so, um, you know, it's great to be at this point. Um, I just wanted to mention a few things. One was about how happy I am to see affordable housing being considered. I remember when we started this, affordable housing in the Cogswell District wasn't on the table, um, and, and now it is, and I, and I think that, uh, you know, that that's so important that it's there. It's not there by accident. Um, it was there by, you know, as a result of the um, public consultation process that we had at the beginning of this process. So, um, you know, 
I think uh, just a kudos to everyone who's involved in that. Uh, it's rare in that group of 32 that we had everybody from in the Poverty Coalition to some of our biggest developers sitting around a table um, often saying the same thing. Um, so I look forward to um, continued community engagement around this because I think it really does add value to the success of this community. Um, I note in the report that you have um, a community engagement process outlined. We also received some correspondence from um, Paul McKinnon with the Downtown Halifax Business Commission um, expressing desire to continue to be involved in these discussions. Um, I'm, I guess that by the key rights holders, you're including the community groups, and I hope that we can reach out to some of the people who were previously involved in this, um, as well as those who all contributed to funding the, the GAL report, which really looked at different alternatives and how that district could be divided up, how the lots could look, how you know different building forms could achieve a density um, that kind of really meets our targets in, in growing the population in the downtown, as well as the connections between you know, the north end, the integration from the north end to the Cogswell district and the downtown to the Cogswell district and the gateway really to our downtown um, central business district. So, I mean, this, this, this whole development plays such a, a critical role in the heart of our city and I look forward to seeing it um, come, come together. Um, I don't know if there's anything more you have to add about the public participation um, program other than what's in the report. Through the mayor to yourself, councillor. Um, I just want to reassure you that, yes, all of the previous players who were very much involved in the engagement sessions that we held for the last five years will be reaching out to them again, or, or my colleague in planning will be reaching out to them again, and we'll be making sure he has the list. Um, so it will be nice to get those folks back together again uh, because they were so integral. Uh, with the 90% design, with our involvement with GAL, the partnership that we had with uh, the downtown group and the GAL exercise. So we'll make sure that all of them are involved and there's many more other stakeholders who have become interested in the project since construction. Um, so we'll make sure that there's a very wide um, brush that we make sure that there's lots of people involved in the engagement because there's lots of important topics to talk about. Yeah. Um, and I just want to mention that we do talk about this district energy project um, with Halifax Water, if I could just put that cap on there for two seconds. Um, and I'm sure uh, our CAO could speak to this even more than I can. But um, the, the, I think there is an intent to look at how that um, service can be expanded. And so it would be worth having those conversations probably sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, wow, congratulations. This is, this is awesome. We're, we're headed to chat with the public and um, I'm really excited about that. Uh, you know, this is the best place. This is such an ideal place for affordable housing, um, for community development, right? Like not just housing, but community space and thinking differently about what a community is and how it connects to its neighboring communities. Uh, when I was in Edmonton recently, I got to go see Blatchford, which is very similar to what we're doing here. Um, incredible uh, to see the, the changeover from a municipal um, airport into, into housing, into mixed housing, into commercial space, into play space, into creative space. Um, yeah, this is really, really exciting. Just, uh, you know, wanted to um, highlight uh, some of the community engagement um, opportunities and looking through that list. I think that's great. I think it's important to have a survey and get a, get a feed out, uh, get, a, get a sense from people. But I think that the walking tours are necessary. I think having that, that virtual kind of walkthrough for people who can't come in, but to get a better understanding of how the space is gonna actually um, interplay, how it's gonna work together. Um, you know, we've seen concrete here for <laughs> decades, right? And so I think it, this is a, a new, new thinking for people um, to reconsider how to use this space. And I, I understand that, you know, from a, from a, 
I guess, efficiency of time perspective to have both public hearings at the same time, um, you know, that certainly does make sense to bring everyone together to talk about closing the right of ways, talk about the amendments. Um, but I think you're really going to have to be clear on the communications and the expectations because generally when people come to a public hearing, they're talking about one thing. So um, just how that plays out with the public to make sure that they're very clear on, you know, the expectations. We're having this public hearing and then I assume you close that public hearing and move into the next public hearing in order to satisfy the charter. Is that, is that how it would work? Through the mayor to the councillor, I'm going to actually defer that question to the, to the solicitor, but, oh, but, okay. it, but in essence, my understanding is yes. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I think I'd have to take that away and give it some more thought as to the exactly what we would take forward as a process. Okay. Yeah, yeah it, it just seems a little bit confusing if people are coming in for two separate public hearings or for one hearing because you're going to have people speaking on both topics yes. uh, at, at once. So just, I think the public needs to understand clearly how we're going to roll that out to make sure that there's no confusion and also just to help people get through that process. Yeah. We would certainly want it to be clear as to what the process was and what the desired yep. outcome is. Okay. And I don't think it's absolutely determined that there will necessarily be two hearings. I think, I think the point of the report was that these processes are intimately entwined. And in order to get to the final place where we can dispose of the land, if that's the ultimate goal, and the direction from you as to how we do that for whatever purpose it's to be used for, um, basically, there are a number of complicated processes, and so from an efficiency point of view, mm -hmm. I think the report was just simply saying it makes a lot of sense to perhaps bundle a couple of those processes together because they are so intertwined. Um, so we'll be very careful about not confusing the public because it is very important when they come to speak that they know what they're speaking on. And we have a bit more work uh, with our colleagues in planning and development to make sure that, that the processes are really clear. But we just wanted to point out that there are some synergies there that we think where some things can come together and it makes a lot of sense. Excellent, okay, I look forward to hearing what the process is. Yes. And uh, <laughs> yeah, moving forward, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. My only concern, though, in regards to the affordable housing, I want to make sure that we make the most of this property that's made available to us. I think the only restriction should be the rampart uh, view planes from the Citadel. Anything beyond that, we should build as high as we can, except uh, we're within the view planes of the Citadel. So I'm hoping that if an affordable housing project does go forward, it's, it, it's built to the maximum height possible and not, not limited by the amount of money they may have and only do a low rise where a high rise could go. So. We want to make sure that we maximize the, the square footage of this property as much as possible. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I'll just say a quick word on this uh, from, from here. I'm, I'm not going to take part in the debate other than to say uh, I was just a fresh-faced mayor when we had the first Cogswell mashup or something it was called back in the day. Um, Dale Godso, uh, Andy Fillmore, I think, worked for the city then, and, and I hosted it at... Uh, at the Marriott and um, so we've come a long way. It's taken a while but it's come a long way and I remember all the steps along the way and I, um, I'm really pleased because uh, Don, I remember telling you early on when you came to see me that my key thing was that we plug in the local business community and residents so that they know what's happening and uh, whenever I talk to businesses as I did at the opening of Bell's Lane the other day um, in the Pedway that um, people are kind of excited about Cogswell and that you guys have done a great job of including them from everything I've seen. So I thank you for that and I continued good, uh, good wishes. Ready for the question, colleagues? That's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you to the team. Um, 1518 is the uh, regional subdivision bylaw amendments. Councillor, what is your wish? Councillor Outhead. Thank you, Mayor. 
I move that Halifax Region Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to one, initiate a process to consider amendments to the Regional Council subdivision, the Regional Subdivision uh, Bylaw to add development bonds as a security option for subdivisions with new infrastructures and revise how inspection fees are collected for the installation of primary and secondary services associated with subdivision, and two, adopt a public uh, participation program as outlined in the community engagement section of the staff report dated November 22nd, 2023. So moved. Second, Councillor Cleary. Uh, Councillor Arthur, did I have no comments. Thank you. Anybody else? Ready for the question? That's carried, thank you very much. Okay, colleagues, we're moving to the regional plan review phase four, uh, what we heard, and I believe we have a presentation. Leah Perrin. Yeah, Leah Perrin is gonna give us a presentation, uh, folks, so we'll hear the presentation. Good afternoon. Okay, hello, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of Regional Council. My name is Leah Perrin, I'm the Manager of Regional Planning with Planning and Development, and I'm pleased to be here today to present the Regional Plan Review What We Heard report for our Phase Four Engagement Program. <clears throat> so the purpose of today's staff presentation is to provide an overview of the What We Heard report through it, or the what we heard what, through engagement on the draft regional plan between June 20th and October 27th, 2023, and to discuss next steps in the regional plan review. I'll provide a brief summary of the adjustments that we expect to the regional plan policies based on the feedback that we received from the public as well as uh, internal staff review. And I'll give an update on the various site-specific requests we've received. And uh, at, at the end, I'll speak just to next steps uh, in our work program. So just to quickly recap where we are in the overall regional plan review work program, we concluded phase three with a series of quick amendments that regional council approved in October, 2022. We're currently in phase four and we brought a draft regional plan to council uh, and the public for consideration this past June. We undertook a comprehensive public engagement program over the summer and into this fall. And today I'll present the results of that engagement. We plan to bring the full amendment package forward this spring, which will complete phase four. And then we'll start immediately on phase five, which will further consider the municipality's long-term growth plans. The regional plan is a strategic document that provides a region-wide wide vision for how growth and development should take place. It sets out policy vision for how the municipality should grow in our uh, regional centers, suburban and rural communities. The draft regional plan released in June is a complete rewrite of our uh, 2014 regional plan. So what, what we bring forward in the spring will be a, a repeal and replace of that plan. And the changes to the plan are responding to several key drivers, an increase in population growth and pressure on housing, a need to act on climate and equity. Uh, we'll be integrating the various actions from our priorities plans. So the integrated mobility plan, green network plan, Halifax, uh, people, prosperity planet, and the uh, sharing our stories, culture and heritage priorities plan. And the regional plan also sets up some significant work that we'll need to do to plan for growth over the coming months and years. So community engagement on the draft regional plan followed the public participation program that council approved in June. The comment period was open and events ran until October 27th. To get the word out about engagement, we used email lists, social media, radio ads, and ads in local newspapers. We also distributed hard copies of the draft plan to all Halifax Public Library uh, branches for those who prefer to view the document on paper. Engagement took place online with the Shape Your City Halifax website acting as an engagement hub. It had topic summaries, a suburban plan questionnaire, and a comment board. There were over 19,000 web page views. We also held a Reddit Ask Me Anything as a live engagement opportunity online. 
And we kept a dedicated phone number for comments and questions along with a project email for feedback and submissions. In-person engagement events took place in all planning areas and we tailored our approach uh, in different areas. So of the 23 in-person events, 14 were held in suburban locations, three in the regional center and six in rural locations. And we met over 600 people at these events. These included pop-ups at public places or um, special events. Planner office hours were uh, a way for us to, to sit in rural libraries. We had six uh, days over three rural library locations, uh, which let us, allowed us to speak to people in detail about uh, planning policies. Open houses were scheduled in suburban locations, which allowed us to introduce uh, suburban residents to the suburban community planning program work that will be upcoming. We also held about uh, 20 stakeholder meetings throughout the summer and fall, including presentations at meetings set up by community groups. So we were invited out, uh, including at, at a meeting at the old school gathering, uh, community gathering place in Muscadabit Harbor. Uh, they advertised it on a sign and we had about 80 people at that meeting. It was pretty fun. We received 56 responses to the suburban plan questionnaire and 122 detailed written submissions, which are included in your package today. So overall, uh, the What We Heard report is a, a detailed summary of the key themes of feedback. And overall, the uh, feedback we received was generally supportive of the key policies and objectives in the draft regional plan. We heard comments in support of the, healthy, of the concept of healthy communities as a guiding framework for planning and for environmentally focused regulations to pr uh, protect sensitive ecosystems. We received comments about the needs to reduce barriers to housing and ensure housing is available and affordable. Many comments identified a need to plan for social and physical infrastructure alongside planning for growth. Community infrastructure needs like parks, transit, emergency services were raised frequently. And on the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll talk a bit about, uh, more about that on, in terms of what we heard from urban and, suburb and rural communities in particular. So the engagement program uh, introduced the public to the suburban community planning program and also highlighted work already created, uh, or sorry, completed through the center plan process. The feedback we received will inform uh, the suburban community planning going forward and certainly any amendments to the regional center as well. We received feedback from urban residents that they'd like to see walkable, complete communities that provide housing, shops and services in mixed use areas that are well connected by transit. There are some questions and some concern about how existing neighborhoods would be impacted as the region grows. We heard about the need for investment in mobility infrastructure, especially transit and active transportation, as well as roads to allow residents to move around their own communities and connect to others. Feedback we received from, uh, from and about rural communities will inform the rural community planning program. The draft regional plan laid out the intent to undertake a community-led approach to rural planning to incorporate local knowledge into the planning framework. We heard, back, uh, heard feedback from residents in communities like Muscadabit Harbor where they've undertaken their own community development plans already that there was support for this approach. Feedback from rural communities highlighted a, a strong desire for the planning framework to support rural economic development opportunities in a way that maintains or enhances their uh, existing rural community character that supports the development of main streets and also there was a strong emphasis on uh, the importance of access to nature in our rural communities and that that's really valued. Comments from rural residents like urban residents also touched on the need for investment in mobility, infra mobility options and community infrastructure. There were some comments regarding concerns for groundwater availability and for water quality. Uh, comments also touched on the need for protection of coastlines and for uh, protecting remaining agricultural land. And given the recent experiences with wildfires and flooding, we heard from residents about emergency planning and the issues of access and egress. So table one in the staff report highlights some of the key themes heard through the feedback and it summarizes the adjustments that we expect to make to the plan before we come forward to council uh, in the spring with first reading. So first, the public and also internal staff made lots of comments uh, on kind of overall readability of the plan and uh, in places where we might have used maybe inconsistent terms. So we'll make revisions throughout the plan to try to use more plain language and make sure that the poly policy intent is very clear. Uh, it's clear from our engagement with the public as well as uh, council and our colleagues in other business units that as we grow, there are significant pressures on our services and infrastructure, and we need to find ways to move quickly to respond to this rapid growth. We expect to revise uh, the regional plan to further emphasize the importance of a strategic growth and infrastructure's priority plan, which is set 
up in the draft, um, but it's just a, a really important piece that will guide the municipality's work on investing in services and infrastructure, including, including water, wastewater, stormwater services, transit and the mobility network, emergency services, community and parkland facilities, among others. This is expected to be uh, really the cornerstone of the work that we'll do in phase five. While the regional plan is setting out uh, the vision for our regional work, we're also doing a lot of work in parallel at the community planning level. So the draft regional plan set out policies to support an increase in the housing supply, particularly through gentle density and missing, missing middle housing forms. In September, uh, this past September, Regional Council directed staff to expedite amendments to planning documents in support of the Housing Accelerator Fund. So the community planning uh, team is working on a separate package of amendments to support this work. Additionally, our planned growth team is responsible for comprehensive neighborhood planning for future service communities and future growth nodes, um, you know, places where we expect to see a lot of growth. Um, and so there's a need to ensure that the, the process is set out uh, very clearly in the regional plan for how that, that those programs work. We received comments on the draft regional plan requesting a greater emphasis on implementing the green network plan, including increased protection for environmentally environmental features or ecologically sensitive places. The green network plan is a comprehensive priorities plan which sets, which sets out actions for ongoing work. And the regional plan, we are implementing uh, the green network plan actions related to land use planning through amendments to planning policy and associated land use bylaw regulations. So for example, an increase to the water course buffers um, from 20 meters to 30 meters region wide. Uh, and the regional plan will also set up a lot of policy intent for future environmental planning work supported by both the Green Network Plan and Halifax. Um, and in particular, uh, big pieces of work are around watershed management, improved protection for wetlands and management of flood risks both inland and on the coast. Uh, the Green Network Plan also sets out a series of corridors for landscape connectivity and wildlife movement. Uh, the draft regional plan, we had included a preliminary approach to how we might protect those corridors. We knew that that policy was in draft and needed some work. Um, and so we received pretty clear feedback, um, both internally and from the public, that um, they didn't quite understand how it worked. And that's fair, because uh, we were still working through it. Um, so we expect, ultimately, that multiple tools for regulating development will be required, as, long, as well as uh, an ongoing program to explore opportunities for restoration of, of these ecological corridors. Um, and that will be a part of the ongoing uh, work as part of the Green Network Plan implementation program. So in terms of the site-specific requests, uh, we've continued to, res to accept requests for uh, amendments for specific pieces of property um, through the regional plan process. Uh, so generally, these are requests that require uh, amendments to the regional plan and not, not suggest to a community plan. Uh, so we received an additional nine requests since the draft regional plan was released in June, and one was withdrawn by the applicant. Attachment B of the staff report summarizes all of the requests, our initial assessment against existing policy, and provides a recommended approach for each. Of the nine new requests that we received, uh, we're recommending that eight should be considered during uh, phase five when we're looking at future growth. Um, and one is not recommended at this time, but will be referred to the Rural Community Planning Program. Uh, for the requests that we're, we'll be handling during the phase four work, uh, that includes a new policy and zoning for the Purcells Cove backlands area uh, to recognize that this is no longer an area uh, envisioned for future service development. There's a request to permit a boardwalk with a commercial use within the watercourse buffer of Lake Banook uh, along a shoreline that's already been altered. There's a request to enable redevelopment of an existing uh, building on Ketch Harbor Road, and the draft regional plan includes a rural adaptive reuse policy that could be used uh, for that application. And finally, there are two adjustments to the business industrial sub-designation to include additional lands for industrial uses in Burnside and Aerotech business parks. Uh, so in terms of the requests, uh, most of the requests in attachment B are uh, expected to be dealt with during the phase five when we will be considering um, future growth. And there are some similarities amongst those phase, phase five requests. Um, so as we're doing that work, we'll focus on um, considering whether, how, and where future development should be considered beyond the boundaries of the current urban area. Um, there are requests to begin study of additional urban reserve areas and to designate new areas for growth. Um, 
in particular, the middle Sackville area is seeing uh, significant development pressure as well as there are water quality concerns in the Springfield Lake area. Um, so those, those are, uh, you know, there are areas that are becoming obvious that we need to study uh, as we move forward. And uh, there are quite a few requests to uh, remove or adjust Schedule J, uh, which is a growth control area in the Beaverbank and Hammonds Plains area. Um, and so we'll be con considering development in these areas uh, and their relationship to sort of community connections and the need for emergency egress uh, from existing neighborhoods during that phase. So uh, just in terms of next steps, we are now uh, working to revise the regional plan policy and write the full amendment package, which will include uh, supportive amendments to the regional subdivision bylaw, all community plans, and land use bylaws. Uh, staff are targeting uh, this spring to present the final amendment package to regional council, and a public hearing must be held before council consi can consider approving the plan. In phase five, uh, when we'll consider future growth scenarios, it will begin immediately following adoption of the regional plan. Uh, and it's anticipated that this phase will include developing that strategic growth and infrastructure's priority plan and uh, ultimately is likely to result in further amendments to the regional plan. Uh, so uh, these are the recommendations in front of you today. And uh, thank you very much for your time today. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Leah, thank you very much uh, for the work and uh, the report. Uh, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'll put the motion on the floor here that Halifax Regional Council, one, accept the draft regional plan. What we heard report included as attachment A of the staff report dated November 20th, 2023, and two, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to follow the recommended approach to site-specific requests for regional plan amendments as generally outlined in attachment B of the staff report dated November 20th, 2023. Second, Second Councillor Stoddard, Councillor Cuttle. Um, first of all, thank you to you and the entire team. I don't know exactly how, mon how many staff were helping with the What You Heard report and all the community engagement sessions and outreach and the development of the information boards and, and the hosting and organizations of the, the in-person um, open houses, but it was really well done. I heard a lot of positive feedback from members of my community who attended the sessions and felt that they walked away more informed about what this process was about and also that they were heard and I think um, you know through the opportunity to socialize the what we heard report over the next little while um, I, I'm hopeful that people will see their comments um, in that report and and feel that they were listened to um, I've got oh my god there's so much in here and my computer just died so I don't have my list of notes uh, in front of me at the moment so I might have to come back but um, one thing that I did want to talk about was the emphasis that is on um, watershed management and planning, um, flood risk, uh, protection of uh, waterways and, and lakes, which, um, which is really good to see that there's such an emphasis on that. One of the things that I, I'm really concerned about is how do we marry land use planning with things like stormwater management, where stormwater management is, you know, kind of really the responsibility of Halifax water and land use of, is, um, you know, with, with the city. And while there's like the protection of wetlands, it's like how are we looking at, at these natural systems as part of an urban ecology or suburban ecology to help us deal and mitigate all of the stormwater issues that, that we've faced recently, which I believe we're gonna continue to face and are gonna continue to be a problem for us. How, so I don't know if you can speak to that um, in, in this plan, but how, how are those two pieces fitting together? And what can we expect moving forward with that? Uh, thank you, uh, through uh, you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Um, that's, that's a great question and, and is uh, definitely on our mind and that, that's what we're trying to do with the regional plan is kind of use it as the, the fabric that sort of is knitting uh, a lot of the actions that are in the Green Network Plan to, together with the actions that are in Halifax, together with the integrated joint 
uh, stormwater management standards that both HRM and Halifax Water work on. Um, so we're uh, getting very close to being able to hire a Green Network Plan coordinator uh, position or project manager who will help with some of that cross-departmental work. Uh, right now, um, Shannon Minima, who was here earlier today, the, uh, the, that group, uh, the Environment and Climate Change group, uh, is leading the watershed management piece. Um, their group is also working on some of the flood risk, risk pieces together with our Resilient Infrastructure Standards Group and P&D. Um, and uh, then we work with Halifax Water kind of regularly on the stormwater management side as well. So I'm hoping that Green Network Plan uh, position will be able to also kind of knit some of those pieces together. So we're trying to kind of get at some of that. Like, yes, it's all connected. I think there's a section in the draft plan that calls it like, you know, the umbrella is like the watershed management. These are all, this is all an interconnected system. Um, and how can we coordinate better over time? So it's a bit of, uh, we're doing different pieces of work in different places. And now how do we make sure that we're coordinated across groups? Um, and, yeah. and, and will there be changes to how um, parcels of land are subdivided or developed as a result of this? I think it's a bit too early to say because it really depends on what we're talking about. You know, if you're looking at flood risk, that, then certainly, yes, so you're, you know, you're identifying, you're going through a process where you're identifying uh, places of risk um, and there might be changes to land use regulations accordingly. Um, it might also be changes to the way we develop, so not necessarily the amount of development, but the way that the development is organized. So a lot of our, um, you know, even the, the information about our future service communities, we're kind of trying to get at that. You do a land suitability analysis and identify where the, the most suitable places are, what are the pieces you protect them, how can you organize land in a way that respects um, kind of natural flows of stormwater and those sorts of things. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's all it's all a system. We have to work together for sure. All right, thank you Kat, so much. CAO wants to weigh in on that, and then we're going to take our break. We're going to have to have you come back after uh, uh, CAO. Yes, uh, Mayor, through to Council Kettler. I just wanted to note also that Council has Administrative Order 18, ADM 18, I believe, which is the Halifax Water Related Administrative Order which requires Halifax Water to basically be aligned with the municipality's strategic plans. So the regional plan, of course, would be one of our main strategic plans. And when Halifax Water comes in and presents their business plan in March or their annual reports on performance around August, you know, that is something that they try very much to reflect the alignment with the municipality's plans. The other thing of note is that there is a working committee, the SW3 committee, which meets on stormwater issues with municipal representation, provincial department of environment, and uh, Halifax water on a regular basis. Thank you very much. Colleagues, we're gonna to have to take our break. We're coming back in camera to do those items. So uh, Leah, we'll have to have you hang around a bit and join up. There's two, well, there's three more speakers now, so we'll have you come back after uh, we've done in camera, okay? Colleagues, we'll take a break and come back at 20 past three. Thank you.
okay or? No, not yet. Okay, we're good to go. Leah, welcome back. Thanks for coming back. Uh, I think the board has got, reflects the people who were on the list when we left, beginning with Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to, uh, actually my question is uh, more of clarification on slide 11. Slide 11 is uh, the uh, discussion of uh, site-specific requests and the things that are gonna be managed in phase five. And I see where urban service area expansion is on the, is listed, but I just wanna make uh, or get clarification. You're just talking about water and sewer. You're not talking about transit because it's my understanding that expansion of the transit service boundary has been um, sort of taken out of the regional plan update process and it now rests with the uh, JRTA. No? Okay. Please, <laughs> school me. <laughs> Thank you for the question uh, through Mr. Uh, Mayor to the Councillor. Um, no, the JRTA were, will certainly, they'll be working on their uh, regional transportation plan and it will help inform our strategic growth and infrastructures priorities plan in all of the, the future uh, growth area scenarios that we uh, look at. So it's their, their work is more, they're a little bit ahead of us. So certainly will be an input. But no, when we're looking at um, should we consider expanding the urban area, it's a consideration for water, wastewater, transit. So should we grow, you know, should the sort of those, that trifecta of things uh, grow yeah. outwards? Um, so we'd be looking at places that we know have asked for transit service. Um, Beaverbank, uh, Lucasville, those places will definitely be uh, something we'll consider as we move forward. So it's more of a, um, we can't just move the transit service boundary without also talking about land use. So it's a bit of, if we're thinking right. about um, you know, if there are requests for uh, increased transit service, that also means we need to talk about what kind of uh, settlement pattern is there that's going to support the transit uh, okay. that's being asked for. So no, it's it's a comprehensive um, a review. It does like, see that we're saying service because okay. that's kind of the way that the plan is structured today. But really, it's a it's a it's a thought about how we expand all those services kind of all right. together. Excellent. No, yeah. because I've been going back and forth with a resident that uh, was under the impression that the, the whole expansion of the transit boundary has been uh, taken off regional plan and put in with uh, the JRTA. So I just, all right. So uh, we're all going to be talking about uh, transit service in Lucasville and Beaver Bank next year when we're dealing with phase five. Absolutely. Right. Yep. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> um, but thank you. So, you know, the, the, the conversations we've had over the years about uh, transportation access, settlement patterns, um, you know, as of right development uh, on Pakwak Road that's now reached 1,000 new units, um, you know, lack of um, transit connectivity between um, community transit and, and transit and the lack of connectivity between land use planning and transit in general has been, uh, I think, loud and clear um, throughout uh, the comments that we've received. Um, I just want to say thank you for visiting us in District 13. Um, lots of great conversations. I think it was extremely educational for the public to learn a little bit more about this process and actually specifically, you know, speak to their concerns. Now, obviously, a lot of it was um, tainted uh, by the trauma that we've experienced in the Hammonds Plains Upper Tan Talon area with um, wildfire and with flooding and concerns around egress and, and um, you know, control of uh, stormwater and how that actually interplays um, with community development. Um, and in particular, looking at the, the phase five work that we're going to be doing um, in the next year, I think it's really, really, really important that people 
people have a better understanding of how to engage, where to access information, how to um, learn about this. Because when they're providing comments, um, sometimes they're 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 just they're not informed um, of how the process at HRM actually works to do the consideration of these planning documents. So uh, the connector, for example, between Westwood and Highland or Westwood and um, uh, Pukwok Road, you know, obviously it was really concerning for people when that, it was like the 11th hour and that proposal came in. And so it seemed like uh, for some people that they, this developer was bypassing the process. And so I, I, I do think that while the community is seeing all of this as a right development and not fully understanding how it actually works into the settlement pattern, because we don't have a community plan for Hammonds Plains, we just have a very large land use bylaw that is under Schedule J. And so then you've got developers who are also struggling with Schedule J and saying, but hey, I thought we were in a housing crisis. We're trying to build here. Um, so I, I just feel like we're, sometimes we're not really clear with what the process is and how people can actually participate in it uh, fully, especially if they're not um, you know, in, in, informed overall of how this suburban plan or how the rural plan or how this uh, regional plan is actually going to work and be implemented in the community. So I'm just wondering if you can I know that's a long question, but if you could just extrapolate, please, how it is that once this phase five is actually completed, what people are wondering, what's my community gonna look like after all of this? Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councilor. Now, that's a big question, and um, you know, all, the regional plan, its role is to set that kind of overall vision, and then we have community planning that does write land use bylaws. And you know, in a lot of cases, we're writing land use bylaws, setting up what can happen uh, under the, today's rules, and sometimes that stuff doesn't happen for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the development that's happened in Hammonds Plains has been things that were, you know, that zoning was in place from the 1980s and didn't actually come to be until the market uh, kind of brought it about. So we have to be careful when we're talking about community to not say this plan is ultimately what will happen. It's more about we're trying to write regulations that reflect the rules and the vision of the community that you want to see. Um, so, so, you know, we can, we can help community, uh, you know, members of the public kind of understand the, the planning framework and the role that the municipality has in guiding development um, and then the role that the that sort of private industry has in actually building the things that are So permitted. I think you just nailed it in guiding development, mm -hmm. right? I think that's what's, that's, that's the difference. People feel that um, we are dictating development when in fact we're providing land use bylaws that are guiding potential development in their community. And so that's where that whole GU zoning came up, which is we, we were clear that this isn't working for the community. So um, we adjusted and made some changes. But when it comes to actually being able to formally look at what the land use bylaw should be in the next five to 10 years, um, the, I guess that would have to come through that bylaw simplification process. Uh, yep, through the, through the mayor to the councillor. So yes, so the, the suburban planning, so everything in the urban area where uh, we have currently water, wastewater transit service uh, is being handled through the community planning program. Kasha Tota's team uh, leads the team that is running that work. Uh, and then we also have a, a rural community planning program. We talked to you a bit about this sort of framework, uh, yep. I think when we released the plan in June. But um, yeah, we're, we'll expect that the rural will, um, take a bit more time because the communities are much more diverse. There's much different pressures around the edge of the current service boundaries um, in places like Hammonds Plains that we'll have to think about a little bit differently than where you know we might think about Sheet Harbor as an example. You know, there's there's different levels of planning that have to happen in different places. So that that's a complication for the rural areas for sure. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and thank you, Leah. Uh, huge, huge work just getting this uh, report to us. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could say a little bit more about the growth centers that were identified many years ago, and if you could tell us a little bit more about them. I, th I think there's a few dozen. There are a few dozen growth centers. I, I'm just wondering how many there are, and um, 
do they, do they all have the same rationale or do we have agreement on how they were identified? And if not, during phase five, is there some way to review and update um, those growth centers to see if they still apply given the population growth that we've seen and other changes that we've seen uh, in HRM since they were identified? Uh, thank you through uh, the mayor to the councillor. So I'm, I'm just to clarify, you mean the future service communities? Well, like, uh, so any areas that don't currently have services that greenfield developments, I guess. Sorry, no, I'm sorry. No. I mean, um, for example, at the corner of Lacewood and Dunbrack okay. on the Sobe site, yep. that's identified to have a high density. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So those kinds of nodes, there, there are a lot of them. Yeah, so uh, the suburban growth areas that are identified in Sorry. the uh, draft regional plan are areas where they're within the, the bus rapid transit corridors identified in the rapid transit strategy. So we, uh, Council adopted the rapid transit strategy in 2020 and identified that this is where rapid transit corridors were go, therefore we should have transit oriented development to support uh, that rapid transit. So the areas that are identified in the draft regional plan are, are those areas. So uh, was there not at one time uh, this sort of this push by uh, previous councils to have a growth area in every district whether or not it um, met other requirements? Uh, there is certainly a different list of growth centers in the, the current 2014 regional plan. Um, I, don't, I don't have, you know, it broken down by district certainly, um, but the suburban, for the urban area, the suburban community planning program will, you know, further look at all of that work. Um, you know, I expect that that will come forward in the new year um, uh, with further information on that. I, I don't have that information because it's not my area. Okay, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but essentially the priority is um, for areas that are on bus rapid transit. That's right. Okay, yep. great, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Leah. Thank you for all the reading. Again, <laughs> um, the, my question is about also the slide 11 that talks about what is phase five. That seems to be a lot where um, in my district that there are issues and I know we've spoken about the Canal K's group and they're in there saying that it would be looked at in phase five. I think it's <clears throat> in attachment B, table one, it's about page 29 is where it's referenced. So does that come under those growth controls, the schedule J? I was trying to figure out where they fit uh, in that. So that's one question. And then the other question is like in the presentation, it says urban um, feedback and it says rural feedback. So the missing metal is suburban feedback. And I was just wondering why there wasn't a slide. It was just that it's the blend of both because we're sometimes within a service area and sometimes without. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. Uh, so f uh, for the Canal Keys, they, those uh, specific parcels are uh, properties that are unable to be subdivided because they were subdivided outside the municipal process and can no longer get permits. Um, and they, uh, we will deal with them and we've recommended uh, handling them in phase five because there's a lot of other things kind of happening in that area. We have another request um, from a, a developer kind of quite close to that, you know, recognizing that there's a new highway going in uh, the Aerotech connector. Yes. So um, you can kind of, when you look at it on a map and you can see the transportation connections, it makes sense that we would look at this area more comprehensively um, rather than just enabling that development kind of as a, as a one-off. Um, so that's, that's sort of how that's structured. Um, but yes, they, they are in our, our phase five uh, bucket. <laughs> um, and uh, on the slides around urban and uh, rural, yes, we're, we're, um, uh, we had, a, we were, had a, a strong focus in this um, uh, engagement around the suburban communities because we've done a lot of work recently in the regional center, but ultimately the uh, regional center and the, and the suburban areas are both areas that are served by water, wastewater, transit. So a lot of the issues are the same. You're sort of hearing, you know, it's the same type of uh, development community. Rural is everything outside of that uh, service boundary. Um, and so that's um, why. You're reading my face. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm not and, answering and my face is saying, well, wait a second, because suburban, when I think about in District 1 suburban, um, probably the only service that is there would be water. 
but there is no wastewater and there is no transit. So to be lumped in with urban without those two services and without it being looking like it's coming anywhere soon, it would seem to me that it might need to have its own uh, sort of look at. Right, the suburban uh, boundary yeah. is the water wastewater transit boundary. So anywhere that just has water service only would be in the rural community planning area. Um, so uh, when I was answering the question before about how you know okay. we have to look at different places in the rural area, especially we have to look at different uh, community settlement, settlement patterns in different ways. That's a great example of where that needs to happen. So the slide that says rural could be rural and suburban then? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Thank the million dollar question is about when, when we would project moving into this phase five work. Uh, so we are uh, intending to bring forward this full amendment package to you uh, in the spring and uh, we'll be starting on that phase five work right away. And we've started to do some of that, the preliminary work around population projections and employment projections and uh, all of that that will go into it. We've started that work already. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh CAO. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through to Councillor Deagle Gammon, I just wanted to note that District 1 does have wastewater service in some areas too, so it's not just water service. Like there's Lockview, McPherson, and Middle Muscadabit, and a few other small plants. Thank you very much. Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'll also be commenting on page 11 of the, of the slide, plus also paragraph in the report on, uh, what page is this? Page seven. Uh, in regards to the uh, phase five in the next consultation areas, you talk about uh, in here, ensuring the collaboration of the African Nova Scotia communities to review the land use policy and service provisions in these communities in line with their community development objectives. Um, I was recently at a ratepayers meeting in North Preston and, uh, and the residents there, we had about 30 people there and Councillor Purdy joined me for that meeting that night. Uh, they were talking about community development issues and concerns, what what does the city have planned for us? And I said, no, what should the community have planned for itself? And what do they have to help the city pro help assist with? Uh, the issue there is, is I think we need to have more engagement with the communities. Um, I'm not sure more than just the Road to Economic Prosperity program, I think we need to have perhaps some discussions with the local ratepayer organizations in North Preston, East Preston, as well as um, Lake Loon Cherry Brook. But we talk about having the, um, the uh, suburban review, uh, the municipal planning strategy for Cherry Brook, Lake Loon, Lake Major, North Preston, and East Preston, uh, four of those five communities have s s water services and a little bit of sewer services, but East Preston's outside the service boundary and they want to be included in the so-called suburban review because some, some, some residents of the community want to see a water line extension into, into East Preston for a portion of the community. So they want to know, they don't want to be left out of the discussion. You know, they don't want to wait until down the road for the, for the rural discussion. They're on the cusp of the, of the suburban area. The rest of the MPS is being discussed as a part of the suburban review. They just want to be a part of that process. So I don't know how do we make that a process? Do I have to make a formal motion for that or just yeah. stay, staff will take it, take it and run with it? Okay, great. Um, I, can, I can provide clarification. I, I think you're actually giving that direction to us today um, because the East Preston request uh, actually is in uh, attachment B and uh, it flags uh, that they're an African Nova Scotian community. We have a dedicated African Nova Scotian community action planning team that we're standing up right now. There's two staff dedicated right now. We'll be hiring some more folks. Servicing discussions sort of need to be tied into the broader uh, discussion, but we'll be working with African Nova Scotian communities on their community development objectives, as the report says. Um, so it's it's a bit of uh, sort of two attack, tackling it from two sides. Uh, so yes, I think you're giving that direction to us today. Excellent, and uh, you're welcome anytime to Muscadabra Harbor for a community meeting. See, it was one of the greatest turnouts that you've probably seen for one of your community information sessions. Uh, there's a, a keen interest. Uh, in, in the rural areas and you know, that's why the, the, some of these growth nodes, those, those district uh, service centers have been identified in the regional plan. There's a couple as, as Councillor uh, uh, Morris talked about is some of them may be off the mark a bit. I know of a couple in my area that are not going to be the growth centers as anticipated by the plan. I've always said that they're just off the mark by a few, by a kilometer or so. 
but like for instance, Lake Echo should be down towards Mineville. The one there, the Cherrybrook area should be probably over by Lake Major, uh, Old Miller Road area. So those areas, are, uh, we just missed the mark or putting the bullseye. So I think we need to reevaluate some of these growth nodes or district centers that we've, we identified. But uh, it was a, a thorough report, 1,000 plus pages. Thank goodness I didn't print it off, but because um, I would have been out of tone a long time ago. But anyway, uh, I just want to say thanks and I'm looking forward to the, the next phases, but uh, please engage the community as much as possible and, and let us know well in advance so we can get into our newsletters and our community newspapers. You know, in the rural areas, it's important that uh, people see it that way and not, not the uh, two-week notice on, on a social soundbite. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, I agree, time is so, so important to rural communities and um, you know, just having it out on social media uh, isn't enough. So that communication is, is very, very important. I just to think ahead. My question to you um, is, uh, you probably know this, egress. <laughs> so we know that we're uh, you know, looking at um, uh, clarifying, defining emergency egress so that it's quite clear as to how long it is, how wide it is, what it looks like, and all of those kind of good details and then that will be placed into the red book through the design guidelines so everyone will know what an emergency egress actually looks like um, but then of course we've got uh, another question around uh, private roads and looking at what private roads and private shared driveways actually look like how um, and how and where they could be should be um, certainly we have uh, a, a, in district 13 far too many organizations, nonprofits, area rate groups that are coming and saying, we don't want these roads, um, partly because they can't put capital investment into those roads to actually upgrade them, um, do the stormwater, uh, the cross culverts and the asphalt and so on and so forth. So um, I think in, in you know, re re I guess reducing uh, the risk, I think we need to be much more clear about what a private road is where it could be um, and, and define that within, I guess, the subdivision bylaw as well. But um, in thinking about some of the, you know, the comments that I saw in here uh, about actually expanding private road use and adding more lots onto private roads, I'm just wondering if you could speak to me where, where staff are going with those private roads. Um, personally, I would like to see them restricted even more. <laughs> it's uh, causing too much problem. Uh, thank you through uh, you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. Uh, there are, I think you've correctly identified a lot of issues and I don't think we've done uh, enough work to really fully capture the range of things that need to be adjusted. So I, I expect that will come in kind of the next phases of work we do and it, it might be a bit of a a bit of phase five, a bit of the rural plan, because I think we need to, we, it's been a long time since we've done a clear overhaul of the regional subdivision bylaw. Uh, I know that our development officers and development engineers are, um, you know, aware of issues in rural communities where things are created, uh, you know, shared private driveways, because the subdivision bylaw actually doesn't permit new private roads, formal private roads, but shared private driveways, which are essentially private roads, are, are a thing. Um, but we haven't quite, gotten there in our regulations and it means a lot to the way that we're developing in rural communities. So I think it's actually a much bigger conversation and I, I don't think we're ready to land one way or the other and certainly I think even amongst council there are not necessarily <laughs> shared opinions. Yeah, it's, it's definitely there's a lot including the insurance and how people can actually get that property insured when they don't own it. So I, I appreciate we'll just keep talking about it and hopefully come to some kind of conclusion. Thank you. Okay, colleagues. Uh, Leah, thank you very much. Uh, great work. Uh, ready for the question? question. Carrie, thank you very much. Okay, colleagues, 15110, which is Municipal Planning Strategy Land Use Bylaw Amendments to Restrict Water Lot Infilling, Northwest Arm, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council give first reading to consider proposed amendments to the Regional Centre Secondary Municipal Planning Strategy, the Halifax Municipal Planning Strategy, the Regional Centre Land Use Bylaw, and the Halifax Mainland 
use bylaw as set out in attachments A, B, C, and D of the staff report dated December 6, 2023 to restrict water lot infilling on the Northwest Arm and schedule a public hearing. Second, Councillor Mason. Councillor Cuddle. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, we, you know, we spoke about this at the last uh, council meeting we had where we made the motion to bring it forward for a first reading. Um, I'm very happy and excited to see this uh, on the agenda today and uh, hope I have council support um, in approving this and, and moving this important change to our bylaws forward. Thank you. Councillor Mason. Similar to Councillor Cuddle, I don't really have a lot to say uh, as we are just at uh, uh, early days, first reading, but uh, to me, uh, it's been a long time coming and the clarity is definitely required. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ready for the question? Carried. Thank you very much. 15-2-1, uh, uh, bylaw N-200 passed on consent. Coming out of Executive Committee 15-3-1, we are uh, by consent appointing our favorite returning officer, 15-3-1. Uh, 15-3-2, uh, colleagues, is uh, coming out of Executive as well, and that's the amendment to bylaw C-1000 campaign finance. Councillor Mason. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Slightly different wording given to me by the clerk from uh, what was uh, on our agenda, that Halvax Regional Council give first reading to consider, one, adopting bylaw C-1102, amending bylaw C-1100, the campaign finance bylaw, as set out in attachment one, revised the attached executive standing committee report dated November 27, 2023, and two, directing the chief administrative officer to conduct a review of campaign finance bylaw that considers inflation for the amount of campaign contribution and the maximum spending limits and that the review be completed prior to January 1st of an election year. I so move. Second, Second Councillor Lovelace, Councillor May. Uh, it's great to see these uh, coming forward, you know, it's like a senior child grow up, uh, enjoying all the phases of their life. This is something that you and I, Mr. Mayor, have been uh, working on since we first arrived in this uh, vaunted, uh, you know, uh, establishment some time ago, uh, 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, to see the ongoing, you know, minor improvements and changes that are being made, uh, but also reflecting the fact that uh, inflation is a real thing and we want to uh, respect that as well. So I'd like to thank staff for getting this in just under the wire uh, for uh, the next uh, round of campaigning. Uh, passing this today will allow us to have it in time for uh, the clerks or the uh, uh, election returning folks to get this out to the public uh, before the March 1st start of the big show. So uh, I would ask for your support on this and uh, I thank staff for the work on it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, really happy to finally um, move forward with this. Uh, I, I do have a question, though. Do we have boundaries yet for our next election? Mr. McLean? We are still waiting on the decision from the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board on the final determination of the boundaries. Is there a, a date expected when they'll be able to provide us? Um, I, I, you know, because I know staff need to get started and holding um, candidate information sessions to raise awareness that people can become candidates in the next election. Obviously, we, we want to get moving on that. Do we have to wait for the boundaries? Is that going to be January, February? So, so we will be going out and providing as much information as possible. We do not have an updated date on when to expect that boundary decision. Okay, and so when is staff expected to move forward with, um, you know, explaining this new uh, revised um, C-1000 bylaw to, to prospective candidates and their teams? Second reading will come to regional council in January, and the hope and the anticipation is we'll have a boundary decision by that point in time. Okay, that's excellent. So hopefully we'll have, um, you know, renewed interest uh, in the new year in 2024 for people getting excited about that October election. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just very quickly, so as I'm reading this, because the report was actually kind of confusing the way it kind of went and then came to us 
through that circuitous route. Uh, contribution now has to be made by a Nova Scotia resident. Uh, the contribution uh, limits going up from 1,000 to 1,200 for candidates, 3,000 to 3,500, I think it was, for, uh, was it the three? Can't remember. No, for the mayor. Yeah, 30, anyway, well, it was going up. Um, the campaign spending limit for a, cam a candidate's campaign going from 30 to 35 and a ridiculously high amount for the mayor. These aren't real limits. I mean, no one, no campaign spends this much, so you're not limiting anything. I tried to get these lower the last time we did this, and so unlike my colleagues, uh, I, don't, I don't think this is improvement. Um, and so you didn't actually. 30,000, you didn't. Um, I checked, I've got the list here. Uh, anyone could go to halifax.ca, click on uh, council, click on uh, elections, and you could get all the reports. Uh, the most was like 20, 21,000. And so um, nobody even came close to the 30,000 limit. Now we're saying, well, let's make it 35, and no one came close. Um, the other thing is, and I, I, I heard the arguments around executive for the whole spouse and whatnot, and I'm not sure if anyone clued into this, but now where a spouse and, and candidate could contribute 15,000, now it's gonna be 18,200. Um, because we're taking out the spouse part, so a candidate can have now 17,000, and then their spouse could contribute 18, or 1,200, so that's actually 18,200. Uh, so we've actually made it easier for spouse and candidate to contribute more uh, rather than limit it. I would prefer, I'll look to see if any of my colleagues have uh, appetite for this, but I would love, so if you look at federal and provincial campaign spending limits, they get real limits, um, a candidate can't contribute any more than any other individual in, in the province or the federal government. <clears throat> no, we didn't. It's changed now to 17,000. Candidate can self-finance up to $17,000. That was amended at Executive Standing Committee and reduced to $5,000. Okay, so this is what I meant about trying to figure out that report, because when I looked at the highlighted portions of the bylaw, and when I, so a, a candidate can finance their campaign up to what amount? I think very much uh, at, at Executive Standing Committee, uh, November the 27th, I threw uh, <clears throat> you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. Um, uh, the the uh, uh, limit was $5,900. So that's the, the self-financing limit. Self-financing? $5,900 for a candidate. And that's that beautiful. matches the uh, total uh, individual contribution that one could, uh, that could, to, could donate to a, in, uh, to a campaign. That was awesome. Um, now, on the campaign limits, so, and you would have crunched the numbers too. So if no one is actually reaching the limit, why are we increasing the limit? On the mayor's race or the candidates, council candidates? Mayor Savage, you to the councillors. So the original <coughs> dollar figures that are in this document, this bylaw, were done through a very strong public engagement campaign that occurred through 2018. We were directed after that to apply an inflation percentage to it on all the numbers, and that's what's in front of you today. This is council's bylaw, and council went through the process to determine that, and we based it off of those numbers and based off of the inflation motion that we had on it. We also did a review of this bylaw after the 2021, uh, sorry, the 2020 election, and brought that forward to council that did not have any direction to reduce those numbers or to look at those numbers at the time. That is something that we can note and we can look into future views of this bylaw after we move forward with the 2024 election due to timing. I think it's, it's hard to provide you any additional context on that at this time. Well, I've only got 25 seconds left, but I would put an amendment on there that we now amend it back to $30,000, since it wasn't a real limit then. It shouldn't, and similarly for the mayor's uh, expenditure limit, uh, I would move that uh, we leave the spending limits for expenditures for the mayor's and councillor's candidates' campaigns to the original amounts under the 2020 bylaw. Okay, so that's a motion. Seconded by Councillor Purdy, so that's the motion on the floor. 
I just want to uh, read, the reason that we came up, or I came up with 5,000 as a limit, is a federal candidate can, in fact, contribute a total of 5,000 in contributions, loans, and guarantees to their campaign. A candidate is also permitted to give an additional 1,700 to other candidates. So federally, you can give up to 5,000. Um, ours, so that's why we said 5,000. I think it's a reasonable number. Shouldn't be higher. Uh, okay, so that's the motion on the floor. The motion basically says to leave the limits as they were. That's the campaign spending limits, Councillor Cleary? Correct. The campaign expenditure limits for expenditure councillor limits. and mayor's races. I think it was 30000 and 300000 if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so just as confirmation, it's removing the inflation figures that were approached to it. Just report. from those expenditure limits, I'm fine. If you want to go from 1,000 to 1,200 and uh, what was it? Uh, what was the other one? Anyway, uh, for the mayor's contribution, I'm fine with those two. Uh, but for the, if it's not, if we're not exceeding, if no campaign has ever exceeded the expenditure limit, it makes no sense to keep increasing the expenditure limit because then it's not an actual limit. I'm yeah, done. just waiting to show the, that motion is in order on the floor. The amendment is on the floor and Councillor Kent. Thank you. Um, so I have a question around that. I understand the rationale. Uh, what I have concerns about in, and I'm hoping I can get an understanding of it for for uh, items that are, are purchase assets, they have to be declared, so they would be con included in your contribution uh, amount, right? So th those, am I right in that cap, or is it? Oh, yeah, no, it's it's like my campaign signs, for example. Um, that purchase has to be declared. And of course, I think that it has to be in accordance to what the cost would be now, which is inflationary. Um, and there may be other things that it's not just signs, other things that might be utilized. Um, and so I, I think that this is, if, if no one's ever used it, what's the harm in increasing it for the purpose of inflation? I think, I, I, just, I, I just don't see the reason not to. One of the things that we are doing is that is is we're I feel like we're always looking at it from a perspective of um, what would the public think around taxpayer money, right? This is not that. This is potentially personal money. I also I mean I'm going to speak to the to the individual um, uh, contributions as well as a candidate, but. I, I don't see why we would not apply this. You know, we, we've not applied increases to, and rightly so, and I would support it to increases for our councillor um, wages and our salaries and such, such. But at this stage, this is independent of that. This is not about that. This is not about us individually. It's about what is it going to take for a brand new candidate to come in and, 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 and create an election campaign. Just because we have not used that amount doesn't mean someone in this day and age when the cost of everything has escalated disproportionately to the past, this is the time to do that. We, otherwise, I feel like we're potentially hamstring, hamstringing the, other, other, the newer candidates that might come in. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I am just looking uh, online here to look at um, the campaign contributions over the years. And in 2012, uh, the mayor campaign exceeded $354,000. So actually has uh, in the past, and that was before we had this campaign um, bylaw, this, this um, campaign contribution bylaw. So actually, you know, to, to your point, Councillor Cleary, we, we have already seen um, over $350,000. So I, I, I just think that, um, you know, I, I, I do feel that 
<laughs> the reason that staff were asked to do this was because of the fact that there are inflationary costs for candidates um, and we uh, should be, uh, you know, I think it's a fair cap looking at that addition of the inflation. I think it's fine just the way it is. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I would normally agree with, with that, um, but if the highest campaign contribution was 20, 20,000 or 21,000, that, that would more than make up for any inflation that would have happened over the last four years. Um, and I thought the whole purpose too was to keep um, kind of even playing field so that, you know, folks with a lot more money wouldn't have a higher um, advantage. Uh, yeah, kind of keep 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 it reasonable so people and, and I know five five thousand dollars with the inflation area um, formula that was used I mean it is not over the top or anything I just thought it was reasonable we um, you don't have to win on a big budget um, just getting it there talking to people face to face is pretty powerful okay thanks thank you Councillor Cleary Thank you. Um, actually, not that I wanted to bring up the 2012 election, um, but I believe it was 354,470 and 95 cents that was raised, but I don't believe that was spent. Um, I'm not going to ask anyone, especially my former friend Jamie, to comment on that. But um, uh, the whole point behind having spending limits is to even the playing field. Because essentially, otherwise you have an American system where money is vo vote, and you can just spend bazillions of dollars. That is a real word, I think. I made that up. Um, <laughs> because money equals voice, power, the rest of it. We don't want, I don't think, I don't want that. I hope we don't want that within our system. And frankly, if you look at all of the campaigns for the last two or three elections, the average of a winning campaign was around eight or nine thousand dollars. So you don't actually have to spend an enormous amount of money. You got to work your butt off. You got to knock on doors. You got to talk to people, and you got to say the right things to the right people. That's it. It's not about money. If it was, the guy who ran in District Nine, Richard or Rundle Levins, whatever his name was, who did reach the limit on fifteen thousand, to this day, no one knows who the guy was or where he's from. He just put money in. I think he bought a bunch of ads on the radio and. That was it, uh, and had one of the lowest votes in District 7 too. Um, so we want a level playing field and we want real limits. My point is if you, if you just keep moving the post ahead of where anyone is spending, then it's not an actual limit. And uh, I don't want to see us in a place where we get, you know, we're spending four or five or six hundred thousand dollars on campaigns. Frankly, that money should be going to the folks in Grand Parade or Victoria Park or anywhere else, uh, not because you're buying more signs and, and putting more ads on the radio. Anyway, just my two cents, and I hope you vote with me, because I think if we want these to be a real limits, we should keep them limited. So I'm going to speak from here. Um, uh, so because the, my 2012 campaign has come up, I raised, a lot of it was in kind, but a lot of it was in cash donations, uh, a third of a million dollars, which seemed to me obscene which is why I campaigned so hard and so immediately to have campaign finance reform. Because you know what? I could have taken the surplus from that campaign and put it in my pocket. And I wouldn't have broken a rule. And when I bought campaign finance reform to the executive committee of this council in 2013, it passed three to two to go to council. Because there was councillors who said there's no problem. Well, how do you know if there's no problem, then what do you, why not have regulations? Uh, in 2012, I gave money back to people. I gave money back to people who gave me more money than I was comfortable taking, and we set a limit of $5,000. And I had people who wrote checks for 10000 gave it back, including to an amazing human being who had deceased in the meantime. And it was a, it was a very awkward thing. So, I, look, since then, I've spent, I don't know, you guys have the numbers more than I do, 125 and 100 or something on running for mayor. I could have, I could have spent 300000 again but I don't think it's necessary. I don't, I, don't, I don't have a problem. You can decide what you want to do on whether you index it or, or, or not. I, don't, I think, on the one hand, I look at it and I say, you know, people who run for MLA spend a lot of money and they don't represent as many people as you do. Plus, they've got the air cover off their provincial 
you know, uh, campaigns, right? <clears throat> On the other hand, if people aren't, and, and they get a rebate at the end of the election, federally and provincially. What I want is I want people to know who's giving candidates money. And I want people to know how they're spending that money. So it has to be including in kind. And I want to make sure, we had this discussion at executive, People who have the ability to write a check for themselves for $17,000 tend to be the people who have other connections who can write a check for that amount of money. So it should be a lower limit. You shouldn't be able to finance a whole campaign for, for council, in my view. So we need spending regulations. We're getting there bit by bit. Um, I'm glad with some of the rules that, uh, you know, that we have. I think, that, I think to Councillor Cleary's point, a limit should be something you have to think about. Right now, it probably isn't in most cases because you know we're going to come in under the limit. So I just, uh, I just think it's important as a council that we have rules that we have. And at the end of the day, one of the great problems is I don't think we have the same kind of enforcement of those rules. Uh, federal MPs have gone to jail for breaking campaign finance rules. You don't do it. And at the end of the 2012 campaign, when we sat down, I said to my official agent, who had been my federal efficient agent, I want everything treated as if it was a federal campaign. The money goes into a trust fund to be taken out if I run again. If not, it'll go to charity. In the end of the last election, I had $10,000 cash left. I gave half of it to Shelton, Nova Scotia, half of it to Feed, Nova Scotia. Cleared it up. If I run again, I'll go raise my money and I'll follow the rules that people have. It's not good enough to say there hasn't been a problem, because how do you know there hasn't been a problem? People need to know what's happening with money at an election campaign. And that's so, so I think the work that you guys have done has been very important. Um, I don't even know how I'll vote on this amendment, but uh, the point is let's, let's have some rules that make a difference uh, and even the playing field uh, for more people. Councillor Kent, uh, sorry, Councillor Hensby, have you spoken on this? No. Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor, and I'll say it again that I said during the executive committee is that I believe that we should be asking the province for some legislative amendments. Uh, that allow for tax receipts and I've always said that the money should be channeled through the clerk's office that if anybody wants to make a donation to my campaign they give it to the clerk's office and identify me as the candidate of their choice to have the money go towards let the clerk maintain a 10 or 15 percent administrative fee to help fund elections why should it be funding elections come out of the tax base only? Perhaps it should be come, come from the candidates' uh, fundraising capacity. And therefore, you know, I, I, I believe that writing a, a, a check to the municipality is considered a gift to the Crown, and perhaps there's an ability for tax credits or tax receipts. So I think that's something we should be looking at. I know that Toronto has tax, uh, tax, tax receipts for, for municipal campaigns. I believe they're the only municipality in the country that has. But I think that perhaps we should look at some more creative solutions uh, through through the clerk's office. That way, the clerk's office can administer uh, uh, all the donations who's collected, who who they're from, and and, and maintain uh, that kind of transparency for for make sure that all candidates are on a level playing field. They all have all funds reported through the clerk's office. So that's my opinion on the matter, sir. Okay, well, let's get a thought from the person who would be the collector of those funds. It is a pretty quick thought, Mayor Savage, through to the councillor. I believe there is a report that has been directed from Executive Standing Committee that was that came uh, from the Women's Advisory Committee specifically on this topic. So there should be something working its way through in the next little bit. Uh, just again, with our timing, October 19th, 2024 is the election. The timing would require legislative changes and, and all of those components of it. So I just want to set some expectations, but there is a motion that is directed to report that will be coming back. Thank you. Thank you again. Councillor Kent. Thank you. And again, this is on the amendment and on the, um, the cap. I, I really do think it should be indexed. And when, you, when I think about the, the people that are potentially going to run, and I actually I'm reflecting back to my own campaign. You know, it's easy to sit here and say just, just canvas. Well, this last campaign was in COVID. I was the I was the an, a previous politician, and not everybody wanted that politician at the door. Then I tore my hamstring, then I, my hips went, and so I'm thinking now about people who we want to come to the table who may have mobility issues, who may have other disabilities, uh, that do not have the capacity to go door to door in the traditional way that many of us have had the privilege of doing and have the privilege of our, uh, of of being able to walk door to door, et cetera. And I also, and the cost associated to 
uh, flyers and 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 uh, mail outs, um, advertising with the signs, advertising on radio, all those pieces. If somebody had it, and a, a colleague of mine sort of whispered in my ears, well, you can get someone, get a volunteer to walk on the doors. People don't want to see that that a volunteer, even though, and I've been doing this, and David's been doing this for years. We know the campaign drill, as does uh, Mr. Mayor. And, and there are so many factors that can affect the cost associated to running a campaign. Just because you spend money, it doesn't make you wrong to have spent it. It might just be that's what was required based on what your goals were for that campaign. It doesn't make you less or better than the other candidates that spent less or more. It just means it's a different strategy. And I think that it would be wrong for us to potentially put barriers in place for people to address the cost of doing business in a campaign. And that's what these, this indexing is about, the cost of doing that. Um, I'll speak, to, again, I'll speak to the, to the individual candidates uh, uh, contribu contribution as well left on the main amendment, a uh, main motion, but I, I think that we would be do it, be disadvantaging people. And I think about, you know, you know, women who might want to run who have childcare. Uh, childcare is not cheap anymore. Childcare is expensive, and it's hard to find. And if they're lucky, it's going to be in their community. But if they're not lucky, they may have to drive their child to another community to in order to run their campaign for a month that is potentially walking, as was suggested. So there are things that maybe we're not thinking about. Let's not disadvantage. Let's leave it open so people have the capacity. If they don't use it, so be it. But why disadvantage the candidates without indexing it? Everything else in life has been indexed. That's, I, I can't support that. Thank you. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just have a couple of issues. Um, penalties. I know there is um, wording on the various sheets that we get um, that refer to penalties. But I'm just wondering, um, after the elections are over and the sheets have been tallied, is there an actual penalty and how would that be um, the word I'm trying to say. How would that be levied against the um, councillor or potential councillor or anyone that ran in the election? And I'm also thinking that, you know, I pr appreciate um, Councillor Hensby's suggestion about the clerks, but personally, I think the clerks have enough to do and our contribution sheets have to balance. So if it's X amount or ten dollars or a hundred dollars. They should. We have to name who gave it to us. The amount. Um, I can't remember the addresses on there. But um, anyway, what I'm trying to say is our sheets should balance, and there should be no question about them. Thank you, Mayor Savage, through you to the councillor. So there is a offense provision in the bylaw in section, 20, 20, in section 22. Um, from an operational perspective, what our goal is, is to get the information publicly available and to do what we can to assist candidates wherever possible to get that information into us. So we spend, and, and this, all of these documents are managed by the election office that is in the clerk's office. So we work with candidates to try to get compliance for um, that information so we can post it publicly. If we are unable to get that compliance, we go through a escalating process, letters are sent, and then we can talk to um, the police to see if we can get people to ask about that compliance. We have not had to levy a fine. Okay. Yeah, I was just concerned um, about a certain, I ran in 2016 and then again in 16, 2020, and I would agree with um, Councillor Kent that that did um, increase my costs with masks and, and shirts and a lot of people wanted to make sure who you were coming to the door, so you had to have something on to identify yourself. But getting back to penalties, I know when I ran before, there were some 
candidates that did not write down everything they collected. Or this year, they did not write down that they, co they collected funds from a developer, for instance. And I know that was taken away in the 2020 election. So I'm just, you know, I mean, it, it just makes me wonder, you know, if penalties sh really mean anything to the people that are running. No reflection on the clerk's office at all. Thank you. Mayor Savage, through to the councillor, um, I think committing an election offence and signing a false form on election matters is a serious offence. And, and we work with candidates to make sure they're aware of the rules and they're aware of the requirements and the responsibilities for running as a municipal candidate. So for the second time offender or third time offender, I'm Mayor sorry. Savage, through to the council, we, we are limited to any additional enforcement right. um, outside of, of the provisions we have within this. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ready for the question, colleagues? This is on the amendment of Councillor Cleary. The amendment has passed, so we have an amended motion on the floor. We have somebody, I know people that want to speak on this. We're going to try to knock this off before we take a break, I think. Councillor Cuttle. Oh, uh, no, I think everything, I, I, I'm, I'm good now. It was about, yeah, fine. Councillor Kent. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, again, I'm, I'm going to come back to... Um, I, I'm, I'm confused by the report that we seem to have under the team's files, that that still to me is showing that that a uh, candidate, because we just changed the spouse piece, um, can spend 17,000. Why are we not, do, no, do we not have an, an updated report somewhere that, or was it sent out in an email? Mayor Savage, to the councillor, there would be another report in there somewhere that would have the cover report that came, there should be one that had the ex executive report. It is in the packages that were submitted. This is Case. one of our report processes that should be changing with the e agenda solution. Good thing. Um, so I'm struggling with that as well. And, and you know, again, I come from a, a, um, a place that, as much as I've had very, a lot of success with volunteers and getting a lot of volunteers, the hardest thing to do is ask for money. <laughs> for your, it seem, feels like it's for yourself, when in fact it's for the, for the community. But it is difficult, and yet they, there is, and you may have a, a district that does not have that capacity, but they really want you to be able to offer. And so having the ability to self-finance in some capacity, I think is, it's not a bad thing. Um, I understand the rationale around keeping it an, e an even playing field, but those people that might have the, I think the Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the comment about those people that have the capacity to self, self, um, fund is and would have friends that could potentially also I think that's a little that's a sum that's assuming a lot I don't think that's actually potentially the case for everyone some people may make decisions about uh, putting it on a line of credit doing whatever but knowing that it, it when things things, if they get elected, they can pay that back. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't have the opportunity to do that, to make their own decision. I feel like that's, that's what's at play here for me, is that it's, it's us making a decision for other people to make, to, to decide on their own. Obviously, as a candidate, you have to pass a certain number of criteria to get to that place. After that, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with this one in, in particular. Uh, the rest I have no issue with. I, I would be uncomfortable uh, with 
changing that particular one. I'm going to wait to hear from uh, my other councillor colleagues to see what they have to say. We'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you, councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, you know, I, I do agree, uh, Councillor Ken. I think that there's um, certainly an incumbency factor that has value that's not uh, formulated. It's not being measured in this. So uh, it's, you know, easier and it historically has been easier for incumbents to be reelected because they can do, uh, you know, the fundraising, right? So it's it's difficult um, for a newcomer just to come on and, uh, you know, have have the money in order to do, um, to run an effective campaign and, um, you know, get, get the donations that are needed. Um, and on that note, the donations, and thank you, uh, Ian, for clarifying that. So the Women's Advisory uh, Committee is actually um, the or originator of that motion to create a provincial rebate program um, and look at that budgetary framework for how the municipality could support that, then went to executive and um, looking forward to, to uh, seeing where that, um, where that goes. Uh, but I will say too that when you think about the distance uh, that, that some candidates and councillors have to drive. So for the larger districts, like District 1, District 14, District 2, 13, 11, these are really large districts where people have to have a vehicle that is reliable. Um, you know, I, I know I, I've probably said this before, at least 20,000 kilometers a year on my car, right? So it does certainly take a toll each year um, to not only to do this job, but certainly from a campaigning perspective to be able to have a, a reliable vehicle. It's not like you can you know, get an, an Uber or a taxi or find transit or something to be able to go out and campaign. Um, so I think what happens here when we drop this down to $5,000 per um, candidate is, you know, you, I think honestly what this does is it, um, it, it gives uh, an, an, uh, an advantage to the incumbent um, by uh, restricting what it is that uh, a newcomer could actually um, uh, contribute to their own campaign. So that's just that's just my perspective. Thank you. Well, I, I know federally that in the campaign there are certain expenses which are not reportable, uh, and transportation is one of them. <clears throat> so there are candidates in large ridings who rack up thousands of dollars in expenses in transportation that don't have to declare them as an election expense. That's probably something we should look at here as well uh, as a consideration. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would also mention that. There are a lot of things that the encumbrant does not have to look at as far as expenses. They may have a lot of their um, past signs. They can just stick re-elect on it. Um, they don't have to pay for the initial amount that the signs cost. You know, you're talking about your pieces of wood. All of that uh, an encumbrant might still have, and if they're thinking of rerunning, they, they probably do. Uh, little things like that, that you might not put a dollar value on it, but if you're the first time running in an election, they add up to. Yeah, so anyway, I just wanted to throw that in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have, uh, did the amendment pass? The amendment passed. We have an amended motion on the floor. Ready for the question. So that is carried. Thank you. Uh, um, okay. I guess we'll call it there for now. We're going to. We're not going to be. We've got a number of things left to do. We're not going to finish them before supper. So we will take a break. We'll come back with our public hearing. No, there's no public hearing. We'll come back here at uh, six o'clock and uh, continue our council meeting. Thank you.
Are we good to go, John? Uh, Ian? We're good? Okay, all right. Um, okay, we're going to 15.4.1. Coming out of transportation, colleagues, this is the active school travel plan. It was on consent, it was taken off. I can't remember. Councillor Cuddle. Uh, me, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Um, not that I intend uh, to have a big debate about this, um, just a small request. I'll start by putting the motion on the table that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to initiate a Halifax Regional Municipality-led program to facilitate active and safe transportation for school-based trips. That includes one, assessment of all schools in HRM by an external consultant to establish a list of schools sorted by priority where active school transit is most feasible and beneficial and that recommends safer school travel routes and priority infrastructure improvements. Two, establishing a collaborative program between the HRM, the Halifax Regional Centre for Education, Conseil Solaire, Scolaire, Acadien Provincial, and sector stakeholders, service providers to develop and deliver an active school travel education and promotion program, and three, funding to be considered as part of the 2025-26 budget process. Second. <laughs> Morse. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Morse, for seconding that. Um, so the reason I pulled this off consent is I got some correspondence from um, some of the people who have been involved in the round table that has been discussing um, active school transit. They held a number of workshops last year and it included people from Halifax Regional Police, from the school, uh, HRCE, from community groups and organizations, from um, active transit. Um, advocates, um, and a number of HRM staff were there, and kind of the magic of that whole thing was that it brought together multi-sector stakeholders to have really good conversations about what will make an active school travel program a success. Like, how do we really all work together because we all have a role to play in, in delivering a program like this. And I got a request, um, from from a group that has a meeting with uh, with our Lucas Pitts on December 14th, and they had some questions um, about this approach in terms of how it aligns with the outcomes of the roundtables and how it addresses um, some parts of the original motion, including the development and adoption of active school travel policy and action plan. So they're having this meeting with Lucas on Thursday, and uh, they requested that, um, you know, perhaps this be deferred until the next council meeting so that they have a chance to meet with Lucas and provide some input um, into the approach and get clarity on some of these issues. And in this case, um, I'm, inclined, I'm inclined to support this request because it has been such a collaborative process. And I think that we need to kind of honor the origins of this and also honor the, you know, the collaborative spirit that didn't just go into coming up with this concept, but is actually critical and necessary for successfully implementing it. So um, I just ask that uh, we defer this until December, until the next council meeting in, in January. Yes, I put that. Okay. Motion for deferral, seconded by Councillor Purdy. I do see we've got some company. Did you wish to speak to that? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, through the Mayor to the Councillors, uh, Lucas Pitts, Director of Traffic Management. Um, yes, I have a meeting coming up with one specific group. Um, we have met with the others. Uh, there's nothing in the report that um, makes us, there's nothing said in this report. There's what we wanted to do is get the part of getting the safe school travel routes down, the infrastructure requirements, getting all that in motion. The second part of the report in terms of the collaboration is wide open. 
Uh, there is nothing set out in this report that limits who we collaborate with or when or why. Um, so we will grow as a, as a collaborative effort with all of our partners and that is the intent, so. So Lucas, you're saying that, <clears throat> that deferring this would not uh, change the fact that you can listen and, and garner input and add it to the plan? Yes, correct. We, we, we make no outline in, in the actual report of what that collaborative, collaborative effort is gonna look like and so our intent is to reach out to as many groups as possible and we'll frame up the discussion around what the active school travel program looks like. Um, it's part of obviously the 25-26 budget uh, as part of the, as, par, as per the motion. Um, so we'll be back in front of council in terms of funding that collaborative effort and the education piece. Um, but right now we've allocated the money for as part of that budget uh, for the actual infrastructure and um, piece in, in, in getting the consultant to work on it. Councilor Cuddle. Um, okay, so that's 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 good to know. So, in terms of the outcomes of the program, we haven't really defined the outcomes of a whole, and there's still opportunity to shape that through discussion with our stakeholder groups. Correct. Okay. Well, knowing that, then um, I'm happy to actually rescind my deferral and request that we pass the motion as it is and get on with this important work. So the motion to defer is being proposed to be withdrawn. Who seconded it? Uh, uh, Councillor Purdy, you okay with that? Okay, so that motion is uh, to uh, Councillor uh, Hensby. I'm hearing your name called, Lucas. Uh, Councillor Hensby. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, a couple things. In the report talks about the College Action Center has been talking with the school board and identified eight schools. Do we know what eight schools they are? Because I don't see nothing in the report listing them. And second of all, I have a question about the rural schools. Uh, Sheet Harbor, I have no problem except for I need a crosswalk at the uh, highway number seven and, and uh, Pool Road where we have the sidewalks converged there. But the, pro the province has de denied us a crosswalk, but we need to ask them again. But uh, with the Musket Albert Harbor, we had the situation with the Eastern Shore District High School. When they get out of, out of recess or lunchtime, they spill out on the highway going to the village core to the, to the village, uh, to the pizza shop or to the coffee shop, what the case may be. But uh, so I want to know, is this active, trans this active school, safe school travel, is it just from home to school or is it around the school during recess breaks, lunch breaks, or after school because the kids be going anywhere? So. I want to know in regards to what's the, what's the philosophy behind this is just from the neighborhoods to the local school itself and just getting kids walking from home to school and back or allowing for extra curricular activities uh, during recess and lunch hour. Also, uh, the, uh, the Gatesbrook uh, Greenway Trail was built on the predic pred predicated on the Connect 2 program of having the old rails to trails open up to provide access, safer uh, pedestrian access for kids going to the Gatesbrook Junior High School. Now, the new high school being, the new joint junior high high school being built in East Chesapeake Industrial Park, that case book school is probably going to be made available for other purposes or perhaps it may be temporarily used by the French school board. Question is, um, in the report talks about e-scooters and things like that, but the, the problem is the letter of authority for the great case book trail doesn't allow any motorized use. So, so I don't know how we want to get around those things. And plus we have the, uh, the rails to trails behind the Portage Lake School that connects the Portage Lake Elementary uh, to the shopping center area as well as the French School across the street. Another prime opportunity in rural areas. So I want to know in regards to this, this discussion, are there going to be any rural schools being looked at? Because in this report, I don't see nothing there. Through the mayor to the councillor. Um, so on the EAC, I don't know the eight schools. They, they were the original um, people that sort of took on the process of active school transportation and they started the work. I think they ended the work in 2017, if I remember correctly, so they haven't been involved in a long time. Uh, a lot of staff turnover there. Um, on the, the, the work around rural schools, yes, it will include rural schools. Um, the intent is to, and this is a part, the important part of the consultant work because right now we're very reactive based. We, we sort of make our decisions when the complaints come in, but the, the consultant work would look at each individual school, look where the kids are going, and figure out you know, how many, what time of day, 
where they're going and how best to protect those routes. Um, so certainly if there's, you know, I don't know, for example, a community center that everybody goes to uh, after school, that would be part of the consideration. Um, and that would include at all the rural schools as well. And third on the, on the trail network, I think again, as part of, we're not there to make a decision on those things, but as part of getting the work done by the consultants, we will have the knowledge and the data to make better decisions around those things. So when the time comes that, you know, this trail, which doesn't allow motorized vehicles, would be a great opportunity for e-scooters and stuff like that, then we would bring it back to council to make a decision around something like that. So, uh, but at this time, nothing's set in stone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Pitts. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. That motion carries, thank you. The next item is Halifax Transit Safety Program taken off consent. Was that Councillor Mancini? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'll put the following motion on the floor. The Halifax Regional Council direct Chief Administrative Officer to draft a plan for a Halifax Transit Safety Program for further consideration. So moved. Thank you. Uh, and no, Councilor Cleary, I do not have an amendment, but I do have some clarification and I do have some questions. But, uh, uh, you know, first of all, colleagues, at home, um, Mayor Savage, last council meeting, you did acknowledge the passing of Shane O'Leary, the ATU president, and I like to acknowledge that also. You know, Shane and I definitely didn't see eye to eye on most things, uh, and, uh, uh, but the one thing I do respect that Shane had and we did have in common, as many of us do around these chambers, is the protection and the safety of our operators and our riders. And so this motion is we've been working on, there's been a number of phases of this motion, and we've done a lot for how, when it comes to safety for our riders and, and our operators. You know, we've, uh, during the pandemic, uh, spent over $3 million uh, for driver safety protection. Now all new buses are coming with that, including our electric buses. The transit code is in place. Uh, the approval to hire service supervisors, three su supervisors. My first question is, can you give us an update on those three uh, supervisors, Phil, when you uh, get a chance when you come to the mic? We've now approved the bylaw. The next step was to be these safety officers or these peace officers. Uh, however, now we've got this motion in front of us, so I, I just want to understand, you know, this safety program that's being asked for us to approve, uh, if I understand it correctly, it's to create the program that the, the peace officers would work under. It's uh, looking at hiring some staff, and some of that staff will be just temporary staff. It's looking for that budget piece, develop the program, come back to council, get that approval, and then hire the, uh, the peace officers. So my, my other question is, you know, you know, what's the length of time once we see this a program come back or approval to go forward on it, the length of time from the work on creating the program and actually hiring the peace officers? So I'm looking for that explanation. I wonder if you could come forward and, and give us that. Because my concern is, uh, the issues with safety and transit is not only Halifax transit, it's across the country, in, fra in fact, in North America, in fact, around the world when it comes to transit. We still have the daily issues of safety out there when it comes to buses and transit. And so there's going to be a gap before we get to these peace officers and how we're going to handle that. So uh, I think, Phil, if you wouldn't mind coming forward. First question was an update on the three service supervisors. Are they hired and what are they doing if they are hired? And then if you could talk about confirming I'm accurate and what you're trying to do with the safety program and what about the gap and length of time until the peace officers are hired. And I do apologize, gentlemen, for taking us off the consent agenda and making you guys come here after supper. Uh, my apologies for that. All right, I see Philip Parrott. Uh, good evening, Not sir. Accepted. Good evening. Um, through the, the mayor to the councillor. Uh, in regards to the supervisors, they're, they're hired. They're actually um, going through their training now um, for the specifics we're looking for, um, which is very similar to the mobile supervisors, uh, just more focused on the terminal. So they're not in a car, they're actually be stationed at 
uh, the Dartmouth Bridge Terminal, uh, and then a combination of Lacewood Terminal. Are they and riding the buses yet, sorry? Are they doing that? No, they're no. just in their training now Okay. Um, to ensure they understand uh, what we're looking for, making sure they understand a large part of this will be the customer service piece and the service reliability piece, so what point duty is, what those interactions with the customers are going to be, the passengers, and, uh, and what we're looking for as far as building those community relationships in hopes of um, you know, addressing some of the incidents by, by again, just being there, being available and, and supportive across, you know, to staff, to the public and, and to the citizens in those communities um, specifically. Um, you are correct. The intent of, of this motion, this report, was to, to uh, get council's approval on building the safety program. Uh, within this report, there are a couple of staff in there, uh, two of them permanent uh, law, uh, for, for ongoing uh, pieces, one business analyst and a, and a coordinator to look at, um, looking at further analytics on, on the type of incidents we're having, where they're happening, uh, how to report on them, where we're seeing reductions and changes in those behavior. Uh, then another position tied to the administrative pieces of it, which will include, um, you know, as we start to see different pieces come in under the bylaw, uh, any appeals, any things like that, so we're tracking there. And then the temporary position uh, as a program manager to actually build out the program, uh, working through public engagement, community engagement, stakeholder engagement, uh, to make sure that we're, we're really connecting with the public and our ridership and our staff on, on what they're looking for, uh, and the ability to uh, do some industry scans and stuff as well to see what other transit agencies are doing across the country to, to combat some of the same things. Calgary Transit just recently came out with their overall safety plan. Uh, Winnipeg, City of Winnipeg and Winnipeg Transit uh, actually have a posting up right now for 25 peace officers and some administrative staff to, uh, to look at how they're going to handle um, their pieces. Uh, you know, from there, our, our plan right now is, is to continue with the additional service supervisors we have continue providing them uh, additional training. They've just recently uh, completed verbal judo, uh, which is a de-escalation training um, that's used by police forces across the country and, and uh, things like that. Um, and again, working on defining what those are and, and further um, breaking down the analytics of our numbers. Um, we really started tracking differently in May of this year how we're capturing those numbers, how we're breaking it down, how we're looking at it to help build that program out. And sorry, just Thank you. I'll ask you to come back if okay. you have more yep. questions, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Hensby. You didn't answer all my questions. Okay. Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Just out of curiosity, uh, who reports an incident on the bus? Is it the driver or is it a third party or one? I don't suppose one of the persons involved as uh, the aggressor is going to report on himself, but perhaps as a victim. But I'm just kind of curious of these numbers coming in, who actually is given the incident information? Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, a majority of our incidents are reported uh, from the operator to our uh, control center. Uh, there are additional incidents that are reported by passengers uh, through 311, through 911 uh, policing agencies, uh, depending on the, the severity and the timeliness of the, of the, um, the incident. I, I would agree with you that I don't think the aggressors are calling in on themselves. Um, yeah. Now with the introduction of surveillance cameras on the bus and around the terminals. I would assume that we've had some success on property damage matters and stuff. I see, it looks like on the graph you show us some of the assaults have cutting half on property property, but the assaults on the buses, uh, physical assault, well, verbal assaults down, but physical assaults seem rather consistent. So has there been any noticeable detail or a decrease from surveillance cameras being on site? I'm just kind of curious if that's been successful or not, or, or is it just helping us with insurance claims? Uh, through the mayor to the council, the cameras have been in place for a long time. Um, the recent, uh, over the say the last four to five years, increase in assaults, uh, verbal assaults, um, you know, have steadily increased, although the cameras are in place. Uh, originally, they were a good part of a deterrent when put in, I don't remember the exact date, probably early uh, 2010, 2012. Um, and that we did see some reductions at that time, but the, the numbers we're talking about here today um, and the increased assaults, that 3,000 number, are with the cameras in place and with other security measures in place, we're still seeing an increase across the board of, of um, escalated incidents. And what these incidents, could, I, could you make an assumption of how many might be youth involved or some people with 
mental health issues, or I'm just kind of curious if you have any um, any kind of description of what type of individuals are causing these type of incidents. Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, um, our numbers and our tracking of that is getting better. Again, we've really started capturing uh, more data, more precise data starting in May this year, but it, it is early into that for us. And I would say that uh, any incidents involving policing, uh, HRP, RCMP would be better to answer as to the demographics of what they may be where charges are laid. Um, but I would say, uh, you know, from a transit perspective, we are seeing a fair amount of, of incidents and, and conversations uh, with youth. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so let's assume, Phil, that the motion today gets, is passed. You folks come back with, here's the budget and here's what we're looking for. I assume that will have an impact on the 24-25 budget. Uh, and then you go do the work and you come back and what's the length of time for when you have that safety program developed and then we actually hire peace officers? Do you have a sense of what that potential may be? Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, I think in our overall timeline, we talk about that 20 month timeline for development of program uh, and then looking at, you know, where uh, we would actually get to the point of hiring. I think the, the one thing that's maybe missing out of that calculation uh, is the time to come back for uh, the report to council and, and budget request. Um, but I think the development of the program, you know, can happen in that honestly in that, that 12 to 16 month time frame. Um, again, you know, based on um, stakeholder engagement, public engagement, uh, things like that, working with our partners um, in, in human resources to set up the position descriptions, uh, relying again on other transit agencies across the country, um, and, okay. uh, and meeting that kind of 20 to 24 month time just, frame with budget. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm gonna run out of time, so I, yep. so, sorry Phil, thank you. Uh, that, so I, I support what's here, that's a concern though, the 20 months, right? because it's 20, 25 months before we get uh, those peace officers that we all desperately want to see in, in place. And so I'm hoping that it doesn't take that long. You alluded earlier to, you know, the other uh, Calgary and Winnipeg are, are already uh, implementing their safety programs. That has to be somewhat helpful in reducing the, the length of time to create this program. Obviously, you have to do the community engagement as you, you know. so that's, that's a concerning piece, is how do we make sure during this gap you know, we still have these incidents ha happening. The, you know, hopefully the three, um, uh, you know, safe, the, the three uh, service of, uh, sur supervisor is gonna help reduce that, but th that's still a concern, right? And we, we, unfortunately, we continue to hear about that. So how do we, how do we address things during that gap of time? Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, absolutely our, our intention, um, you know, will be incremental changes in our operation as we go forward, uh, continuing to work on those community relationships and the relationships with our partners in, in Halifax Regional Police and RCMP um, as a responding partner. Um, with the service supervisors at the terminals, you know, we're expecting a different level uh, from the security guards that we also have there um, in that community engagement and helping, you know, build those relationships to reduce those numbers. You know, I think um, initially we, we are, we expect to see an increase in the number of incidents because we're gonna be reporting more, right. but with our intent uh, on the severity of those in incidents uh, actually decreasing. Okay, thank you for your work on this and I support the motion on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. That motion carries, thank you very much. <laughs> colleagues, the next item passed on consent, that's the Student Transit Pass Program. I thank the folks from Halifax Transit. Wish you a Merry Christmas. Uh, Heritage Advisory, this one's a little bit uh, different, uh, colleagues. This is case 20218, amendments to the Regional Centre, Secondary Municipal Planning Strategy and Associated Development Agreement for Lands at Roby Street, Spring Garden Road and Carlton. Now this is a joint meeting, so... Pardon me? Well, members of Council, we will now uh, do this. It is a joint meeting with Halifax and West Community Council. Having a joint meeting is permitted by recent changes to the HRM Charter from Bill 137 for the purposes of allowing for concurrent decisions. 
The order of events, we start with a member of council putting part one of the motion on the floor. We have our debate and our vote. Staff are present to respond. After the vote on part one, I ask that a member of HWCC read part two of the motion and then those members of community council, of that community council, will vote by hand. Clear? John, did I get it right? You got it. All right. So I'm going to ask for a member of council to put part one of the motion on the floor. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 give first reading to consider the proposed amendments to the Regional Centre Secondary Municipal Planning Strategy as set out in attachment A of the staff report dated October 18th, 2023 to broaden the scope of enabling policies IM43, IM44 and IM46 and schedule a public hearing. Second by Councillor Cleary. Councillor Mason, anything on it? Uh, very briefly, uh, th uh, glad to see this here uh, to get this started. This is uh, first reading. I just wanted to provide a little bit of framing as we're going to a public hearing that this is not a decision about whether or not to allow tall buildings on this site because the underlying zoning in the regional uh, centre land use bylaw allows two 30-storey towers. This is about allowing some amendments to the enabling policy from before the center plan that allows these to go by development agreement that also protects the heritage. Uh, and in that process, uh, some uh, changes were requested. So this is basically an appeal that will probably fall on deaf ears of some people to the public that we focus on what's before us, understanding that this is not a uh, relitigation of whether or not we should have 30 story towers there. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Mason. Um, is there uh, any other discussion? Councillor Cuttle? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the question here um, is about, I'm, I'm guessing it's about the, um, the heritage piece and that we know that the community benefit is to protect and restore a number of the heritage buildings along Carlton Street. And I think there's some concern around how that's being done and if the value of what we're getting from the, the preservation of those heritage buildings is equal to the amount of what, we're, what the developer is asking in, in those changes to be made, which from what I understand actually in, increase the overall volume of the building. So I don't know if there's someone here who can who can speak to Luke Willett. the changes that are being requested and the impact those changes will have on the heritage component as it is now. So Luke Willett, uh, principal planner with the Plan Growth team. Currently under the enabling policy that allows the agreement, um, it's to be done in, with the entire land holdings that also includes the, the registered properties. So what would happen in an incentive or bonus zoning scheme is 90% of the bonus zoning can be reinvested in the four properties and that's what's being proposed. Now, the amendments are before council to amend the MPS would actually increase the allowable floor area of those buildings so you would actually have more money to be reinvested in the properties because by increasing the floor area you're also increasing the incentive or bonus zoning um, envelope of money that you can reinvest into the heritage properties. Do we have an indication of how much that is? Well, it's going to be based on the formula that's already in the land use bylaws. So it's a square footage charge uh, ending over 2,000 square meters. It's multiplied by by um, by the charge, and that's what would be invested. I haven't done the calculation myself. Um, it would be based at the time of the permit being applied for. So typically, there is uh, inflation uh, calculation that kind of goes into the rate and that might have been on hold uh, with the recent amendments from the province. I haven't really put much thought into it, but um, it will have a, an impact on the amount of money that will be invested in the property by increasing the floor area. 
And by increasing the floor area, um, is that also narrowing the distance between the towers? And is that allowable under the current center plan rules, the distance between the towers? No, and that's why the amendment is before council. So typically there's, um, Balconies can encroach by up to two meters. And I'm trying to think there's another item that can encroach um, between towers. What they've asked is for the, um, the architectural projection to also be allowed to project two meters into the tower separation distance. So if you add the two towers, that's four meters in total, that'd be reduced. And what is an art an artificial projection? Is that what you call Sorry, it? Sorry, an articulated what? what was architectural that? projection. So it's basically um, it's shown in in the report. So it's these kind of glass areas that are project projecting into uh, the tower separation distance. There are actually what we would consider floor area because uh, you can walk into the area and they extend the full uh, height of the units. Right, so essentially we're permitting more floor area for these towers. I mean, it seems to me that this project just keeps coming back and they just keep asking for more and more and more. I'm trying to figure out why would we be permitting more floor area out of something called like glass projections? Like why would we be considering this? Yeah, so we, we did discuss this at the initiation report. What happened at the time is in 2021, June of 2021, they had a proposal before staff. At the time, the enabling policy was in the Halifax MPS. Halifax MPS, as well as the Peninsula Land Use Bylaw, did not define a lot of these elements. So at the time, the, the planners that were dealing with it said, we can deal with that through the agreement because we can define the agreement, what we mean. Four or five months later, it was decided to pull those policy set into the, the package B of the regional center plan and land use bylaw. The problem is in those documents, everything is very much defined, like what, what's calculated into floor area and whatnot. So that flexibility had disappeared, but no one, because there was two different groups of planner handling the file. There was planners handling the application, there was planners handling the regional center, MPS, and land use bylaw, the drafting work, and the connection was made that the June 2021 proposal did not meet the new policies in the regional center plan and, and land use bylaw because of everything being predefined. All right, I don't know how much time, I don't think I have, oh, I still have some time. You're into your second three minutes. Uh, two and a half what, minutes left in three minutes. Is that what happened? Okay, I was like, wow, that was short. So, uh, so I'm trying to, okay, so I mean, there's all these planners handling this case. It's coming here to us, council. Well, we're support, supposed to sort all this out. It's already not meeting the center plan rules, and we're allowing further encroachment into the tower separation. I'm having a hard time figuring out why I would support this. So the change that we're proposing, they would meet the MPS if accepted by council. The enabling policy um, that is currently a part of the regional center MPS predefines the FAR at eight and doesn't give allowance to go into the tower separation distance beyond the allowable things already under the bylaw. So those are additional things. The current policy is a policy set that's adopted by council. Um, so I wouldn't say that it doesn't meet the, the regional center because it is part of the regional center. What's being proposed is an amendment to those enabling policies to allow the June 2021 proposal. Thank you. I think my inclination is, is to say no, that the tower separation is important, that we have plans and we have you know, rules in place for a reason. Um, and that, you know, in this case where, you know, we keep coming back and having changes, that, that, that there's no value add 
to the city for this, and I, I, I don't see the benefit to the apartment buildings, uh, to these towers either by decreasing the separation between the towers. We already have four towers on this block. This isn't just one tower that we're looking at. We need to remember that this is a whole city block that has four towers that are 27 to 30 stories each, that decreasing the width between the towers um, I, I, I don't believe would be good, good planning. Like I, it's already bad, so I don't see how this makes things any better. So I will not be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think where Councillor Cuddle is is maybe getting a little confused is this was never approved under center plan in the first place. So when, as I recall, we started this journey back in 2017. And uh, this came before council several times. And um, if, I, if my memory serves, we gave final approval just before center plan was approved. Because this, this and the other one, we tried to make the, them fit as close as possible to the center plan. Uh, and even at the time, I think there was, we approved actually, because I think it was 25 meter tower separation. And even at the time, I think it was 23 meter if I'm not mistaken, uh, because of the, the site and the way we're doing it, plus the heritage. So if this was a clean site, uh, you could easily just come onto it, have your tower separation, but it's because they're saving the heritage that essentially you're just pushing one tower a little bit closer to the other, otherwise you'd have to knock down all those buildings in order to do that. And so what we're doing here is taking something we've already approved and saying, it was close to center plan when we approved it. Now we've got this embedded in center plan because we did this with a few sites. We basically said, look, we're gonna take those and we're gonna jam them in and say, what we did today is now part of the center plan. That's part of the new land use bylaw that we have in there. Um, and so we're really, I mean, if you look at policies IM 43, 44, and 46, uh, as it says here, we're just broadening the scope. We're not changing them dramatically. We're not saying, let's throw at the baby with the bathwater. We're saying, you know, when we did this, and, and actually we're gonna do this a few more times, uh, I think over the next few years, we were incredibly prescriptive in the language we used in the MPS, uh, in the SMPS and in the uh, land use bylaw. And now that things are starting to catch up, the development to where we're going, because there's a lag, um, we're looking at it now going, oh, you know what, when we did that, it was close, because we said it was close, it wasn't exactly center plan. Now, we'd actually be going against our current rules because they were so prescriptive. If we broaden them a little bit, it fits. And the benefit, and it would be great if, if anyone had a back of the napkin calculation for what the increased, by going with a bigger floor plate, getting more square footage, what the extra density bonus is, um, to add on top of that, not that it would matter to a lot of people. Um, but we're getting more public benefit and that public benefit is going into something that people claim they like, which is the heritage of our city, and making that better. And so I, th I think we're at a point here, we've already, like to Councilor Mason's point earlier, we've already approved this. What we're saying now is we just need a little bit of fudge factor for some of this stuff to make sure it fits what we already approved to go ahead. And the extra benefit is more money going into rehab for the heritage. I don't know if you have any comments on that. It wasn't, it wasn't a question per se. I thought there was something I wanted to add to that, but uh, I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> well said. Uh, ready for the question, colleagues? Okay, that is carried. Now, it gets a little trickier. Now I'm gonna ask for a member of Halifax and West Community Council to move part two. The motion must be seconded by a member of HWCC. Following the debate, that vote will be done by hand from members of the Community Council only. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax and West Community Council give notice of motion to consider the proposed development agreement as set out in attachment B of the staff report dated October 18th, 2023, to rent a 30 story mixed use residential and commercial building on the southeast corner of Robian Spring Garden Road intersection while rehab 
rehabilitating for municipally registered heritage buildings on Carlton Street. The public hearing for the development agreement shall be held concurrently with that indicated in recommendation one. Second, Councillor Cleary, Councillor Mason. Nothing on it, I think we already had the conversation. Question. Anybody from Halifax West on this? Halifax and West? Okay. Halifax and West Community Council, right? Okay. All those in favor? Those opposed? It's four to two, that is passed. So is that the end of this motion? So we're moving on to the next item on the agenda. Okay. Thank you all for that. I don't think I've done something like that in a while. 15.6.1, um, Deputy Mayor Daigle Gammon Council Compensation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Move that the Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a staff report to amend Section 2CA of Administrative Order 17, effective November 1, 2023, to add three, the annual increase in remuneration paid to a member shall not exceed the increase in the average industrial weekly earnings for all industries excluding unclassified businesses for Canada as reported by Stats Canada for the same period and shall not exceed 4%. Second, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Um, thank you for your indulgence, colleagues, while we have this discussion. Um, when the compensation came through to us and the 8.4% was there, um, I found that concerning. In 2017, when the formula was designed, um, a good formula, but it was without a cap. And I don't think anyone at the time would have thought that Nova Scotia would increase the national average. So I present this as a starting point um, and see where the conversation takes us to. I do recall a comment that this should have been brought forward before that was done, but we didn't know the 8.4% at that time. And that came through afterwards, and so um, that's why the timing of this motion is as it is. So I look forward to the conversation and probably this motion evolving. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just uh, two questions. Um, you know, this isn't amending the formula. This is asking for a staff report on it, which if that goes the route of staff report request, that's what the motion says, is to provide a staff report to amend the sections. Um, so does that mean like, <laughs> to be totally crass, <laughs> we change this, but we're gonna get paid for several months, potentially at a higher rate than we have to set aside or reimburse? Like what's the practicality of this? Uh, John? Mr. Mayor, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, through you for council. So the, 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 Mayor, or sorry, council compensation is set in an administrative order. So we would have to, if if this is council's wish, we'll have to draft amendments to the administrative order. So that's that's why it's it's phrased as a as a request for a for a report. So we would come back at the next meeting with the amendment okay. drafted uh, and take it from there. Not si not six months to a year report. Next meeting. No, this would be okay, available next. It's already dry. It's a matter of of putting together the amendment of the administrative order. Okay. Uh, well, that actually affects what I was going to do with this instead, because uh, you know I'm fine with this, colleagues. But I will just say the idea that we have a formula and that we're arm's length from any of this um, after seven years, I have to say, is a complete and utter nonsense. I think every single year I've talked about my salary, except for maybe once. It's every year it's been we're either tinkering with it directly or we're saying the formula is not working. We need to change the formula. It has never ever been arm's length since I've been here. Um, I frankly the the part that it's it's uh, you know the public um, not everyone in the public that's that's the biggest challenge out there right you know some folks did see their wages go up because that's what that's what the data shows uh, but not everybody did and the piece that for me I why I'm happy with this is more so actually I think we should be linking these to our unions um, and the reason I think we should do that is uh, it's even harder to turn around and say 
Well, I, you know, my, my salary is going to be 8 9%, and I'm negotiating with all you folks who work for us and do all this essential work for the municipality, and you're going to get, you know, somewhere between 2 and 4. And I find that way more on, on tenable than, you know, basing it on the StatsCan um, data. So, you know, frankly, I mean, given that this is a request for a staff report, but not really a staff report, it's more of an amendment, um, you know, I'll, I'll take it away and form it up, but I, th I think we should, if we're, if we're gonna do this, <laughs> let's, let's tie it to, uh, to what, the, what the rest of the people in this municipality make. Thank you. So just, just a clarification. I, so there is no way that we can just put this on hold until we sort out the amount, correct? No, not at this, not at this point. It's in the administrative order. Until that is changed by council, it's, it's as set by the administrative order. But we can do repayment spread out over the, re the rest of the year. Uh, thank you, John. Councillor, uh, we can spread it out over the rest of our life. Uh, Councillor Cleary? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so to Councillor Austin's point, the, you know, the staff report thing, uh, I believe, because uh, I froze our wages, or well, we froze our wages, I brought the motion forward, and I basically, my motion said, direct the CAO to go and make the uh, changes to the administrative order and bring them back. A, st a staff report is an awkward sort of wording on this because um, it's not like we're getting your advice and assessment on it, we're telling you to cap our salary. And I think it's actually been uh, five out of the seven years uh, I've been on council, or some of us have been on council, that we've talked about our wages. And the folks in the uh, legislature down the road talk about it every year too when they freeze it, um, which is also untenable. So it is a good formula. And no one complained when our wages went up by, what was it, 1.6% that one year, and, you know, and then we froze them for two years, and I forget what it was in that first year, it wasn't very much. Um, it could have been, I think it was 6 or 7% that we were looking at that first year of COVID when the earlier numbers came in, which is why I brought the motion that summer uh, to freeze them, because that's the position I didn't want to be in was COVID's coming, and all of a sudden, boom, we're getting this huge raise and everyone's staying at home and collecting their CERB. That would have been really awkward. Uh, and then we did it again the next year because we had still had no idea COVID was still, you know, uncertain. Um, I don't mind talking about our wages. They're public. Everyone knows what they are. They just go onto our website. They know what we make. Um, you know, thankfully not yet. Someday we probably will be, but we're not on the sunshine list, so we're not there with all the fire folks and the police and whatnot uh, and, our, and our illustrious senior management. Uh, and so... Uh, Everyone's always going to debate how much we make, how big increases or little increases we get, uh, which is why the provincial government has frozen MLA salaries for a, over a decade now, because uh, they don't want to have the discussion. And I think party politics plays into that too. We can have a reasonable discussion around here. I'm fine if someday, because I remember it was Steve Craig who did the whole thing back with the uh, salary with, just before I got on council. And then it came back to us and man, the guy who used to sit next to me from District 10 here did not like it uh, every time. Be careful what you wish for. And so uh, I think it's reasonable to have that discussion and I think our residents are okay with having the discussion and I'm having uh, uh, an okay time thinking about having that discussion. I think there's pros and cons to uh, having it tied to the unions that we uh, provide uh, an envelope to, but sometimes it's arbitrated, and then that's out of our control as well. So I don't know, there's no, there's no perfect way. There's just less bad ways. And I think the formula we have now with a cap is actually a pretty good way. You could debate on how big the cap could be, but to the point about how we're gonna repay this, it's still an increase of 4%. So even if we get some in the next couple of pays, by the time this comes back, you're not repaying anything, you're just getting no or less increase for the remainder of the 26 pay periods. It's, it's a non-issue, so let's cap it, let's move on, I'm fine with it. Councillor Hensby. <laughs> still, had a hundred, still had a minute and 45 left. Well, Mr. Mayor, being the longest serving councillor around this table, I've gone through this debate more often than, than we should. Uh, when I was in MLA under the John Hamm government, we froze our wages until we had a balanced budget. And in the third, third year of that term, we were able to su su successfully do that. So I think the MLA's down in the province house 
perhaps need a, a bonus or perhaps won't get their salary increases adjustment until they do get balanced budgets and stuff. So uh, that's probably what's holding them back. But here we have balanced budgets every year. And if we have any surplus or any deficits, we have to carry it forward, but we haven't had that luxury in all the times I've been here. But I've always felt that uh, our council wages should be frozen for the term. We, as this, ter as this council goes out, we should be setting the salary for the upcoming uh, council. And that amount be frozen until the last year, and then they'll decide what the, what the remuneration should be for the up next council. Uh, therefore, the, the electorate knows exactly when those go into the polls what their pay is going to be and see if they're worth it or not. So I, I, I'll, I'll accept this motion we have before us now, but I still believe that we should be looking at setting it, capping it, leaving it for the term, and then adjust it at the end of the term for the next council. Thank you, Councillor Lovely. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to our Deputy Mayor for bringing this forward. I know that uh, there's been some conversation in the community, uh, obviously, about why is it that councillors are setting their own wages, how does this work, um, you know, don't you get a raise every year, uh, and just, it, it's true, in uh, 2020 and 2021, there, there were no raises, it was frozen. I think that was Councillor uh, Cleary that put that forward, and then there was a 3.6% uh, in 2023, I guess, uh, and now moving forward, uh, you know, it seems to me first we were looking at the Canadian average and then we were looking at the Nova Scotian average and now we're looking at the Canadian average and, you know, it, this will continue to evolve uh, depending on which council is here. I, I disagree with um, setting uh, wages for a future council. Uh, I think that council should have uh, the, the responsibility um, and the right under the administrative order to do as they choose to change that administrative order as this council is doing right now. Um, and I don't think that it's a fair comparison at all with MLAs who have offices in their writings. They have staff full-time staff. That would be amazing to have full-time staff. I would love that, but we don't have that. Um, you know, they have office uh, money that they, um, you know, have in, in their in their local areas, uh, local writing as far as how they um, set up their office and, and, and buy furniture and so on and so forth. So I think it's really, really different um, in the way that uh, MLAs, plus they have smaller uh, writings, a lot fewer, um, you know, constituents that they're, that they're um, uh, working with. So anyway, I guess my, my point is that I appreciate having a cap on this, and I think that um, it's important also to recognize that there are people in this room that took this job and accepted a pay decrease. Um, and knowing that people uh, out there who are considering putting their name on the ballot uh, to take on this, you know, job with at times is 50 to 60 hours a week with, you know, uh, an administrative assistant that's maybe 12 to 15 hours a week if you're lucky. Um, you know, it is, it is uh, you know, you, again, MLAs have social media people to do their social media. Councillors do not. So, it, you know, it's a very different role. Um, but, you know, I, I appreciate the 4% and I also, uh, I agree, uh, Councillor Austin, that tying this with our uh, union negotiations um, is important, but yet we still don't have control over that. So, you know, it is this little slippery slope um, because we, you know, if, if we end up getting a 6% um, and, it's, and it's because, uh, you know, one bargaining unit actually gets a big increase because of specific changes, um, you know, to provincial legislation, for example, or something that happens outside of our control. We as a council need to be able to control this um, because this is our administrative order. Now, I, I, I absolutely wouldn't want to give it over to um, provincial representatives to control what, um, you know, what councillors uh, make. But that being said, keep in mind we are the only full-time council in all of Atlantic Canada. So, you know, when you, when you look at it from that perspective, um, you know, the other councillors across um, the, the, the region, across the province and maritime region, they're, they're working 
uh, long hours and they're not receiving remuneration, right? They're not, they're, they're just getting a, an honorarium. Um, so I, I really think it's important for us to look at the unique situation that we have here in HRM or the capital region. We need to be able to ensure that we have um, talent, uh, that we're recruiting talent. We have the opportunity to have talent coming in to put their name on the ballot and to be elected to, to represent this incredible uh, municipality. So thank you so much. I really went on there, didn't I, Madam, Madam Deputy Mayor? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I've been on this council now for 11 years. We always discuss this. We think we have the magic formula. Councillor Craig thought he had the magic formula. You know, a month ago, it was tracking at a 4 or 4.2% 4 uh, increase because uh, I got a note from the CIO saying this is kind of where it's headed. And then a month later, it's 8%. So it kind of, we can't take, it, it, it's not reasonable. Um, I always tell people when they're thinking of getting into politics about salary, you should never apologize about your salary, nor should you complain, because you know what it is when you get into it, it only changes around the margins of the increase, so it is what it is, but don't apologize for being paid. These, this is an important job. Um, and unlike many other municipalities, there isn't a car allowance for councillors. I don't think we have any kind of severance that many other municipalities have when people leave. Um, so, you know, people should be paid, paid fairly. So the one thing I want to, I, I am putting on a, a small amendment. And this is uh, that where it says, as reported by Statistics Canada for the same period, shall not exceed 4% for councillors. I want to add, or 2% for the mayor. In other words, uh, I will accept uh, an increase roughly equivalent in real dollars to what everybody else on this council accepts. I get paid significantly more uh, than councillors. Um, there was a time councillor was a part-time position. It's not a part-time position anymore. So uh, I would like to make the amendment uh, that it be 4% for councillors and 2% for the mayor. Seconded by councillor Lovelace, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. The question's been called. Can I vote here? Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Okay, so the amendment is carried. Question on the main motion, colleagues? Thank you. Carried. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right, colleagues, we got some short snappers. <laughs> Item number 16.1, Council of Clary. Thank you, Your Eminent Worshipfulness. Um, I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a staff report on amending Section 6 of Bylaw M400 respecting marketing levy, which would allow short-term rental operators with one short-term rental unit to report and remit collected marketing levy on a quarterly or semi-annual basis. Second, Councillor Daigle Gavin, Councillor Clerk. So very briefly on this, um, before uh, the province and municipalities started regulating short-term rentals. The levy came in primarily from hotels. Hotels have bookkeepers and accountants and hundreds of rooms and they have the ability to remit monthly everything they're doing and they're full or mostly full most of the year. What I've been getting calls of now that we've started collecting the marketing levy uh, from uh, short-term rental operators is especially, and, and that's why it's only for those with one STR, and not multiple, because then you're essentially like a hotel, you should be able to do the business. But if you have one short-term rental unit, I have a number of constituents now that have called me, and even when they don't have any guests, they still have to remit and, and fill out the paperwork 
And if they're late by one day, it's a $25 penalty. And one of them uh, said, because they had a couple of rentals, and they said, you realize I'm going to remit like $10. So the penalty is two and a half times greater per day than what I'm actually remitting to you. And if you're a hotel and you're remitting hundreds or thousands of dollars, a $25 a day penalty is not a big deal. But if your penalty is bigger than what you're actually remitting, it's a huge deal. So for anyway, just for these one uh, unit operators, presumably that's in their house, basement, attic, garden suite, if it's allowed in their area, um, then you know, looking at something a little less onerous, because a lot of these are seasonal, and they don't even have guests for months at a time, and, but they have to fill out the paperwork and do everything and face penalties uh, on a monthly basis. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor Hensby? Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. I've had similar complaints uh, from uh, STR uh, operators in my particular district as well, having the same bureaucratic uh, complaints about the bureaucracy of this. Um, I'd rather, instead of the $25 per day fine, I'd rather see a percentage fine if it's 10% or 15%. The CRA, I believe, used to have a 15% penalty on late remittances for, for payrolls and stuff. So those who pay a lot will pay more for a fine. Those who pay little pay smaller amounts. So therefore, it'd be a little easier to, uh, to calculate. Uh, in regards to the, the only thing I'm worried about with this motion is I don't know how accurate or, or how full the database is with the registry of uh, short-term rentals. That may be the problem for us administratively. We don't know how many STRs out there only have the one room or two rooms. You know, uh, uh, what's the point in regards to, do we give the small operators an administrative relief uh, on a monthly or quarterly or semi-annual basis, but there should be, a, should be the, uh, should there be a limit on how many rooms they have out there? Is it just one, it could be two? Because um, I know back in the day before uh, the short-term rentals, B&Bs were six units or, or more or six units or less or whatever. So I'm just kind of curious if we can find some parameters of trying to judge that. And once we get the database more accurate, perhaps we can classify our STRs as who are small operators versus the medium size to large size. So I think that's, that's the administrative issue. I think our staff's gonna be dealt with in regards to how can they easily um, prescribe to this request. So I'll, I'll look forward to the report. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Just want to add my voice to to the counselor who've received many calls on this and hearing the same thing and, and uh, even being stopped in the grocery store from small uh, 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 owners who are living and who are doing everything by the rules, but the onus of having to report is pretty heavy on them. So support this and happy that Councilor brought it forward and, and I know it would it would definitely help a lot of the smaller uh, operators who, who, who just don't have the time to do this. So support this for sure. Um, Deputy Mayor. Um. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, so happy to see this come forward, Councillor Cleary. I've also had um, complaints from uh, residents, some that uh, only have seasonal and um, one room in a house, and because they didn't file, they got a $25 penalty, um, and there was absolutely no income to offset the cost of that penalty. So, um, I support this wholeheartedly. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Councillor Cleary? Just briefly, I mean, the, the upside to this as well is the lower amount of administrative work for the municipality. I don't know how many dozens or hundreds of hotels we have. It's probably not that many relative to the 2,000 Airbnb listings. And from our staff report, 16 to 1,800 of those will probably still be legal. And so it's kind of like going from, you know, a few dozen or hundreds to thousands that you have to administer on a monthly basis. And so for those small operators, and I think the air DNA data we had was uh, the average number of units is like 1.2 units or something like that. And so the vast majority of them are these tiny little operators. So that's well over a thousand that staff would have to go through on a monthly basis. So if we can combine that, make it easier for them, save us some money, hey, we should always, maybe this qualifies me now for like Lean Six Sigma. Uh, maybe I got my, uh, my, my green belt here. Uh, anyway, I think it's, there's an upside to them and there's an upside I think to the municipality. All right, ready for the question, colleagues? I 
That's carried. Thank you. Uh, 16.2, Councillor McClary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a staff report on amending bylaw N300 respecting nuisances and smoking to add a clause that exterior lighting shall not be directed towards abutting lots or streets. No, second. Seconded by Councillor Cuddle and Stoddard and others. <laughs> There's enthusiasm for this apparently. So for, for many years now, I get uh, occasional calls, usually about one every month or two, from someone who says, my neighbor's light in the backyard or the front yard or the driveway is shining into my property or in my dining room or, you know, is there anything you guys can do about it? And of course, then you send it a bylaw officer and they check it out and they say, no, there's nothing we can do. What's interesting about this is in a lot of our development agreements, we have this exact wording as a clause in there. And when we brought in the uh, center plan, the Regional Center Land Use Bylaw has this, ex I ripped these words out directly word for word from the Regional Center Land Use Bylaw. But the reason I'm not proposing that we make changes to all of our land use bylaws, because we have 20 odd of them, is that is a long process for each of us to go through, because it's gotta go through each of the community councils. If we put it in the nuisance bylaw, then it's automatically across the municipality, it's easier and faster and, Oftentimes when you put stuff in the land use bylaw, it's not retroactive. My fear would be we put it in and then, oh, I, I've been shining that light there for 18 years and you can't stop me now. Uh, but if it's in the nuisance bylaw, it's retroactive. It starts whenever you do it, you can't do it. And so that's the thinking behind this. That's the wording we already use. It shouldn't happen anyway. Everyone should direct their lights on their own property. We even do that as a municipality for light pollution. All of our LEDs point straight down and that's why we bought the ones we bought uh, to decrease the amount of light pollution that's going up. So if we're doing it on our own streets and buildings, it's incumbent on our residents to be mindful of their neighbors and the light and the impact it can have uh, for quality of life for them as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, for shining some light on that. Ready for the question, colleagues? Yeah, he's watching from home, Mike. That was for you, Timmy. <laughs> Carried, thank you very much. 16.3 uh, is from Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that, move that the Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a staff report to expand the accessible bus service area to include the community surrounding all park and ride locations for door-to-door -door service, as well as a review of the half-hour window for pickup notifications and funding and tax implications for the 25-26 budget year. Second by Councillor Lovelace, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace, for the second. So I've spoken with Transit about this and I've also spoken with um, Melissa Myers in our accessibility advisor. And there is a lot of issues around accessible bus that goes just to park and rides and they could be within, right now I think it's within a 100 meters. A kilometer. A kilometer, they were saying. So because they're in outlying areas, that limit, really is a deterrent and it uh, takes away from people's independence as well. People trying to get to the park and ride to pick them up. So um, just to see what the staff report could come back with in terms of what door-to-door -door service could cost and what the implications are in terms of the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Ready for the question, colleagues? Sorry, yeah. That motion's carried, thank you, Deputy Mayor. We're gonna to move to our added items, colleagues. 18.1 uh, is coming from the Chair of Environment, uh, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm very happy and actually excited to put the next, this motion on the floor. 
that the Halifax Regional Council one approve the registration of the municipality for participation in the extended producer responsibility for packaging paper products, patching like uh, packing like product program, and direct the CAO to register the municipality by no later than January 1, 2024 deadline, in accordance with the requirements of the extended produce responsibility for packaging paper products and packaging like products regulations. And two, direct the CAO to negotiate and execute agreements and on terms and conditions satisfactory to the CAO in accordance with the extended produce responsibility for packaging paper products and packing like product regulations with applicable produce responsibility organizations related to the municipality's curbside recycling collection and operation of the municipality's materials recovery facility as required with divert Nova Scotia so moved. Second. Uh, Councilor Mansi? Yeah, thank you very much. You know, I, I was going to ask for a presentation, but I don't think that we need it. It's a late hour, Shannon. But you know what? First of all, Mr. Mayor and colleagues, I want to thank Shannon and Andrew very much for this work. Uh, we started working on this when I was elected in for 2016, working uh, with regional chairs, working with municipalities across the province. There's been a lot of work. Uh, some of you will remember uh, Laura, uh, Lori Lewis that used to be in the role that Shannon has, and Lori was the one that sat me down when I first elected and explained EPR in a way that I, even I could understand and which is something uh, and so I even Laurie reached out to me the other day so pleased to hear that this is moving forward so a lot of good work here you know we're not reinventing the wheel because there are very mature cities and provinces when it comes to EPR uh, across across Canada particularly BC and Ontario New Brunswick uh, started their EPR program uh, this year uh, and we were a little bit envious at first here in Nova Scotia but the province staff did caution us to trying to go too fast, and that's proven correct now, eh, Shannon? They were having some challenges in New Brunswick because they are going so quick. Uh, I want to reassure that our residents will not really see anything different at the curbside. Uh, and, you know, colleagues, just to remind everybody, uh, we've been paying for EPR when we go to the cash register for many, many years. That money hasn't been staying here because we don't have EPR. It's left us and has gone to a province that has EPR. And so, uh, you know, you know the. You know, the bottom line is the, this program has been proven in other centers. It's going to help reduce what goes into the landfill. It's going to really impact in a positive way the recycling and our reuse program. Uh, things like leaving litter has been proven to be helpful in the environment. And we'll see some packaging change because we're making the producer responsible for this. So this is very exciting. It's a game changer. As I said at our Environment uh, Standing Committee, and there's, a, there's many reasons why companies and people move to HRM uh, and we can go we all know that list but one of those the way we handle our environment and take care of our environment the way we protect our lands and EPR is part of that so uh, I'm just so excited to have this and moving forward it's still two two years away I think Shannon before it actually gets implemented uh, but uh, you know this is really good news and Shannon thank you for the hard work you've uh, put on this I really really appreciate it not only with us you know the way that Shannon's worked with all the municipalities uh, across the province so uh, the staff have been all over this so great great work so uh, hopefully uh, that you'll support that colleagues thanks again Shannon thank you and thank you Shannon ready for the question uh, oh hang on Councillor Hensby uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Just out of curiosity, since we're not getting the presentation tonight, how is the general public going to be informed more about this change of, uh, of the rationale behind the EPR program and how it affects the residents? Shannon, you want that? <laughs> thank Make you, Mr. Mayor. Make it worthwhile for you to hang around. <laughs> For sure. Um, Shannon Betts, program, or pol sorry, Manager of uh, pol Policy and Enforcement with Solid Waste Resources. So as the administrator of the, of the EPR program in Nova Scotia, Divert Nova Scotia will have that responsibility. So it is built into the plan with producers that they do have the obligation to inform residents about how materials will be collected, how the materials are processed, and how they're managed through the EPR program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ready for the question, colleagues? That's carried. Thank you very much. 18.2 is in the name of uh, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would like to move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a staff report 
outlining options for consideration during the 24-25 annual budget process regarding amending administrative order 2014012 ADM, the Rural Transit Grants Administrative Order to increase the flat rate per vehicle and or the annual lump sum available to grant recipients. Thank you very much. Um, so the Rural Transit Funding Program is a grants program through which not-for-profit rural transit operators can apply for funding to subsidize the cost of operating services in areas of the municipality not serviced by Halifax Transit to address unmet community needs. The per vehicle kilometer rate and lump sum grants were set in 2014 when the administrative order was approved and neither the flat rate or the lump sum has changed in value since. While the price of fuel has been up and down since 2014, the last two years have been the highest average on record. As well, other factors like wages, parts, maintenance, insurance have all increased cost. The Rural Transit Grant Program provides an invaluable service to our rural communities and in particular people in need. It plays a critical role in providing access and equity to rural communities which impacts social well-being, health, employment and more. This motion is to provide a report and recommendation on funding to the Rural Transit Funding Program to ensure the program is adequately funded to support rural transit service providers. Originally, this was intended to go to the Transportation Standing Committee, but um, we've brought it forward to Regional Council so it might be considered in, the, in this year's budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. I'll thank you much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm very supportive of this. Uh, Councillor Cuddle's quite right in regards to the amount of rates have not increased uh, over a number of years. And uh, as an ex-official member of Musco Rider on their board, we've been talking about this uh, around the board table, uh, the, the need to reevaluate the, the flat rate service. Um, the, uh, right now, the government rate for kilometers is 68 cents per, per kilometer for the 5,000 kilometers less or 62 cents for additional kilometers. So we're way out of whack with the, with the government rate. So I think it's very important, but it's also, I'm hoping that this will give us an opportunity to reevaluate those fixed loop proposals. I know that the Sambro Loop maybe have a, an opportunity where Bay Rise may provide a fixed loop service of, of the Sambro Loop, as well as Muscle Rider wants to provide a fixed loop service for the 207 Highway to service the uh, West Chesapeake Lawrence Town corridor. So I think this might be an opportunity to revisit those uh, proposals as well and have a, perhaps a different rate for those uh, services as well. So I'm looking forward to the report. Uh, would the CAO want to have that additional motion about the looking at a, perhaps a, a differential rate for fixed loop services? Yes, that would be a whole other council report potentially, I would say. Well, could I ask Council Cuddle if she would mind a, an amendment to, to include, uh, to also evaluate uh, another rate for fixed loop services? Well, okay, I'll, well. I'd say it's a different staff report. If right. re request it separately. I'll, I'll, I'll give notice of motion at the next meeting then. Thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I am pleased to see this moving forward. Uh, when uh, Megan and Megan and Mary Agnes came to transportation, gave a presentation on um, Bay Rides and the situation, uh, you know, for this community organization, we've got over 50% of their costs are just going into maintaining their vehicles and keeping those vehicles on the road. Their fare revenue is dropping because they continue to subsidize their riders. And part of the, it's not because it's like hugely expensive, but it's because it's so difficult to be able to provide this service in a rural area uh, where people are caught between, you know, paying heating or uh, paying for, for their transportation to get to their doctor appointment. Um, so these are real problems that, that we can help here at this table. I think when we look at um, the positive health outcomes from people who have access to transportation, are able to get out and socialize in their community, are not feeling stuck and alone, um, it's huge outcomes. For 
for our communities and for individuals as well. And where we know that um, communities are doing the best that they can to fundraise, you know, that's uh, 20, 25 percent of their entire budget, which comes in from fundraising, is becoming more and more difficult because more groups are needing uh, to to access, uh, you know, community funding. So. There's only so many dollars to go around. I fully support this and I appreciate um, this moving forward. And I do agree with you, Councillor Hensby, that's a different staff report. So let's get, let's get to work on that as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ready for the question? That's carried, thank you. And Councillor Cuddle, we'll go back to you for 18.3, which is heritage deregistration, York Redoubt. Yep, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a staff report initiating a heritage deregistration of PID 41518333, Lot 1, SM 1 1, a subdivided portion of a registered heritage property known as York Redoubt, located at 12 York Redoubt Crescent, Ferguson's Cove, Nova Scotia. Um, so this is. Uh, Second, uh, uh, Councillor Cleary, thank you. Yeah, oh, thank you, Councillor Cleary. Um, yeah, so this is. Uh, kind of hard to explain, but there's a parcel of land that has a, a church on it that's a registered heritage property. The property owners have subdivided their property to be able to develop with the hope of selling a, a, a lot and develop a lot adjacent to their property. And um, so there's nothing here, there's no heritage building on the subdivided portion. Um, the, the church will remain a registered heritage building. So this is only about deregistering a portion of that lot that's been subdivided off so that they can continue with um, their, their other project, which is not a heritage project. Thank you. Ready for the question? That's carried. Thank you. The next item is the ratification, correct, of uh, work. Does somebody want to take that one on? De Deputy Mayor? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. That the Halifax Regional Council approve the schedule of 24-25 advanced tender requests as per attachment one of the staff report dated November 29th, 2023. Second by Councillor Mason. Ready for the question on that? Deputy Mayor, can you take the chair for this last item? So we're on 18.5. Deputy Mayor, or Mr. Mayor? Oh, Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, before I put the motion on the floor, I just want to explain. This no. is not about, you know, asking to cancel uh, uh, New Year's Eve event, or New Year's Day event. That's not a decision of council. That's a decision of mayor's office comes out of my, uh, uh, my budget. It's not a determination of whether that's the right thing to do. Um, it is what I intend to do, though. Um, and you know, it occurred to me over the last little while that this might be the thing to do. I've always enjoyed the levees very much. Um, 
but um, you know the idea of us celebrating New Year's inside while people are huddled outside um, doesn't ex it just doesn't seem right to me. And I, re I rec that's not the issue. We're not arguing that today. It's just that I need the same way that every now and then you guys have your district capital, which is much bigger than what I have. Um, and sometimes you come to council, you need permission to do it. Believe it or not, I need permission to take money and give it to a not-for-profit organization out of my budget um, legally. That's what I need to do. Um, so the motion is, Halifax Regional Council 1 waive Section 17 of Administrative Order 1 requiring a staff report from the CAO, which I assume needs two-thirds, and 2 direct the Chief Administrative Officer to make a donation to the North End Community Centre in the amount of $8,500 with funds from Cost Centre E300. Is that two different votes? It's seconded by Councillor Mason. Yeah. Pardon? Do it all at once, okay. So the reason I'm suggesting, we spoke to Max and folks in our homelessness uh, crew about how do we support people who need help. The North End Community Health Clinic, as you all know, uh, they do housing, but they also run a community kitchen. Um, they provide meals, they can provide meals seven days a week, 365 days a year. They can feed people who access services at their clinic or through MOSH. They can also feed people who are now in encampments. Service providers witness firsthand how the lack of access to nutritious, healthy food affects patients' ability to manage their chronic conditions. Um, we plan to provide at least one meal per day to these folks to ensure that a lack of access to nutritious, healthy foods doesn't negatively affect their ability to manage chronic conditions. So we looked at Shelter Nova Scotia. There's a number of other organizations that uh, do, do shelter. This is really about the folks, our neighbors in Grand Parade, uh, human beings, not bad people. They just can't afford a place to live making sure that they get a, a, a bit of food throughout uh, the season. And it's not a lot of money, but it does provide something. But I need permission from uh, council in order to uh, give that money to, um, to a not-for-profit organization. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, in regards to this motion, granting of money is one thing, but is the New Year's Day levy still going to be held or not? I just want a clarification because I always felt that the New Year's Day levy is one of those traditions that we should be keeping around here uh, in regards to opening the doors to the general public. If those in the, the cameras want to come in and enjoy the levy, fine and dandy, or the food left over from the levy, uh, provide it to them as well. As, as well. Uh, I think that, um, or even have a campaign, uh, leave it at the levy in regards to people can bring in a donation for the food bank or bring socks or hats or gloves, whatever the case may be, and give a gift as a part of the levy uh, uh, as a new tradition, whatever. Um, so I want to have clarification. Giving a grant is one thing, but are we still having the levy, yes or no? No. Want to do it. <laughs> You're saying no, so okay. Uh, well, so, Mr. Well, Mayor, would you like to answer that then before we go? Hey, you come back. Just to set okay. an example. All right, Council. I just, I, I, I just, Bravo. just saying though is that uh, it, it's. I'm just disappointed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so I'm disappointed too, but I also certainly understand the uh, complexity and the empathy that we need to show the folks that are out there in those tents. It's, it's not a great situation, we all know that. And we get emails almost every day from people who are not understanding the decisions that we're making um, and the complexities of this. And we can continue to spell it out to them and I'm not convinced that some of them may never accept it. This one in particular uh, was really looking forward to this, the, the levy. I do look forward to it. I think it's a great and very great, those are great social um, spaces that we offer and the one here at the, at the City Hall, for sure, as, Dave, as Councillor Hensby had noted, it's, it is, it is uh, an important piece. But in this situation, we have made a number of difficult choices around the police memorial and, and we have more to, uh, and Remembrance Day, there's been a number of things we've, we've done with the same vein of, of empathy and support for these folks that are, are out here. Um, the, uh, the idea of having the, the, the city hall opened in some other fashion, maybe that's something we can give some further thought to. Perhaps the mayor's office can 
um, folks can work on some way of celebrating it. Somebody else mentioned that maybe those of us who are councillors could do something within our districts. I wouldn't need to because I, pr I have about eight that I have to go to within my district. So I, I expect to be able to see lots of people on, on New Year's Day. I'm happy to, to support this um, and I'm glad, thank you Mr. Mayor for expressing the rationale around the, uh, the society or the agency that it would be donated to. Um, that particular uh, organization certainly is doing great work and, and have um, done so for years on shoestring budgets. So anything like this would certainly be a help and I'm sure that many of the folks in these tents are going to re be in receipt of uh, of some of that, and if they're not, um, others will be. So I, I support this, and I appreciate the mayor bringing it forward, and and being open to helping us all understand where this, uh, why this decision was being made, and how, and what other things were considered. Because I know we all offered up some ideas, and um, I'm I'm comfortable with where we've landed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I, I am in full support, Mr. Mayor, of, of your motion. And New Year's, it's, it's interesting, I've, I've come to most of our levies uh, since I've been a councillor, and uh, thanks to former councillor Steve Craig, uh, now Minister Craig, uh, who convinced me to wear my tuxedo, it would feel pretty awkward, I think, if we showed up in gowns and tuxedos uh, celebrating the New Year, while folks are out in tents, not just in Grand Parade, you know, all throughout the municipality, we, we are certainly in a crisis. A uh, homelessness crisis, a housing crisis, an affordability crisis, a uh, mental health crisis. Um, and so I'll be digging deeper this year. Uh, and the great thing is, around the holidays, Christmas, uh, I've got a, a group that uh, has found a church in the district that will be serving Christmas dinner, uh, and, and we've agreed to help support them. And you know you can do the mission, you can do Turning Point, you can do, there's all kinds of places where we could be volunteering and getting out there and, and serving uh, the folks who need us. I mean, we're here as public servants. It's, it's kind of nice when you can actually do the, the literal serving uh, for others. And uh, you know, I, I, I think it's a good idea, uh, donating especially to uh, North End uh, Health Clinic and all of the other groups that are around us. So, you know, certainly if, uh, <laughs> I don't have a whole lot of funds left in the district uh, activity fund, but, um, you know, it'll all be gone by New Year's uh, this year. And, uh, you know, personally uh, donating and getting out there. So if I'm not coming to a levy, I'll be finding a, a kitchen where I can help uh, folks get some sustenance in a warm place. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, for that. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, you know, there's people in need um, all around our, our municipality, and uh, you know, I, I think it is um, great to find ways to support those organizations in our various communities that are providing for those for those in need. Um, there's a number of activities in, in District 11 that um, I could go on about, but uh, watch my social media. Um, the, the one piece here that I, I, I will say that the levy is a special event and in that it does open the doors to the public where we invite people in to City Hall to you know the seat of the municipal government to come and say hello and have that one-on-one -on -one interaction, not just with the councillor from a particular district, but from many of us from across the municipality who sit here collectively voting and making decisions on things that affect people's lives. And, you know, I think there is something very special in that, in that tradition. Um, you know, and I also just want to note that over the last four years, we have only had one levy. Um, we had uh, to cancel the levy for a couple of years because of COVID and we weren't able to gather um, and, and host that event. And so the past year has been, um, you know, it's been really great as a counselor because we're seeing finally events coming back. Um, I remember going to the Boys and Girls uh, Supper over in Dartmouth um, a few weeks back and seeing people there that I hadn't seen pre-COVID. 
and you know just realizing what a long stretch of time it's been since we have been able to gather in community and say hello and you know e exchange you know news or or just even pleasantries so um, I, I very much will um, will miss the levy and look forward to attending levies um, in and around my community um, but I, I just want to note how special and important this event is and and I hope that we are able to bring it back in future years because it's a it's a, it's a tradition that many people do look forward to. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Um, Councillor Hensby. Just before the mayor makes his final words, can I ask in regards to the New Year's Eve events, are we going to transfer all those to the, maybe the Oval instead, and are we going to have a family fireworks at nine o'clock and, and a midnight fireworks for the adults? You know. I heard nothing about the New Year's Eve uh, festivities. Our CAO is going to respond. I believe our executive director of Parks and Recreation, Maggie McDonald, is working on a memo to council on that very topic. Because if we're not going to have a New Year's Day event, we might as well not have the New Year's Eve event of city front of City Hall either, because we have the same encampment encroaching upon the front doors here. So you know you can't uh, can't have one without the other. I would say. So I would say that uh, we may have to look at relocating the New Year's Eve festivities to the, to the, to the Oval. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that is exactly the plan. Um, I know folks are looking at that. Um, I want to be very clear about one thing. This is not about our neighbors threatening people who come here on New Year's Day. We've had menorah lighting, a number of flag raisings. We've had a lot of events, even through the summer here. Um, and while there are some isolated instances, for sure, uh, you know, these people, they're not bad people. They're not bad citizens. They're, they don't want to be unhelpful. They're not ungenerous themselves. They just can't afford a place to live, you know? And so I appreciate all the comments people made, Councillor Cleary in particular. You know, I. Uh, Councillor Mancini doesn't talk about this a lot, but how often are you out uh, delivering food to people in Dartmouth North, right? We all have an obligation to do those kinds of things, and I think we all uh, probably do. I'm a levy guy, right? I've, look, I've been doing levies for years. I love the levies. I love meeting people here, and there's people I won't see this year that I'll miss. But I just find it a little unseemly to be celebrating the new year when there are people who have very, very, very little to celebrate. And um, that's why I brought this forward. I don't need permission of council to do this because it's my budget and, and my call. But as you know, I, I asked everybody on council for their opinion. And the vast majority of people said they preferred the donate route. Some had variations on that, um, you know, the, to, to, what, to what council Cleary talked about. But, the, but then there were some that feel strongly about us having it, and that would have been me a few years ago. But um, look, I just, I think we all feel it, right? This is, we've gone through a lot in this term on council with COVID and a lot of different things, but geez, you know, man, the idea that we have fellow human beings that are, I, I mean, every night I think as I go to bed, you know, is. Is somebody gonna, you know, freeze to death or burn. So I, I did ask people for their opinion because I appreciate the, the value of this council. Um, and I do enjoy the levy very much. My heart just tells me that uh, this year is a little bit different and that's why I've uh, brought this forward and uh, would ask for your help on that. Thank you. Seeing no further speakers, a call for the question. Okay, that's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, we, what else do we have? We have the ratification of in camera, right? So let's look back at our in camera items. Seventeen point one is the uh, minutes. Do we need to approve those in public if we've approved them in private? Okay, all those. Uh, so, somebody want to move the in camera minutes? Moved by Councillor Mason, seconded Councillor Purdy. All in favor? 
Opposed? Those are carried 17.2. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private confidential report dated November 27th, 2023, and 2 direct the private confidential report dated November 22nd, 27th, 2023 be maintained private and confidential. Seconded, Councillor Hensby. Ready for the question? That's carried, thank you, 17.3. Councillor Hensby. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's a motion to the Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations outlined in the private confidential report dated November 22nd, 2023, and to direct the, the private and confidential report dated November 22nd, 2023 to be maintained private and confidential. Second. Seconded by Councillor Daigle Gammon, ready for the question. That's carried, thank you. 17.4. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated December 7th, 2023, and 2 direct that the private and confidential report dated November 7th, 2023 be maintained private and confidential. I so move. Second, Councillor Stoddard. Ready for the question? Question. 17.4. The public uh, motion. Okay, I'm ready for the question, colleagues? Or did we vote on this? 17-4. That is uh, carried, thank you. No 17.5, right? So colleagues, uh, we've done our added items, notices of motion. Councillor, Deputy, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Take notice that at a future meeting of the Regional Council, I intend to move amendments to Administrative Order 17 so that Regional Council annual salary increases shall not exceed the increase in the average industrial weekly earnings for all industries excluding unclassified businesses for Canada as reported by Statistics Canada for the same period and shall not exceed 4% for councillors or 2% for mayor. I was advise that this was what we had to do. Okay. Anybody else with a Christmas notice? If not, uh, our next meeting will likely be after Christmas. So uh, I know we all want to take this opportunity to wish all of our residents um, the very best for the Christmas season. Um, happy Hanukkah to those who are continuing to celebrate that and any other uh, faith tradition. Uh, we are hoping for a uh, good holiday season, but also a prosperous, inclusive, equitable 2024 for all of our residents. With that, I'll look for a motion to adjourn from the lady in green. Motion to adjourn. We are out. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs>